This is Audible. And now, part two of Endgame, written by John Gilstrap and read by Basil Sands. Chapter 16 Scorpion, Mother Hen? Jonathan keyed the mic on his portable radio. Go ahead. They were only two hours into their three-hour drive. He sat in the shotgun seat, as always, and he turned the volume up so that boxers could listen in. Isis is beginning to light up about our friends, she said. Graham is going to be transferred to a foster home in the next half hour, forty-five minutes. Do you have specifics? Jonathan asked. If they could get a name and an address, they could lie in wait and grab the boy as he arrived at the foster home. Typically, that was the simplest kind of snatch, when the parties thought they were beyond any danger. Veniche relayed the name of the foster family, Markham in Lambertville, and the address. Jonathan wrote it down on the pad that always resided in the pouch pocket on his right thigh. And the girl, Jolaine? That's a little more interesting, Veniche said. She's scheduled to be transferred from her current location in the adult detention center in Lambertville to a federal facility in Chicago. Jonathan exchanged confused glances with boxers. Any word on the specifics of the charges? That's a negative, Veniche said, but it gets better. On a whim, I decided to call the federal facility in Chicago. They don't know anything about the transfer. Jonathan scowled. You just called them, he asked. An inquiry out of the blue is going to get a don't-know response nine times out of ten. I told them I was calling on behalf of Andrew Barron, an AUSA from Chicago. Jonathan recognized the acronym for an assistant United States attorney, a federal prosecutor. And you think they bought it? Veniche did not respond to the question. Of course they bought it. Veniche had a telephone voice that was unlike any other that Jonathan had ever heard. It pissed her off when he called it her phone sex voice. Fact was, she could talk anyone into believing anything over the phone. Okay, Jonathan said, breaking the silence. What should we conclude from them not knowing about the transfer? I think we have to assume that the transfer isn't real, she said. I think we have to assume that the bad guys are going to take her when she's in the car. Jonathan recoiled in his seat. That was a hell of a leap. I have a hard time connecting those dots, Boxer said. Because Jonathan hadn't yet pressed the mic button, his comment did not go out over the air, but Scorpion could not have agreed more. Help me with logic, Jonathan said on the encrypted channel. I assume we're hunting for ducks, Veniche said. Jonathan laughed. In that one sentence, she'd spoken paragraphs. If a creature looked like a duck and walked like a duck and quacked like a duck, it was unreasonable to conclude that it was a penguin in disguise. He got her point. Someone was after Joe Lane with the intention of doing her harm. She was in custody on a nonspecific charge that now involved a transfer that no one knew about. I got it, Jonathan said. When does the transfer happen? That's unclear, Veniche said. The best I can estimate is when they get their stuff in order enough to make it happen. Tell you what, Jonathan said. Get your new buddy Marianne on the phone and patch her into this conversation. Let's get her take on this. Hesitation. You know I object, right? Veniche said. Duly noted. The way I look at it, there's no harm talking. Surely she's as dialed into ISIS as you are. You know, that begs a different question, Veniche said. It's counterproductive for anybody on her side of the equation to know that we are even aware that ISIS exists, let alone that we have access to it. Access to ISIS was among Veniche's early victories as a brilliant tickler of electrons. Then we won't mention it, Jonathan said. Get back to us when you have the patch ready. He didn't want to discuss this any more. We've got ourselves a dilemma, boss, Boxers said. It's entirely possible we're going to have two transfer events happening at the same time. Actually, it was close to a certainty, Jonathan thought. The question was, on which event should they focus their intervention? The kid is the one with the information, Boxers said, reading his mind. Jonathan nodded. Graham was for sure the primary target in terms of national security. He was the one with the photographic memory and, presumably, the arming codes that so many people were willing to kill to obtain. Jolaine's the one who will be most under guard, Jonathan said, and the guards will likely be cops. We're not in the business of endangering cops. But apparently the kid is stable, Boxer said. At least he's being taken to a place of safety. Unless he's not, 
Jonathan said. If the enemy, whoever they are, is coming at Jolaine, doesn't it make sense that they'll come at the boy, too? Why go for her and not for him? Agreed, Boxer said. But we need to choose, and our single best opportunity to get Jolaine back will be while she's in a vehicle being transported between points A and B. Once she's ensconced in another secure facility, we won't have many options. You worry about tangling with law enforcement personnel, well, that would be one hell of a fight. On the other end of the easiness factor from snatching people from a home where they least expected it was snatching people from a facility designed specifically to prevent snatchings. It would help to know where they intend to take her, Boxer said. It would help to know who intends to take her there, Jonathan countered. The radio popped to life. Scorpion, mother hen. That was fast, Jonathan said. Maybe we're about to find out. He keyed his mic. Go ahead, Venice said. Kit, you are on with Scorpion and big guy. I am mother hen. Scorpion, I have filled Kit in on what little we know. Jonathan got right down to it. So... What are your thoughts, Kit? That's us, Marianne said. We're taking her to safety. It's over. Jonathan looked to boxers. What do you mean, it's over? It means mission accomplished, Marianne said. Uncle Sam thanks you for your service and wishes you a good day. This feels way too easy, boxers said off the air. Jonathan agreed. When did you intend to tell us, he asked. I'm surprised you knew. Marianne said. I didn't even know until a few minutes ago. I won't ask how you pulled that off because Wolverine cautioned me about asking too many questions about how you do what you do. Jonathan found himself silently cursing the doubt that Venice had planted in his head about Marianne. This should be good news, but he found himself not trusting it. The fact that she was blowing sunshine up his ass didn't help at all. Jonathan keyed the mic. Was it you guys who swore out the warrant for interstate flight to avoid a non-crime? Say again, Jonathan said. The PCs were pulled over and taken into custody, but not arrested, on a charge of interstate flight to avoid prosecution. Was that you guys? How do you know about all of this? In his head, he could see Venice getting mad. Remember what Wolverine told you, Jonathan said. I don't get the sudden change in attitude, Marianne said. You know you're not answering my question, right? At what point, in what parallel universe, did the FBI start owing answers to its contractors? Marianne said. Clearly, Jonathan had thumped a sensitive button. Was that a yes or a no? Jonathan pressed. We're done, Marianne said, and there was a click. What the heck was that all about? Fenice asked. Why dial her in and then piss her off? Yeah, Boxer said. I was kind of wondering that myself. This wasn't a discussion for the airwaves. Mother Hen, I'll be back to you in a while. To boxers, he said, This just doesn't feel right. It was a simple enough question. Did they cut the warrant? Why wouldn't she answer it? I think she got pissed when she found out what we knew. But why wouldn't she want us to know? If we're all on the same team, and that's what she promised from the very beginning, why is she trying to shut us out? Maybe because she's with the FBI and that's what they do. They compartmentalize. I keep coming back to Venice's question, Jonathan said. How did Marianne know so quickly about what happened to the Mitchell family? If you think about it, the gun smoke must still have been hanging in the air when she reached out to Venice and me at the concert. How could she know so fast? Well, it could have been a telephone call, Boxer said, but I don't think that's where you're going. You're thinking that the pretty hot thing is in on this somehow. I certainly think it's worth looking into. In fact, Venice's looking into it as we speak. Boxers rumbled out a laugh. <laughs> and I bet she's having a ball doing it, too. Full cavity search? She's looking for anything that looks like motivation. What about Wolverine? What does she have to say about this? Jonathan groaned. Ah, I haven't spoken to her. I don't imagine she'd take too well to having one of her trusted lieutenants accused of betrayal. I've got to be 100% sure before I launch that balloon. Ah, Boxer said. That whole loyalty thing. You know, you'd think after Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen and Edward Snowden, the three-letter groups would start looking at themselves a little more closely. Jonathan sensed the birth of a political rant, so he retook control. Here's where I see it. Kit says our work is done and that we're off the case, and Wolverine hasn't been dialed in. That means we're alone if we keep going. 
Boxers grinned. We're not backing off, are we? Jonathan shook his head. No, we're not. At least not for a while. Fine by me, big guy said. But I always like messing with people. Why are you staying in? What's in it for you, for us? Start with the stakes, Jonathan explained. We've dealt with Chechens before. I know they've got solid grievances with the Russians, but their methods are ten clicks too brutal even for the Haji. The thought of them with a nuclear capability is just too much. That can't be allowed to happen. Okay. Boxers drew out the last syllable, clearly waiting for more. So you think that Marianne and the FBI are going to hand the PCs over to the Chechens so that they can blow up Mother Russia? Why would they do that? Jonathan realized that he was thinking faster than his mouth could move. No, he said, I am not convinced that the people running the pickup are FBI. That's the significance of the Nietzsche's discovery that the field officer, whatever it is in Chicago, doesn't know that their PC is on her way. So, you think it's a snatch? Boxers clarified. His expression said that he wasn't yet completely on board with that. No, Jonathan said. I don't think that it is a snatch, but I think it could be a snatch. One that's being organized by Wolverine's Girl Friday. Boxers didn't seem to like the taste of the words. I just want to make sure I got this right. It all comes back to the stakes, Jonathan said. I keep running the outcomes through my head. If Marianne is in fact a good guy and is in fact telling the truth, then the FBI gets their hands on our PC first, and presumably there's no harm, no foul. We've just wasted a lot of time. And if the Chechens snatch them, a lot of Russia will go boom, Boxers said, and Wolverine's girl Friday would have started that ball rolling. That's the part I'm having trouble with, Dig. I mean, God knows my cynicism has no limits, but even I have... I might be wrong, Jonathan said. Let's stipulate that I probably am. What are the consequences if I'm not? That's a lot of dead people. And then there's the retaliatory strike. How do you think President Darmond and his team will handle a crisis like that? Jeez, Dig. This is so desperately not my problem. If I start thinking in those terms, the world gets pretty dark. There's a third possibility, too, Jonathan went on. The Russians by far have the most to gain by getting their hands on the PC. They kill him, and the codes die with him. Doesn't that solve everything? Boxers asked. I mean, that would suck for him, but that might be the perfect thing for the rest of us here on the planet. He's a kid, Box, Jonathan said. Nothing good comes from killing a kid. I don't care who he is. But more than that, you're missing the point. He felt his impatience growing. Or maybe I'm not stating it well. These PCs, Jolene Cage and Graham Mitchell, are just trying to survive. He's a kid, and she's a young vet doing her job. The Mitchells hired Jolene to protect the kid, and then all hell broke loose. Now they're in danger, and in one of our three outcomes, Graham is killed by the Chechens after he gives them what they want. In a second, he's killed by the Russians to keep him quiet. From the bad guy's point of view, there's no other option. And in the third scenario? The third scenario is to deliver the PC to Wolverine's FBI, the one that really does care if good wins out over bad. Isn't Wolfie part of the problem? At least maybe? For now, no, Jonathan said. I think she's in the dark, but you know Wolfie. Presented with the evidence, she'll come around to our side. Being processed into jail was every bit as humiliating as Jolene imagined it would be right down to the oft-rumored cavity search. To their credit, the staff of the jail remained courteous and professional through the whole thing. Taking her own advice, she said nothing. She answered questions regarding her identity and her physical state. She had no known diseases or allergies. She was in excellent physical health, had not had any recent surgeries, blah, 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 but otherwise offered nothing. She didn't even ask where they had taken Graham. She'd never seen such a look of terror as she saw in Graham's face, and that included young grunts who found themselves in a war zone for the first time. At least in combat, there was an element of empowerment, a way to affect the outcome of your own life. There on the street, on his belly, with his hands ratcheted into handcuffs, there was only misery. She had no idea what the next chapter in his life was going to be, and she didn't ask because she was confident that no one would tell her. She sat alone in a holding cell that looked more like the pictures she'd seen of supermax prisons than what she'd envisioned a county jail would look like. 
Assuming the tiles on the floor were one foot square, her rectangular corner of the world measured roughly five by seven. A heavy steel door occupied the narrow dimension at the front of the cell, with a tiny wire-reinforced glass window that looked out into the hallway, or would look out into the hallway if the sliding panel on the far side were open. She imagined that the other panel in the door, this one about waist-high and made of metal, was a hinged flap that would allow the guard's staff to pass food to her without opening the door. It looked just big enough to accommodate a cafeteria tray. Her cot was actually a concrete half-wall that ran the length of the long dimension of the cell, and it was topped with a thin mattress that had been rolled up around her pillow and nudged up against the back of the wall. Hospital green sheets and a blanket sat folded in front of the bedroll. The most prominent feature in the left center of the space was a squatty, mushroom-shaped stainless steel bar stool that served as the chair for the stainless steel desk that folded up to reveal the stainless steel toilet. Efficiency at its most hideous. Aware of the fisheye camera in the corner of the ceiling nearest the door, enclosed, of course, by what appeared to be bulletproof glass, she wondered what bizarre pleasure some of the guards must have gotten from watching prisoners take care of bodily functions. It wouldn't surprise her to learn that there was a porn channel devoted to just that. As she placed the sheets onto the desk and began to unroll the mattress, she took inventory of where she was and how she'd gotten here. As far as she could recall, the arresting officers had never told her what she'd been arrested for, and she hadn't asked because A, it would violate her rule of saying nothing, and B, it would all be revealed sooner or later. Imprisonment was a first for her. There had been a close call back in her teen years where a kind-hearted magistrate had overridden the desires of a county cop following a DUI charge, but to date she'd never spent a moment in jail. She surprised herself with her own calm. Sure, it was scary, but she'd scored a single room where she didn't have to deal with the politics and violence of other prisoners, and the entire ordeal was only a few hours old. Give it a few more, she thought. Once nighttime came and the boredom of her own company began to crush her, she imagined that there'd be plenty of panic to deal with. For the time being, she committed herself to treating this mess as an adventure. If nothing else, she was experiencing an adrenaline rush of a magnitude she hadn't felt since the sandbox. Jolaine's sole experience with the rigors and processes of the criminal justice system was limited to what she'd seen on television. As she spread the nearly see-through thin green sheet across the mattress, she thought through the events of the past couple of hours, and she tried to reconcile the facts of her situation to the fiction that she'd seen so often. They never read me my rights, she thought. The realization startled her. Wasn't that a requirement whenever someone was arrested? Yes, she was certain of it. Come to think of it, they'd never actually said that she was under arrest. That thought brought her bedmaking to a halt. She stood there with the top of the sheet tucked in and the bottom of the sheet suspended like a flag as she tried to figure out what that might mean. I'm in jail, but I haven't been arrested. The thought paralyzed her. She dropped the sheet and sat heavily on the bed. She felt the blood draining from her head. But she forced herself to sit upright anyway, so as not to give whoever was watching her camera feed any indication of fear. She didn't know why that was important, but it was. Jolaine told herself to calm down and to think through exactly what she did and didn't know. What she thought and what she feared were irrelevant. It was too easy to shoot out to the worst-case scenario, and to extrapolate from there that all roads and all options led to tragedy. Panic was the only result of bad assumptions, and panic always resulted in tragedy. She needed to think it all through. Fact. Her arrest violated all of the rules she was aware of regarding arrest procedures. Counterfact. She wasn't a lawyer, and not everything you saw on television was true— Hell, depending on what channel you watched, only half of what you saw in the news was true. Fact. Graham was the sole possessor of some kind of code that a lot of people thought was worth killing for. Fact. If her observations about her non-arrest were true, then someone was asleep at the switch because, again, if television lawyers knew what they were doing, any case against her would be fatally flawed and the government would be guaranteed to lose unless they don't care about losing. But why would that be? This couldn't all be some scare tactic, could it? Could that possibly be legal? Wouldn't there be consequences to pointing guns and pulling people out of their cars just to make a point? No, 
she thought. It was more than that. Just as she had seen the terror in Graham's eyes, she had also seen genuine fear in the eyes of those cops who took them down. They'd been expecting bad things from Jolaine, and that expectation had driven all of the rough handling that had followed, even down to manhandling a fourteen-year-old boy. Where did such fear come from? Clearly, the police had been alerted to be on the lookout for them. That, in turn, meant that someone had told them what and who to look for. But who? Who would even know what car she was driving? Fact. No one had asked her any questions. They hadn't even fingerprinted her. After all of the drama and all of the violence and near-violence, why would there be such silence? It was almost as though they'd been instructed not to say anything. That's it. She didn't know why exactly, but in that moment of clarity, she knew beyond all doubt that the jail staff had, in fact, been instructed not to speak with her. Just the basics, to make sure that she didn't pose an unreasonable threat, and then nothing else. All the praise she'd awarded herself for holding her tongue had, in fact, been a gift delivered by others. She hadn't needed to speak, because no one wanted to speak with her in the first place. So... Who was doing this? Why was she here? Who had she pissed off so badly? Whoever it was, they were important, and they were powerful. Powerful enough to mobilize a law enforcement agency. FBI, maybe? CIA? She imagined that a conspiracy this complex had to be run by some kind of alphabet agency. What's their next move? She wondered. Why take her to jail and then just let her sit? That didn't make sense. Then she got it. As the realization bloomed, her heart rate doubled. This was only the beginning of her journey. This was a holding place, a place to be only for as long as it took for whoever was in charge to move her someplace else. And she knew with certainty that when that transfer happened, she would come face to face with the agency that was pulling the strings. And then what? That answer was obvious, wasn't it? They didn't take her away and squeeze her for information that she didn't have. Jolaine stood again and paced her cell. To hell with what the camera watchers thought. She needed a plan, and she needed it before people arrived with keys and took her away. Just as certainly as she believed she'd landed on the reality of her non-arrest, she knew that after she left this place, after the bad guys, whoever they were, came to take her away, the fuse on her life would burn down to nothing. Once these people got from her whatever they wanted— they would stuff her into a shallow grave and never look back. The damn stool in the middle of the cell made it impossible even to pace. She needed to pace. She needed to scream. What the hell was she going to do? She hated the Mitchells for putting her in this spot. What had they been up to? She wanted to think that the Mitchells were patriots, and as such would never try to pass along a secret that could harm her country, but to learn otherwise would not surprise her. She knew that there were some foreign affiliations, and that not all of them were friendly. When Bernard and Sarah argued, it was always in their native language, some place in Eastern Europe, and consequently, Jolaine never knew the true substance of what they were saying. But she'd sensed growing tension over the past weeks, and she'd sensed that it had something to do with the visitors who'd been coming by with greater frequency. They gathered with the Mitchells for meetings in the same foreign tongue that she could not understand. Voices were often raised, however, and the visitors rarely departed happier than when they'd arrived. It was possible, she supposed, that the substance of those meetings was to conspire against the United States, but how could she know? And if that were indeed the case, that would mean that the Mitchells had willingly and willfully recruited her as a co-conspirator. Would they really do such a thing after all she'd done for Graham and for the family? How could she know? Jolaine sat on the shiny stool— the fact of the matter was that she couldn't know, not with any certainty. By extension, then, she had no choice but to assume the worst and act accordingly. So, now what? She asked herself that question as if she had choices. Locked in a concrete room, her options were limited to one. Wait. For what? She had no clue. But the wait was a guarantee. Sooner or later that door would open, and when it did— Options would arrive. She suspected that they would all be terrible ones, but at least they'd be options. She could not allow herself to be taken into the next stage. If a transfer lay in her future, and now she was certain that it did, 
She needed to make sure that the transfer would never be completed successfully. If it came to that, she'd die trying, because the one thing she knew beyond all doubt was that she intended to survive. Chapter 17 Deputy Price led Graham down the hallway and through a locked door into a part of the building the boy hadn't seen before. Is this a jail? Graham asked. Technically, no, the deputy said. This is just a police station. We have some holding cells and some interrogation rooms. You know all about one of those, but the jail itself is down the road a bit. Why am I here? The far side of the locked door opened up on a much larger area that looked like a hospital waiting room, or at least what Graham imagined that a hospital waiting room would look like. Molded plastic chairs, blue and orange, littered the area in what looked to his eyes to be a random order, as if people moved them throughout the day to form their own conversation groups, and then never put them back where they belonged. The yellow and brown theme continued out here, but the floors and walls seemed dirtier. Most of the chairs were empty now, and the occupants of the ones that were taken had all pulled theirs away from the others. No conversation groups were currently in session. Not sure how to answer your question, Deputy Price said. You could just tell the truth, Graham said. He'd meant it to be a flippant remark, and it hit its target squarely. Price got a little taller. I'm cutting you a break, kid. Don't make me regret it. Have a seat. Graham felt a gentle pressure on his shoulder. There was no way to call it a push. And he helped himself to a blue chair. Deputy Price pulled over an orange one and sat sideways in it, with his legs crossed and his left arm slung casually over the back. Now that they were sitting, the difference in height was almost nothing. Graham, I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea why you're here. We got orders to stop the car you were in and to take the occupants of that car into custody. Why? Something about the way Deputy Price handled himself put Graham at ease. As long as they were just talking like this, he felt safe. I don't have an answer for that, Price said. Sometimes that happens. We get an order to pull someone over and bring them in, and sometimes we don't find out what the reason is. Doesn't happen often, but sometimes. This was one of those times. So am I under arrest? None of what was happening fit into any of the Law & Order episodes he'd watched with Jolaine. No, you're in custody, but you're not under arrest. So I can leave. Do you have some place to go? The question hit Graham like a smack. Something sagged in his chest. On top of everything else that had turned shitty, he was homeless. Homeless and maybe an orphan. He felt a rush of sadness that made him gasp. Words wouldn't come. Deputy Price leaned in closer, close enough to touch, but he didn't touch. Talk to me, Graham. I want to help you. Have you and your friend Jolaine been up to no good? Graham wanted to answer. He wanted to tell this cop with the friendly eyes all about the people who invaded his house and shot up his family. He wanted to tell about the doctor in the middle of nowhere and about how terribly pale his mother looked the last time he saw her. He wanted to tell the cop about everything, and then he wanted to be free from it all. Graham wanted a do-over. He wanted a time machine where he could just climb in, turn a few dials and flip a few switches, and suddenly nothing is what it was. He wanted to do anything that would take away that horrible feeling in the pit of his stomach, the fear, no, the certainty, that something terrible was going to happen to him. Yet as much as he wanted it, as much as he would have sold his soul to attain it, he knew that none of it was possible. He knew that telling Deputy Price anything would pose more problems than it would solutions, just as Jolaine had said. They'd listened to the radio in the car, and they'd watched television in the motel room, yet there'd been no mention of all those terrible things. How was that possible? With no police reports to back him up, no one would believe his story anyway. And even if they did, and they drove all the way out to Antwerp to investigate, they'd find a lot of bullet holes and dead bodies, and then they'd start asking why he and Joe Lane were on the run instead of calling the police in the first place. And that would be a hell of a good question, Graham thought. Last night it didn't make sense to him why they didn't call the police, and it didn't make any more sense right now. They didn't call because Jolaine said that it would be a mistake to call. That was the only reason. And what kind of reason was that? 
reason enough for her to risk her life to save me and Mom. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Price's shoulders sagged. Son, I can't help you unless you talk to me. Something about the deputy's delivery rubbed Graham the wrong way, and his filters kicked in again. Maybe it was the use of the word son. He already had a father. He didn't need another one. Let me ask you a question, he said. The deputy shrugged. I'm all ears. That ugly lady, Peggy, she said she wanted to help me too. She told me that the best thing I could do was to tell her everything. Now you're saying I should do the same thing. Why should I believe anything you say? Price took his time answering. You can't honestly tell me that you don't trust me more than you trusted her. That just makes you the good cop. Excuse me? The good cop. You know what I mean. It's in every friggin' cop show. She was the bad cop and you're the good cop. You work in a team so that she pisses me off and then you butter me up. Price's eyes narrowed to the point of squinting. It's not like that, Graham. I promise you. Graham wanted to believe him. He thought he did believe him, but trust was just too big a risk. That's exactly what you would say if I was right, he said. Deputy Price took a breath to reply, but then he let it go and smiled. I got nothing to say to that, he said. You're right. That's exactly what I would say if I were trying to trick you. That's not where I'm coming from, but I understand where you're coming from. I got no answer that you can dare believe. Silence fell between them, and it lasted probably two minutes before a door on the far end of the room opened up and a young man and woman entered from the outside and walked to the front desk, a window thing with thick glass and a microphone. The couple didn't look much older than Jolaine. I believe those are your foster parents for the next day or three, Price said. Graham felt a jolt of panic. You mean I have to leave? I promised you a comfortable bed. We don't have any of those here. You'll be fine. They're the Markhams, and they're very nice people. You'll be safe with them. But I was beginning to feel safe here. This is a police station, Graham. It's not a place for fourteen-year-olds. You'll be better off there. Graham watched them at the little window as they talked to the lady in the uniform. They turned in unison and looked straight at him. The wife waved at him with the tips of her fingers. It reminded him of a cat scratching at a screen. I don't like them, he said. I'm telling you, they're good people, Price said. He leaned over to the side to gain access to his back pocket, and he pulled out a little black leather wallet. Inside was a stack of business cards. He slid one out and handed it to Graham. This is me. My numbers are on it. If you have any problems or concerns, if you get scared or if you just want to talk, you give me a call any time, day or night or early morning. Graham held the card in both hands. Why was this guy being so nice? What did he want? Price pointed with his head to the Markhams. They were approaching, and he held up a hand to tell them to stay back for a bit. They stopped and moved to some chairs on the other side of the waiting room. Look at me, Graham, Price said. Graham looked. He saw a mask of concern on the deputy's face. I know some bad things have happened. I don't know what they are, but just in watching the emotion in your face and in your body language, I know that something really bad is going on. I know that you feel as though you can't trust anyone. He paused, as if waiting for Graham to confirm or deny. He did neither. I'm going to tell you something important, Price continued. Whatever your secrets are, they're yours to keep from whoever you want to keep them. Now listen to me. If you're not willing to tell me, and that's fine that you're not, I respect that. I don't want you to tell anyone, understand? Whatever your secrets are... People are trying to hurt you to get them. That's not right. That scares me, and it should scare you. You keep your secrets secret, understand? Graham's sense of fear deepened. Price was serious, and he looked genuinely worried for him. Am I going to be okay? Graham asked. Deputy Price looked away. I don't know, Graham, he said. I just don't know. That's not the answer you wanted to hear, and I apologize for that. But it's the only answer I know how to give. Price leaned forward and put out two hands in a clamshell gesture. 
I pray to God that this is all just nothing, he said. But if the shit hits the fan, pardon my French, you give me a call and I'll be there for you. Please trust me that much. If you find yourself without any other options, I'm worth a roll of the dice. Graham found tears tracking his cheeks before he knew that he was crying. Price sat up straight. He shot a glance over to the Markhams. No tears, Graham, he said. That's no way to start with a new family. I hate to put it to you this way, but now's the time to suck it up and roll with what's coming. Don't show weakness, know what I mean? Graham, in fact, did not know what he meant, but he knew that nodding yes was the right thing to do. Price smacked the side of Graham's knee twice. Good, he said. I know this is all very scary, but try to think of it as an adventure. With that, the deputies stood and beckoned for the Markhams to come over and join them. They rose in unison and walked nearly in step. They stopped when they were six feet away, and they smiled. Anita, Peter, Price said. This is Graham Mitchell. Graham, this is Anita and Peter Markham. Anita smiled wider, and Peter extended his hand. Hi, Graham, he said. I'm sorry that you're going through tough times. I would consider it an honor to have you join us at our home. The words sounded at once sincere and rehearsed. Graham wasn't sure how they pulled it off, but it didn't feel threatening. He accepted the hand and they shook. Peter treated him like a girl, accepting only Graham's fingers and the handshake. That felt strange. Hi, Graham said. Anita's hand shot out next. I'm Anita, she said. This is Peter. Graham made a smile face and shook her hand, too. I got that, he said. He stood. Are you ready to go? Peter asked. Graham improved his posture and settled his shoulders. Sure, he said. And it was done. The three of them headed toward the front together. As they reached the door, Graham shot a look back to Deputy Price, but he'd already moved on to other matters. The lock turned and Jolaine's cell door opened. She stood from her concrete cot. A guard, an officer, they didn't like being called guards, said, Are you Jolaine Cage? Yes. Who the hell else would she be? They put her here, for God's sake. It's time to go. She instinctively took a step backward, away from the door. Go where? There's a team here to transfer you to Chicago. Why? Jolaine asked. The guard half smirked and assumed a weird, asymmetrical stance with one hand notched over the nightstick that resided where a firearm would be if he were a real cop. I know I look like I run the place, he said, but you'd be surprised the shit they don't tell me. Jolaine sensed that she was supposed to laugh at that, but she was disinclined. Yeah, okay, the officer said. I need you to turn around so I can cuff your hands. Jolaine didn't move. The officer rolled his eyes. Oh, come on, don't do this to me. It's almost the end of my shift. Don't make me call the crisis team. He said that as if she had any idea what a crisis team was. I don't understand, she said. While mostly a statement of truth, it was also a delaying tactic, buying time for one of those options she'd been waiting for to materialize. The officer said, What's to understand? You turn around, and I cuff you. But I don't want to go anywhere, Jolaine said. What's in Chicago? That's a long way from here. Great food in a pretty city, the guard said. Though I don't think you're scheduled for a lot of sightseeing. That joke fell flatter than the first one. Look, I don't know, okay? I have orders to deliver you out front. For me, that's the beginning and the end. And please believe me when I tell you that I have every intention of following my orders. Jolaine remained in place. Your call, the officer said, is whether it all happens easily or if you end up bloody in the process. But I haven't been charged with anything, Jolaine protested. The guard shrugged with his whole body. Handcuffs dangled from one of his outstretched hands. That's yet another thing that lies outside my give-a-shit zone, he said. I've told you what my orders are. Now you have to decide whether or not you're going to follow them. Don't you see that this is wrong? The guard said nothing. He just stood there, the handcuffs dangling from one fingertip. Jolaine tried to think of an alternative, but no option seemed available. She could refuse to leave, 
But then the crisis team would storm in. She imagined burly guards in riot gear with nightsticks and pepper spray. The result would be blood and bruises, and she'd still end up in the car where she didn't want to be. Or she could fight this guy. Same result. She had no option but to comply. She turned her back and surrendered. Benice Alexander entered the final bit of code into her keyboard, and bingo! Her screen jumped to life with a checkerboard of color images from the local jail in Lambertville, Michigan. That one had been a difficult hack, far more difficult than the security feed from the police station down the street where Graham Mitchell was being held. Once in, she now had to cope with an embarrassment of riches. In the case of the police station, she was faced with a matrix of 60 camera images. For the jail, it was at least twice that many. Choosing which images to concentrate on was a dizzying challenge. After only a minute or two of watching both banks of images among four screens, Benice opted to ignore the police feed and concentrate on the jail instead. As the mother of a young teen herself, her heart belonged to Graham. But the boy had one big thing working against him. The most recent picture she had of the kid was nearly three years old. Kid years and dog years shared the common element of vast physical changes in very short periods of time. Even if she found the image of someone who likely was Graham, there'd be no way for her to be sure. With a few clicks of her mouse, the Nietzsche reduced the police station to blackness and then split the jail feed among the four screens. As was often the case with jails, every cell had its own camera with its own video feed, but the voyeuristic element of it made her exceedingly uncomfortable, especially when it came to the cells of young men who, she decided, were incapable of keeping their hands off their private parts for more than a few minutes at a time. It was that thought, in fact, that awarded her first big break in the challenge to locate Jolaine Cage within the jail. While she hadn't had a chance to figure out the logic and the order of the camera feeds, assuming there even was such a thing, she knew that wherever she found a male prisoner, she no longer had to worry about finding Jolaine. In the end, it turned out that fewer women committed crimes in Michigan than men, and by a large margin. By the time she narrowed the images down to the ladies' cells, it was a simple matter to locate Jolaine. She looked exactly like her photo. If she wanted to, Venice could have manipulated the camera from her desktop, but she opted not to because of the risk. Somewhere in that jail, a guard or ten was watching exactly the same images she was, and if something started to pan or zoom without affirmative input from them, the result would likely be unhappy. Like peeping Tom's, Tomasinas, everywhere, she needed to be grateful for the view she had, even if it wasn't as good as it could be. As she watched, Jolaine was in the middle of a conversation with someone who was just outside the edge of her camera's view, and it was not a happy exchange. From the way Jolaine moved, Nietzsche imagined that she was trying to put space between herself and whoever was speaking with her. Since the cells only held one prisoner apiece, that meant that the other party had to be outside the cell, which, by definition, meant that the other party had to be in a hallway. Splitting the images yet again onto different screens, she was able to increase the size of the thumbnails and increase their clarity. Vinice scanned the dozens of squares, looking for the image of someone in the mirror image of Jolaine, facing the edge of a frame while engaging in a heated discussion. She did this while glancing back to Jolaine's frame every couple of seconds just to keep track. There, she said. The sound of her own voice startled her, and she pointed at the screen as if to display her discovery to someone else. A man in uniform stood in the middle of a long hallway, dangling what appeared to be handcuffs from his fingers. Details were difficult because it was a fairly long angle. Benice imagined that the camera had been placed at the end of the hallway to capture all of the doorways in a single frame. She dragged that frame over to the screen that displayed the interior of Jolaine's cell, and she watched. It wouldn't be beyond the technical capacity of the security system to capture sound as well, but Venice had not had the time to untangle that part of the knot. She'd have to settle for just the video. Venice keyed her microphone. It was a gooseneck that rose from the table and allowed her to multitask while minding Jonathan's business and keeping him out of trouble. Scorpion, mother hen, she said. Jonathan's voice told her to go ahead. I've tapped into the video feed from the jail where they're keeping PC2. I have eyes on her right now. I copy, Jonathan said. We're still ten to twelve miles out. What's the situation? Venice keyed the mic 
and then released it as she watched Jolaine turn and offer her hands to the guard behind her. Stand by, Benice said. I need to pay attention to the keyboard and screens for a few minutes. Multitasking was one thing, but she sensed that what was coming was going to require intense concentration, and she was right. As Jolaine moved her hands behind her on the left-hand side of the screen, the man in the uniform applied cuffs to someone on the right. The actions were too perfectly choreographed to be anything but two angles on the same action. I think they're moving her right now, Venice said into the microphone. I see them applying handcuffs. Yes, they're moving. Stand by. Venice watched the hallway feed as the guard ushered Jolaine out. With Jolaine's cell now empty, Venice killed that image from her screen and watched as the PC was led directly toward the camera. She understood that it was a mistake to ever look in a PC's eyes, even through a television screen. The eyes were a person's window to emotion, their window to personhood, and Jonathan had told her a thousand times to keep the emotion out of O300 missions, rescue missions. Until they were safe, PCs were merely objectives, pawns worth dying to protect, and as such, it was a mistake to get involved in the emotions or the injustice of their situation. Jonathan's theory maintained that sympathy got in the way of sound decision-making. Still, Venice saw the terror in Jolaine's eyes, and her stomach tensed. They disappeared as they crossed under the camera, and Venice jerked her head to the thumbnails on her other screen, scanning for the movement that would match the images she'd just seen. This time, she saw them twice, in adjacent thumbnails from the front and the rear. They appeared to be approaching an interior guard station of some sort. The man in the uniform kept his hand on Jolaine's arm, just above her elbow, and Jolaine moved with a mechanical stride, her head cast downward. She seemed to be dreading what lay ahead. The uniform had a brief discussion with whoever was in the booth, and then they started moving again, disappearing from view. Venice felt as if she was getting the hang of this now. Her eye caught the movement in the next frame right away as Jolaine and her escort headed down yet another hallway that was remarkable only for the fact that it was so unremarkable. No doors, no other people, no anything. When they turned the next corner to the left, Venice picked them up in a screen that looked like a waiting room. It was too Spartan for the public, but it certainly was not intended for the incarcerated. The chairs looked too comfortable. From those two comfortable chairs arose a matching pair of men who had to be affiliated with a federal law enforcement agency. Benice had no personal frame of reference, but she'd seen enough of these guys over the years to assume that they slept and showered in their suits, and somehow ended up always looking pressed and neat. There was a brief discussion between the guy in the uniform and the men in the suits, and then the suits took custody of Jolaine. Venice clicked a freeze frame, essentially a photograph, courtesy of the security feed, to capture the moment, and then watched them leave with Jolaine sandwiched between them. Two men in suits have just taken custody of Jolaine, Venice said into the radio. As she spoke, she clicked a freeze frame that nabbed all of the faces. Any idea where they're going? Jonathan asked. Give me a minute, Venice said. At her core, Venice was a law and order gal the kind of person who would stand ten minutes in a grocery line because her basket had sixteen items instead of the fifteen that limited access to the express lane. But this business of breaking into computer systems and seeing things that she wasn't supposed to see was the thing that made her life worthwhile. As the threesome approached the limits of the picture frame, Benice scanned ahead on the other thumbnails. She expected that the next element would be to step out into the night, so she concentrated on those images. And there they were. Venice keyed her mic. Scorpion, they're exiting the jail now. They'll be on the road in a minute or two. What's your position? We have no chance, Jonathan said. Venice heard the frustration in his voice, and she shared it. The feds, whoever they were, had parked close to the jail building and the turnaround apron in front of the main entry. They led Joe Lane to a nondescript Ford sedan. It looked black, but at this hour any car might look black. Venice watched as one of the suits put his hand on the back of her head and pressed her into the back seat, and then moved to the shotgun seat up front. They sat there for maybe ten seconds, and then they started moving. They'd be out of frame in just a couple of seconds, and if that happened, Venice feared that they'd be lost. How do you find a nondescript Ford when that's the only identifier you have? Her eyes scanned the other thumbnails. There had to be another image. 
She only needed one more. Yes, she shouted, and she clicked the freeze frame. Good news, Finiche said into the radio. We got a license plate number. Chapter 18 The Markhams put Graham on edge. They were too... nice. They were so intent on being cheerful that they never asked a question about him, not even how he was doing the gold standard for meaningless questions. After Deputy Price handed him off, all the Markhams talked about was how safe he was and how happy they were to have him as part of their family. He didn't bother to tell them that he had no desire to be part of their family. He didn't want to be part of their neighborhood or their tribe or even their thoughts. He wanted life to be what it was thirty hours ago, and the fact that that was not possible didn't do anything to change the reality of the wish. "'Let us know if you need anything,' Peter Markham said. "'I know this is a tough time, and we want to make it as easy for you as possible.' "'I hope you like dogs,' Anita Markham said. "'We have a poodle who loves people.' Graham considered lying, telling him that he was deathly allergic to dogs, just to mess with their heads, but decided not to. They meant well, and while his stranger-danger spidey senses were going crazy, they seemed like nice enough people, and they were trying their best to help him. But he was scared, more scared than he'd ever been of anything at any time in his life, and he knew that it was a mistake to trust anyone. Except, sooner or later... You had to, right? He was only fourteen years old. He knew he was smart, and he knew that he could be tough when he had to be. But there was a whole lot of the world that remained out of reach for someone his age. He couldn't drive, and he couldn't earn a living. Where would he live? How would he live if he didn't ultimately trust someone? He'd have no choice. The question would be deciding who that trustworthy person would be. So far, all he knew for certain was that he wasn't allowed to trust any of the people that everyone else was supposed to depend on. According to Joe Lane, the police were his enemy, and so was the FBI. Who else? And if those people were the enemy, how was he supposed to decide who were his friends? Was it safe to assume, just because the Markhams had picked him up, that they were automatically on the trustworthy list? For the time being, it didn't matter. He was in their back seat, and the car was moving. Unless he wanted to take a header out the door onto the road, he was pretty much stuck with one option, and that was to enjoy the ride. The three of them drove in silence through the darkness from the back seat. All Graham saw were trees. They passed quickly in the wash of the headlights. How far do we have to go? Graham asked. It felt like they'd been on the road for over an hour. So you do have a voice. Peter said with a laugh. For a while there, we were wondering. <laughs> nice to meet you. It was a teasing attempt at being friendly, of striking up a conversation, but Graham wondered if they had any idea how many bullets had been fired at him in the past day. If they did, maybe they'd understand that his sense of humor wasn't everything it used to be. It's not that far, Anita said. Maybe twenty minutes. Are you okay? Do you need to stop? I'm okay, he said. Peter shot him a look over his shoulder. We're really sorry you're having to go through all this, he said. I don't know the details of your particular case, and I don't need to unless you want to talk about it. But if it makes you feel any better at all, we deal with a lot of kids who are in the same position as you. And this night, the first night, is almost always the very worst. Things get better from here. More nice words from a man who clearly had no freaking clue what he was talking about. His father was almost certainly dead. His mother had been badly wounded, and the people who did it to them were now trying to hunt down the survivors. For all Graham knew, one of those survivors, himself, had been successfully hunted down and was now being taken to a place he didn't know to endure whatever was coming. Where in all of that was any possibility that the worst was over? When you can't say something nice, Graham opted to say nothing. A few seconds later, the car slowed. Then it slowed some more. What's wrong? Anita asked. This guy behind me, Peter replied. He's been on my tail for the last five miles. I'm giving him a chance to pass. Graham looked out the back window into the headlights of the vehicle behind them. They were too bright for him to tell whether they belonged to a car or a truck, but they were very close. They made no effort to pass. Graham's heart rate doubled. Go faster, he said. 
Oh, no, Peter said. I'm not getting caught up and rode. They're going to try to take me, Graham said. Hearing the edge in his own voice raised his anxiety levels even higher. What? Anita said. Peter laughed. Whoa, Graham! Whoa yourself, Peter! Graham snapped. He didn't know how he was as certain as he was, but there was zero doubt in his mind that he was correct. This was the hit team. We're out in the middle of nowhere. This is exactly the right place. Perhaps a few too many FPS games there, young man, Peter said. Graham recognized FPS as first-person shooter games, and he hated them. Did they tell you that people tried to murder my whole family? Graham asked. Did they tell you that my mom is in some secret hospital, and that my friggin' au pair is really a bodyguard, and she's being hunted down too? Graham knew damn well that no one had told them that, because until right now, Graham hadn't told anyone either. You're making that up, Anita said, but he heard the doubt in her voice, the fear. No, I'm not. Graham said. Why would I? He cut himself off. He wanted to live, not argue. If you don't believe me, speed up. Why? If they speed up too, then we'll know I'm right. I don't want to know that you're right, Anita said. Fear had hijacked her voice and transformed it into a squeak. Okay then, Graham negotiated. If they don't, then we'll know I'm wrong. Peter said nothing, but the engine noise grew as their car accelerated. Graham saw the concern in Peter's eyes as his gaze darted between the road and the rearview mirror. Graham undid his seatbelt so he could turn around in the seat. They're not falling behind, he announced. So I noticed, Peter said. He picked up more speed, but the distance between the cars actually decreased. My God, Peter, Anita said. Slow down, you'll kill us all. No, Graham shouted. Better him killing us all than them killing us all. Peter, come on! Anita coaxed. Be reasonable. This can't be true. We don't even know this boy. You don't need to know me. I don't know you either. Just don't stop. Peter fixed him with his eyes in the mirror, then glanced beyond him into the lights of their pursuer. He backed off the accelerator. What are you doing? Graham shouted. We've got to go faster. No, we don't, Peter said. We've established that they're trying to follow us. It's not important to outrun them. As long as we keep moving, nothing changes. We'll drive to a public place, a restaurant parking lot, or maybe a firehouse or police station. Whatever needs to be settled can be settled there. I'm calling the police, Anita said. She dug in her purse for her cell phone. Graham started to object out of reflex, then realized that that was a pretty good idea. Anita stared at her phone. What's wrong? Peter asked. No signal, she said. He sighed. Yeah, this is a real dead zone in here. Dead zone? Did he really just say dead zone? Turn around and buckle in, Graham, Peter said. You staring out the window doesn't help anyone. We're going to be... Anita yelled, Look out! Graham was still turning when Peter slammed on the brakes, and before he had a chance to register anything that was going on, he found himself rebounding off the back of Anita's seat on his way to land on the floor of the back seat. Oh, my God, she screamed. It's a trap. They set a roadblock. Graham hadn't seen it yet, but he didn't have to, didn't want to. His ribs landed hard on the hump on the floor, and something sharp jabbed his leg. He thought maybe it was an ice scraper left over from last winter. Run, he shouted, and he scrabbled along the floor to find the door handle. He still hadn't looked when he pulled the latch and pushed the door open on Anita's side. He expected gunfire at any second, so he kept his head down as he spilled onto the road. He hit first on his back, lighting up the pain in his ribs. But then he rolled to his hands and knees, found his feet, and took off at a run. Dier! Someone yelled. It was a man's voice, and it was heavily accented. He's running away! That extra bit allowed Graham to recognize that accent as Chechen. Friends of his parents, perhaps? Were they here to help? Were they among the people it was safe for him to trust? No, trust no one. He ran. Graham, the man yelled. Do not run. We are here to help you. Bullshit. Graham lowered his head and concentrated on the wall of leaves and branches that lay ahead of him. They were going to hurt when he ran into them at this speed, but the fact that they were dense and it was dark meant that they would be able to provide him with shelter. He'd just have to duck in far enough to be covered, and then he could hunker down. Your mother sent me the man yelled. He panted through the words, which seemed to be coming from less far away. Graham didn't dare look behind him. He didn't dare do anything that might slow him down. 
He wished now that Joe Lane had bought him running shoes instead of... A heavy hand landed between his shoulder blades, a shove that sent him face first into the ground. He got his hands out in time to catch himself, and they slid through rocks and sticks, tearing the hide from the heels of his hands and also from his knees. He reflexively clenched his teeth to keep his jaws from snapping together and maybe biting his tongue. Once splayed out and stabilized, he struggled to find his feet again, but it was too late. The man was on him. The collar of Graham's T-shirt went tight as the guy pulled on it, and then he felt another hand on his arm as he was lifted to his feet. Graham struggled against the man's strength, wriggling like a grounded fish to break his hold. He got his arm free and used the momentum to spin and try to back out of his shirt. He heard the fabric tear, and he felt the constriction release a little, but then the man punched him. Graham didn't see it, but it felt like a closed fist, and it landed hard on the exact spot where the center hump had nailed him when they screeched to a stop. The blow triggered a cough, and Graham tasted blood. His knees sagged. "'I am sorry, Graham,' the man said. "'I do not mean to hurt you. You leave me no choice. I hope I not hurt too bad.' "'Leave me alone!' Graham yelled, but it was a weak sound. He took a step to run again, but knew it would be a wasted effort. Whatever the guy had hit— had ruined the wiring of his chest. It didn't hurt so much as it didn't work anymore. He couldn't take a full breath. The pain will pass soon, the man said. I am sorry. You must come with me now. Through his gasps for air, Graham managed to ask, Who are you? Looking up at the man, he saw no features. Perhaps it was the darkness of the night, but perhaps he was wearing a mask. Graham thought that to be more likely the case. If you promise to walk with me, I will promise not to hurt you any more. Do we have a deal? Graham nodded. Yes, he said. Even as the words left his lips, he knew that it was a deal that he wouldn't hesitate to break. Good, the man said. Let us walk back to the cars. As they made the walk back, Graham saw for the first time what the Markhams had seen before they slammed on the brakes. Two pickup trucks had blocked the entire road. If they had continued to speed, as Graham had wanted them to do, God only knows what might have happened. They'd probably all be dead. There was absolutely zero room for them to have sneaked by. Who are you? Graham asked again. That doesn't really matter, the man said. There was a dismissiveness, a finality to his tone, that told Graham that it would be useless to ask that question again. He'd run farther than he'd thought, probably a hundred yards. It took a long time to negotiate the walk back, and the trip was made longer by the fact that somewhere in the encounter, Graham had run out of one of the replacement flip-flops they'd issued to him at the police station. It was annoying enough walking on one that he paused in the stroll back to pull the other one off and walk barefoot. I have him, his escort said to the crowd that had gathered around the Markham's car. Peter and Anita had been pulled out, they were standing on the passenger side, the side closest to Graham, with their hands on their heads. They both looked terrified. What is going on? Peter demanded. Why are you doing this? We've done nothing wrong. Graham thought he might have been hearing his own words from a few hours ago being recited back to him. I'm sorry, he said to Anita as he passed within speaking distance. I tried to warn you. He felt a hand on his shoulder, pulling him to a stop. What did you tell them? The malevolence in the man's tone told him that he'd accidentally crossed some kind of line. Nothing, Graham said, but he knew that the word had come out too quickly. Nothing that they probably didn't already know. He tried to make eye contact with the man he was speaking to and saw that he was, in fact, wearing a mask, the kind you would wear in the middle of winter to prevent frostbite on your nose, but made of a lighter material. I see, the man said. He looked over at Anita, who stood maybe ten feet away, and at Peter, who stood three feet farther. From somewhere under his shirt, the masked man produced a pistol. He pointed it at Anita and fired a single bullet through her forehead. She dropped straight down, as if her body had been unplugged. Graham didn't know if the voice he heard yelling was his own or if it was Peter's. Two seconds later, he knew it was Peter's voice, because it fell silent, as the gunman's second bullet caught the man in the mouth and killed him instantly. There, the gunman said. Now it doesn't matter what you told them. 
Chapter 19 The Nietzsche pressed the transmit button. Scorpion, Mother Hen. Go ahead. PC-2 was just picked up at the jail by a team claiming to be federal agents. I don't have access to their names, but the car they're driving is registered to Emin Zakev of Detroit, Michigan. That happens to be the same person who lives at the address called from the Hummingbird Motel just minutes before the shooting in the parking lot. In the pause that followed, the Nietzsche imagined Jonathan and Boxers discussing the importance of the disclosure. After fifteen seconds, Scorpion's voice came back. What do we know about the owner? Really, not very much. Not yet, anyway. As she spoke, she continued to plow through whatever data she could pull up. Sometimes it was difficult to decide which was the better move when delivering news to her boss. Or should she wait until she had the whole story? In this case, she went with the headlines simply because of the speed with which everything was changing. Roger, Jonathan said. Get back to me when you know something. Vinice owed an answer, and she was going to find it. Every person on the planet had some kind of past, and for every past, a record existed somewhere in cyberspace. Maybe it was an application to a zoning board to put an addition on their house, or maybe it was as simple as a driver's license. Each of those documents, and thousands of variations of tens of thousands of different possibilities, opened a door to other information. And if one were talented enough in the business of wrangling ones and zeros, most of those doors could be opened. She often thought of herself as a digital burglar. Armed with a unique set of lockpicks, she could enter spaces where she was not welcome and peek into the most private parts of people's lives. She assumed that Emin Zakev was a pseudonym of some sort. In the short term, that meant that she wouldn't be able to dig up much about his past that would be relevant to her right now. Tracing aliases was not especially difficult, but it was outrageously time-consuming, and time was the commodity of which she had the least. She decided to treat the name as if it were real, thus ignoring his past and concentrating on the present. If he used the same pseudonym to register his car and pay his phone bills, there were likely a lot of other things he did with the same name. People rarely thought about the width and depth of the footprints they left every day simply by going through the motions of life. The email address you use to read the New York Times is the same one you use to order toys off the Internet. The credit card you use for cable television is the same one you use to eat at restaurants. Once Venice was able to break into one usage of a credit card and was able to learn the password, a person's entire life lay right there, spread out for her to explore. As was often the case, the phone company records proved easiest to breach. Armed with Emin Zakev's MasterCard and his password, she was able to gain access to every expense he had charged over the past three years. Most of it was useless to her. At this stage, she didn't care what food he preferred or what books he read, though that could prove important later. For the time being, she just wanted something. More often, she did not even know what that something was until she stumbled upon it. In a perfect world, that something would somehow lead her to, Oh, my God! she exclaimed. It came out half as a shout and half as a laugh. Secure Trace! It was her first real break, and it was a giant one. Secure Trace was a GPS-based subscription tracking service that automatically called the police if the car's airbag deployed. Operators responded to calls for directions or, in the most advanced and expensive versions of the program, would provide a kind of valet service to help lost drivers find their way to a particular location. As with Protect All Security, Secure Trace was the most common service of its kind, and as such, the Nietzsche had penetrated their firewall ages ago, in support of a different case. Since then, she'd been careful to leave no traces of her occasional visits. As long as a company had no idea that their security had been violated, they had no reason to make substantial changes. Fewer changes, in turn, meant continued easy access, and that, boys and girls, was the holy grail of hacking. Secure Trace was even kind enough to put customers' account numbers on their credit card invoices. They used that same account number internally. Once inside their system, all Venice had to do was type in the account number, and she'd be able to find the precise location of the enrolled vehicle, written in longitude and latitude. A simple conversion from there would give her a satellite view of the location. The view wouldn't be real-time, of course. In fact, the satellite photos could be years old, 
but at least she could find it on the map and relay directions if needed. In this case, Amin Zakev was on Route 474, headed north toward Detroit. I got you, she said with a grin. Jonathan never had much respect for the law enforcement community. He thought that too many cops put their careers ahead of matters of right and wrong, a trait that was trumped three times over by the prosecutors who saw every indictment as a political statement, the next rung in the ladder of their electoral aspirations. During his days as a hired gun for Uncle Sam, he'd run into a few such careerists in the Army, but precious few of them within the unit. Disdain for the profession notwithstanding, he had to respect their ability to pull stakeout duty. Boxers and he had been sitting in the car watching for Peter and Anita Markham for over an hour. It was a pleasant little street in a pleasant little neighborhood, which roughly translated to being a boring-as-hell spot in the middle of the American nightmare called suburbia. How do we know when we've waited long enough? Big Guy asked. When they get here, I guess. How long can it take? Boxer started to answer, but stopped and dipped his forehead toward a spot ahead of them. Looks like we might have friends, he said. A copper-colored van with tinted side windows approached headlong from the opposite end of the street and took up a position on the other side, about equidistant from the Markham residence. In the dark, he couldn't make out any other details. They're not even subtle, Boxers agreed. How do you want to handle it? Jonathan shrugged. There's nothing to handle yet. They're just a couple of guys out for a drive, just like us. It's that just like us part that I worry about, Boxers said. The driver of the other car killed his lights. No one opened a door. Jonathan brought binoculars to his eyes. Copy down this license number. He read off the Michigan plate number. Got it, Boxers said. He'd written it on a page of the notebook he'd pulled from a pocket on his thigh. Jonathan was reaching for the transmit button when his radio broke squelch and Venice said, Scorpion, mother hen. He looked over at Big Guy. Okay, that was scary. He keyed the mic. Go ahead, mother hen. I have virtual eyeballs on Emin Zakev, she said. Jonathan sighed. I'm tired, mother hen. What do virtual eyeballs look like? She explained about Secure Trace and revealed the physical location of the vehicle. That's only about a thirty-minute head start from you, she concluded. Zakev has PC2, Jonathan said, referring to Jolaine. She is substantially less important to us than PC1. What do we have on the boy? A pause. When Venice's voice returned, it was heavy with concern. Nothing that I haven't already told you. Has he not shown up already? Negative, Jonathan said. But we have some friends who have. Tell me when you're ready to copy a license plate number. Tracing plates barely qualified for Venice 101. Ready when you are, she said. Jonathan read the number that Boxers held up. Seconds later, Venice announced, That number traces to a Catherine Kennison out of Muncie, Indiana. It's a Prius. Boxers chuckled. Did you know that Prius means little penis in Latin? Jonathan laughed. He had no idea what Prius meant, but he was nearly certain it wasn't that. That's not the vehicle I'm looking at, he said over the radio. I'm assuming there's no report of the Prius being stolen. That's almost always the headline of motor vehicle reports, Benice said. I don't see anything like that. Stand by, Jonathan said. He looked to boxers. Any thoughts? I defer to the brains of the outfit, Big Guy said. I just drive and break things. You think all the lofty thoughts. Jonathan smiled. Reading through the bullshit, he understood that Big Guy had no better idea of the next step than he did. I'll tell you something that bugs me, Big Guy said. As far as I know, this dance has only two sides, the bad guys and us. Those guys in the other car are bad guys by default. The Markhams are way late getting here, and that's not good. If not good happens to the good guys, it has to be at the hands of the bad guys. So, how come the bad guys are watching the same house we are? Jonathan was impressed. It was a very good point. You know what? He said. I think we should go out and have a little chat with... Break, 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 Finice said. There was a new edge to her voice, something close to panic. Emergency traffic, Scorpion, are you there? Jonathan punched the transmit button. Go ahead, he said. This is bad, 
Benice said. I just got an urgent update from ISIS. There's been a multiple shooting on the road between the police station and your location. Two people shot, a man and a woman. The notice uses the phrase execution style. Something twisted in Jonathan's gut. Is it the Markhams? No names yet, Benice said. The investigation is just beginning. All I know is that the victims are young and that they were driving a car that matches the description of the Markham's car. Jonathan closed his eyes. This was bad. Any mention of a teenager? Negative. Jonathan slammed the dashboard with his hand. He looked to boxers and keyed the mic at the same time. You know this means they got him, right? He said. That means they've got both of them, boxers said. And they're split up. Jonathan noted. I don't know that they knew what they were doing, but that's a smart move. We have to choose our targets. We're choosing the kid, right? Boxers asked. In a perfect world, we would, Jonathan said. But we don't know his whereabouts. We do know where the girl is. She's not the primary target. That's why we have secondary targets, Jonathan explained. When the primary is unavailable, you go for second best. Boxers shook his head. No he said. We're not choosing a trained professional over a helpless kid. We're not choosing anything, Jonathan corrected. We're playing the only hand we were dealt. In column A, we know something. It's not much, but it's a GPS tracking point. In column B, we know zip. It makes no sense. Then let's learn something, Boxer said. He opened his door and stepped out into the night. What the hell? Then Jonathan got it. The big guy was going to confront the men in the other car. Box, no! Too late. Big guy was already striding toward the van. Shit! Jonathan spat. He opened his own door and stepped out to cover his friend. If you've got a plan, this would be a good time to clue your boss in on it. Just gonna chat, Boxer said. He moved with surprising grace and speed. For the big guy, chatting and head-breaking were often synonymous. To their credit, the guys in the van read the situation for what it was. They pulled away from the curb and drove off, in a hurry. At first, they seemed to be heading directly toward boxers, but when Big Guy didn't dodge out of the way, they swerved around him. Do not draw on them, Jonathan commanded. Boxers hadn't made a move for his Beretta, but Jonathan knew the man well enough to anticipate. Cowards, Boxers grumbled. What the hell was that? They're bad guys, Boxers said. They know where Graham Mitchell is. He glared after the van as it disappeared down the residential street and turned the corner. No, they don't, Jonathan countered. We just discussed this. If they were scoping the place out, then they didn't know that the Markham vehicle was hit. Boxers shifted his eyes and looked down at Jonathan. Realization dawned. Well, shit, he said. He started walking back toward their vehicle it was as close to an admission of a mistake as Boxers was capable of making. Jonathan pressed the transmit button on his radio. Mother Hen, Scorpion, I need you to send me the coordinates for PC-2's location and a probable intercept point. In all the years Jonathan had been plying his trade, he had never lost a precious cargo. He wasn't starting now. Chapter 20 Graham's world had no meaning. After shooting the Markhams, his captors had descended upon him. It was five against one, maybe more. He couldn't resist as they shoved some kind of cloth into his mouth and sealed it in with a long strip of what looked and felt like duct tape. They passed three loops around his head, and then he was silent. He'd tried screaming, but the sound went nowhere. Next, they pinioned his arms behind his back. They wrapped something... Rope, maybe, but it felt wider than that, around his wrists. And then they wrapped more of it around his elbows. With his mouth and arms taken care of, they'd pressed lumps of what felt like moist clay against his eyes and wrapped them in place. Then they did the same thing with his ears. The final step was to bind his knees together and then his ankles. He was blind, deaf, and dumb. As time passed and his limbs fell asleep, he was also paralyzed. He'd lost all track of time, Someone could have told him he'd been wherever he was for hours or for days, and he wouldn't be able to argue. All he knew was that he was in a vehicle of some sort, and he only knew that because of the constant bouncing movement. He also smelled the faint aroma of gasoline. Nothing strong or nauseating, 
but definitely there. There was also the stink of his own sweat and his own fear. He didn't think he'd pissed himself, but the smell was definitely there. God, it was hot. He was soaked through with sweat. He'd hoped for a while that the sweat on his face would loosen the tape around his mouth, but he'd had no such luck. Not yet, anyway. His nose was clogging up, and he was terrified of suffocating. He kept blowing out hard and then trying to inhale easily. God only knew how much snot he'd blasted all over himself and his surroundings. These people wanted him dead. Or did they? Killing him would have been the easiest thing in the world to do. They didn't hesitate for even a second before killing the Markhams. How difficult would it have been to shoot him in the head just as they'd shot Peter and Anita? The Markhams, he thought. I killed them. If it hadn't been for me, they'd still be alive. Even as the thought formed in his head, he knew that it wasn't true. Not completely, anyway. But it was true enough not to be false. How many more people had to die because of this ridiculous code? What could possibly be so important, so vital, that a stupid random string of numbers and letters was worth killing for? And what had the Markhams done to deserve being shot and left in the grass to be found by animals? Out of nowhere, images of wolves and buzzards appeared in his head, tearing and picking away at the Markhams' dead bodies. He tried to will the images away, but they wouldn't go. He knew that wolves didn't even live in this part of the country, but that didn't stop the horror movie footage from playing in his brain. They rooted deeply into Peter Markham's gut, pulling out intestines, and the car hit a huge bump, big enough to make him bounce, and it seemed to be slowing. In fact, there were a lot of bumps, making him wonder if they'd gone off-road. Oh, shit, no one will ever find my body. Graham shook his head and thumped it against the floor. He had to quit thinking things like that. He needed to become more like Jolaine, more logical. Not everything was a huge crisis. Not everything spelled his imminent death. Settle the hell down, he said, though the words came out as a muffled, jumbled mess. He remembered Jolaine's words, always think and wait for an opportunity to take action. But what action could he take when he couldn't even move? That couldn't last forever, could it? Sooner or later, they were going to have to at least free his mouth. They wanted information from him, after all. And if he couldn't speak, there wasn't a hell of a lot for him to say, was there? He decided that the first and only thing he would say was that he wouldn't say anything until they untied him. He'd heard that arms and legs could get gangrene or some such thing if they didn't get enough circulation, and gangrene meant getting the arms and legs cut off. Well, that, for damn sure, wasn't going to happen to him. The motion stopped. Graham didn't know whether he'd felt the vehicle stop or if he'd just noticed the stillness for the first time. He sensed movement, and then hands were on him, and he was being lifted. Unable to kick his feet, he tried an inchworm motion that seemed to loosen their grip, but only for a second before someone got a good hold on his bound knees. From there, he was destined to go wherever they decided to take him. After a minute or two of manhandling, they rested him on a hard surface. It felt cold against his sweat-soaked T-shirt. The chill was a relief at first, but then not so much. It was a little too cold. They laid him face up so that his bound hands pressed into the small of his back, hurting his thumbs and stretching his spine backward past the extent it was supposed to go. Graham knew that people were talking around him, but there were no discernible words, only muffled rumbles that had the rhythm of speech. He jumped as someone touched the bare flesh of his knees, and jumped again when they touched his ankles. When hands fumbled at his head as well, he understood that they were in the process of untying him. That, in itself, was a relief, until he realized that the serious business of why he was here was about to begin. For the time being, they needed him alive. That gave him a few more minutes, anyway. They freed his ears first. He felt the pressure of the bindings releasing from around his head, and then there was a soft pop as the clay stuff was pulled away. The tape didn't come off easily from around his mouth. The effort jerked his head first to the side, and then off whatever surface he was lying on.
When the final loop came free from around his mouth, it hurt like hell. He wondered if they'd torn skin off with it. Ow! he said through the gauze in his mouth. You can spit that out, the man with the accent said. Graham tried, but his mouth was so dry that the edge of the material stuck to his lips. Ultimately, he had to force it out with his tongue. I would help you, the familiar voice said, but I fear that you would bite me. Then I would have no choice but to pull all of your teeth out with the pliers. I wouldn't want to do that. I don't think you would want that either. The man spoke the horrible words with such an easy tone that Graham didn't doubt one bit that he would do exactly as he said. Now sit up, Graham, the man said. Let's give your arms and shoulders some relief. They helped him roll to his side, and as he did, he jumped as his feet and legs fell. You're on the table, his captor explained. Do not be afraid. We will not let you fall. Graham relaxed a little, and then realized how stupid that was. They could just as easily push him down on his face as live up to their promise. Only they didn't push him down on his face. Hands gently leaned him forward as they worked first on his elbows and then his wrists. There will be some discomfort in your arms, the man said. They will feel stiff, and your hands are swollen from being tied. Do not worry about that. The discomfort will not last for long. After his hands were freed, Graham tried to flex his fingers, but they wouldn't work. It was as if they were frozen open. That is the swelling, the man said. The compresses were lifted from Graham's eyes, and his first instinct was to look at the swelling. His fingers were the size of sausage links, and they were purple. His heart skipped. Gangrene. Do not look so frightened, the man said through a heavy accent. Graham realized now that he was the same guy who had chased him down in the woods, the same man who had killed the Markhams. You might have guessed that I have done these things many, many times. The swelling is really perfectly normal. The smile on his face matched the smile in his voice. Relax, kid. I'm a professional torturer. You have nothing to worry about. I'll only hurt you as much as I need to, and not a bit more. Graham squinted against the yellow light of the room. The table he sat on was made of metal, and it seemed to be in far better, cleaner shape than anything else in here. The room itself was maybe twelve by twelve feet, and except for the other men in the room— all of whom wore beards and burned hatred in their eyes. The table was the only furniture. Dozens of sharp, menacing hooks hung from the ceiling. They looked like fish hooks for a whale, only without the barbs. It took him a while, but Graham recognized them as meat hooks. He shot a look toward the man who'd taken him. This is a meatpacking plant, the man explained, or it was at one time. Now it is merely a playground for people who do my kind of work. He cast a glance over his shoulder at the array of hooks. Frightening things, aren't they? I imagine that they would hurt wherever I put one of those, but I can think of a few places where they would hurt particularly bad. The man shifted his eyes to Graham. I bet you can think of some of those places, too, yes? Graham felt a chill, and he started to tremble. Who, who, who are you? I am nobody, the man said. I am just a soldier in an army you've never heard of. He seemed amused by his words, broadening his smile. But I understand that names are important. Call me Teddy, then, as in a big, cuddly teddy bear. Do you like the name Teddy? Graham had no idea how to answer the question. He worked his mouth, but the resultant squeaking sound embarrassed him. I understand that you are frightened, Teddy said. And for good reason. Here you are, away from home, away from your parents, and away from your nanny. You're in this frightening place with so many sharp hooks. They used to hang cow carcasses from those back when the factory was still in business. Moving with the speed of a striking snake, Teddy grabbed the nape of Graham's neck and enclosed it in a vice-like grip, squeezing hard enough to make the fibers of the muscles in Graham's neck feel as if they were being pried apart. With the other hand, Teddy poked his forefinger under the boy's jaw and the soft spot just behind the point of the chin. This is my favorite spot to put the hook on people who do not cooperate with me. He pressed hard with the finger, 
the point goes into the flesh and out again under the tongue. People can hang that way for longer than you probably think. Graham found himself crying. He feared he might throw up. Teddy let go, and Graham coughed. The torturer smiled again. I know that the table is not very soft, but try to make yourself comfortable. Sit back. Relax. Graham didn't move. He didn't know if the man's words were a trap or if he really wanted him to do something. In the end, it seemed it didn't matter. You know, Graham Mitchell, we are very nearly friends. Did you know that? Graham shook his head. Sooner or later, you will need to speak words, Teddy said. Now is as good a time to start as any. Graham cleared his throat. <clears throat> no, he said. I didn't know that we were friends. I don't remember ever meeting you before. I overstate by saying friends, he clarified. You spoke with a colleague of mine this morning. You called him with a message, and then you hung up without giving him the information that you were supposed to give. Do you know what I'm talking about? Graham nodded. Yes, but like I told him, I forgot what the number was. Teddy landed him with an open-handed slap that felt more like a closed-fist punch. Graham saw stars and smelled blood. He damn near fell off the table. Now, you see, young men, I believe that was a lie you just told. Lying is a sin, and I cannot abide liars. You disappoint me. Teddy glared at Graham for what felt like thirty seconds, and then he changed. Tension seemed to leave his shoulders. He looked to the four other men in the room. Come, he said. We should give young Mr. Mitchell time to think about these options. As one, the men all moved toward the heavy metal door that led out into what appeared to be a concrete hallway. Teddy was last to leave. As he got to the door, he paused and looked back at Graham, who hadn't moved from his spot on the table. Try to stay warm, he said. This is, after all, a freezer. Teddy stepped out into the hallway and closed the door behind him. A heavy lock slid shut on the other side of the door. Graham was trapped. Somewhere behind the walls, maybe from up in the ceiling, a motor started. Within seconds, he felt a breeze of frigid air pouring out of the three huge vents that hung too high to reach. To avoid the direct blast of air... Graham lowered himself from the metal table onto the tiled floor. He pulled his legs up Indian style, and he pulled both arms out of the stretched-out sleeves of his T-shirt and hugged himself. He'd stay as warm as he could for as long as he could. This is, after all, a freezer. Chapter 21 it took the better part of an hour for boxers to pilot the expedition to the coordinates Fenice had dictated over the radio, only to find that the coordinates were approximate at best. They took them to the right neighborhood, but from there the search went manual and old-fashioned. I don't often think we are undergunned, boxers grumbled as he approached the turn from Grashed Avenue onto Maple Ridge Street. But tonight I'm worried. To say this was a bad neighborhood was to give bad neighborhoods a bad name. This was the worst part of Detroit's urban blight. North of Gross Point Park, they were square in the middle of zip code 48205, the deadliest real estate in one of the deadliest cities in the Western Hemisphere. Jonathan took in the scenery. Despite the darkness of the night, which got very little help from the streetlights that were mostly burned out, the expedition's headlights washed over the facades of buildings on Gratiot Avenue that clearly had once been thriving businesses. This was a well-built downtown area, lots of brick and stout construction, but as many of the buildings were boarded up or burned out as they were still alive. Those that still seemed to be in business sported bars and barricades that were every bit as intimidating and secure as anything he saw in the war zones where he'd served. Not exactly Mayberry, is it? Jonathan asked. Only in a world where Barney Fife is played by John Malkovich, Boxer said. Jonathan laughed. The image tickled him. And Christopher Walken as Andy, he said. That elicited a big, genuine laugh from Boxers. 
<laughs> That's a whole different show, isn't it? Now that they'd turned the corner onto Maple Ridge Street, the boarded-up businesses had become boarded-up houses. Again, it was sad. You could see the middle-class roots in the homes. Most of them were one story to one and a half. Jonathan imagined that they had been built post-World War II, and at one time they were occupied by families whose futures were bright. They couldn't have foreseen the strife and the riots and the neglect that came to define what was once one of the greatest cities in America. And now was simply a mess. Jonathan keyed his mic. The license plate we're looking for is... He recited the number from his notes. That's it, Mother Hen confirmed. It will be on a black sedan, a Lincoln. The make and model are not clear from the video, but from what I can see, the size and the shape of the car are consistent with a Lincoln. Not the big one, but an intermediate one. How many could there be? Certainly a new vehicle, anything younger than ten years old, would stand out like a beacon against the primer-coated wrecks that lined the streets. Most of the houses were surrounded by chain-link fences whose height spoke more to keeping dogs in than keeping intruders out, though the two goals often intersected. Jonathan had donned his NVGs, night vision goggles, in an effort to make out the terrain and the license numbers. But even in the intensified green light that mimicked a weird lunar form of daylight, the cars along the street all looked similar, and precious few of them had license plates. As they cruised the neighborhood, the spacing between the houses opened up. Before long, they were in the middle of an abandoned industrial area. Dormant, diseased factories rose up against the urban backdrop. Black stains against a black night. Jonathan noted one smokestack in particular that rose from the middle of a long, wide, flat-topped building, as if to flip off the community for the terrible fate that had befallen its inhabitants. "'Kill your lights,' Jonathan said." Go to NVGs. He was worried that the slow-moving headlights would attract the attention of whatever street gangs controlled this part of the city. And he bore no doubt that the neighborhood was controlled by a gang. In cities like this, where only one out of five ambulances was operational and the average response times for police approached two hours, God knew they couldn't come with less than a platoon of cops and an arsenal of weapons. Citizens depended on gangs to keep them safe. Hell, they had to depend on somebody. Jonathan imagined that boxers appreciated the opportunity to drive with NVGs instead of headlights. They'd replaced the two-tube NVG arrays that they'd gotten used to in the service with the more current, higher-tech four-tube arrays, which solved the age-old problem of tunnel vision. Now, when they viewed the world through their NVGs, they had a nearly panoramic view. Jonathan's only problem with them was that they looked funny. Every upside came with a downside, he told himself. What do you think about this factory? Boxers asked. By the nature of the question, I think you have a concern you're not sharing with me, Jonathan replied. Well, we've got these big fences, Big Guy said. They present a perimeter of what, a hundred, two hundred yards? Something like that? Boxers shrugged. I'm just saying you can hide a lot of rolling stock back there and we'd never see it. It was a very good point, Jonathan thought. They were big buildings that sat far from the road. How difficult would it be to drive into the middle of the compound and then just park your vehicle? Hell, it could be the size of an 18-wheeler, behind a wall and out of sight. I'm switching to thermal, Jonathan said. When you paid as much for a set of night vision devices as he paid for these, you got options that the hunting public never experienced. By flipping a switch on his NVGs, the device switched from image enhancement, essentially reflecting infrared beams that were shot out to the target object, to true infrared reading, which captured the heat signatures that were emitted by target objects. His vision flashed. After a day as bright as this one, every surface emitted heat. So he needed to dial down the gain. Once the images were stabilized, he would be able to read the relative heat signatures of the various buildings and vehicles. A car that had recently been driven, for example, would paint as hotter than one that had not been driven in a while, even though both may have been in the hot sun all day. It worked the same way with buildings. Those that were occupied would show up as warmer than those that were not. Boxers drove slowly as Jonathan scanned the horizon. Nothing jumped out as significant. Jonathan pressed his transmit button. 
Mother Hen, can you give us anything more specific on the location? Of course, she said, but there was an edge to her tone. I could give you the actual address and close-up pictures if I wanted to, but as usual, I've decided to let you wander aimlessly. Oh, Boxer said, the lioness is cranky. I'll take that to mean a negative, Jonathan said. He made no effort to keep the irritation out of his voice. I'll take whatever you can give me, up to and including a reliable gut hunch. So what's your gut hunch, boss? Boxers asked. I figure you've always got one. I'm thinking that if we find Jolene Cage, we're also going to find Graham Mitchell. Boxers made a groaning sound. Congratulations, then, because you're a hell of a lot more optimistic than me. Everybody's more optimistic than you. Har, har. I'm just saying that I don't think there's a chance in hell that either of them are still alive. The kid has to be alive, Jonathan said. He's got the information they want. Unless the Ruskies got to him first. He's got the information they want to keep quiet. And as for the Chechens, the second the kid opens his mouth and gives them what they want, he's toast. Jonathan waved him off. No, now that's not true either. Not right away, anyway. They'll want to buy some time to make sure that what he gave them is actually the code. Boxers laughed. Oh, good, even better. So terrorists will wait to confirm that they have nuclear capability and then kill our PC. Yeah, good. Now I feel better. So tell me this. Why keep the girl alive? Jonathan sighed. That's a tougher one, he said. I'll only give even money on her. Maybe not even that much. But whatever it is, they drove her all the way out here for a reason. Maybe it's just to get rid of the body, but it's a reason. There's also a reason why Graham wasn't killed with those others. That tells me that his snatchers are of the Chechen variety, not the Russian variety. Well, there you go, Boxer said. Case solved. They cruised for another two hundred feet. The first factory, first of several in a row, showed no signs of life. As they approached the next, Boxers pointed at a spot beyond the windshield. Hey, boss, he said. Trouble at twelve o'clock level. Jonathan pivoted his head to the right to see a clutch of young men approaching them in the dark. They were all black, and they all walked with attitude. He cursed himself for being so involved with his survey of the area that he missed the obvious. I see weapons, Jonathan said. The young toughs were not even making an effort to conceal their firepower. Among the six of them, Jonathan recognized two Mac-10s and at least four pistols. Next to him, Boxers drew his M9 and cocked the hammer. I'm ready, he said. I'll take the three on the left. Not yet, Jonathan said. Only if they fire first. Shit, Boxers spat. You know, if they fire first, they might just hit something, right? This isn't the fight we want, Jonathan said. I am not dying at the hands of some untrained gangbanger. I've lived through too much shit to die that way. Over the years, Jonathan had listened to boxers describe countless venues in which he intended not to die. On balance, that was a good thing. You know, if you took up less space, you'd be a smaller target, he said. Then you've got no chance of ever being hit, little man. No wonder you feel cocky. Jonathan flipped him off. I'm going to meet them halfway, he said. You stay put. If they shoot me, take out the Mac-10s first. Machine guns first, Foxers parroted. Really? Wow, I never would have thought of that. I normally aim for the guy with a slingshot first, but if... Jonathan tuned him out and opened his door. He drew his colt, but he kept it dangling by his thigh. If any of them so much as twitched... He could drop three of them before his first ejected shell casing hit the ground. But that would still leave three, and those odds sucked. Good evening, gentlemen, Jonathan said. He modulated his voice to be just loud enough to be heard, but not so loud as to draw attention from anyone who might live in the neighborhood. He rocked his NVGs up out of the way, but kept them on his head in hopes of looking different enough to give the young men pause before doing something stupid. The young people Jonathan had dealt with in any detail were all athletic, they all had short haircuts, and they all wore the same clothes. He knew that he was ill-prepared to deal with a bunch of teenage gangsters whose pants hung halfway down their asses. "'Who the hell are you?' one of the young men asked. He walked in the lead, so Jonathan assumed him to be the leader. 
I'm just a guy who wants no trouble from you, Jonathan said. Then you shouldn't be driving in my hood with our lights on. All things considered, it was a good point. One of the kids behind the leader and off to the left made a move to lift his pistol to his shooting position. Jonathan reached out with his free hand in a stopping gesture. Please keep your firearm pointed at the ground, he said. The urgency in his voice drove his volume to a higher level than he wanted. His comment prompted the leader to turn back to his crew. Georgie, he said, be cool. Georgie went cool, but he took his own time doing it, finally shifting the muzzle of his pistol to a neutral position pointing to the ground. Thank you, Jonathan said. He shifted his own weapon around his back to his left hand, extended his right hand toward the leader and approached, cautiously. My name's Scorpion, he said. What's yours? Screw you, the leader said. Nice to meet you, screw you, Jonathan said without dropping a beat. Is that Chinese? Jonathan waited for the line to land. When they laughed, his hand remained extended. Don't leave me hanging here, Jonathan said. I mean no disrespect. The leader modified the handshake to a knuckle knock, and Jonathan complied. The hell kind of name a scorpion? Jonathan smiled. It's kind of a street name. You're trying to be all scary and shit, right? The kid laughed. And what's that shit on your head? I'm still waiting on a name, Jonathan said, and I'm still waiting for you to get the hell out of my hood. This was a tough point in their negotiation. The kid needed to save face in front of his pals, and at one level, Jonathan did owe him an explanation. He was, after all, in the kid's hood, just as they said. Jonathan made a point of holstering his colt, but he kept the safety off just in case. That's not going to happen, he said. My friend and I have business to conduct here. Without looking back, he called, Hey, big guy! The driver's door to the expedition opened, and boxers unfolded himself. Right here, boss. Maybe just for show, but probably for effect, he brandished an HK-417 rifle, muzzle pointed to the sky. Chambered in 7.62 millimeter, the rifle looked every bit as badass as it was. If it came to a firefight, these guys would be dead before their fingers touched their triggers. Holy shit, the leader said. Several of his friends took an instinctive step backward. He's one tall drink of water. Jonathan laughed. He hadn't heard that phrase in years. Yes, he is, he said. So what are you, cops or something? To bluff or not to bluff? Well, we're something, Jonathan said. But we're definitely not cops. You look like cops, the kid said. They look like the army, another kid said. What's with the commando clothes? Jonathan and boxers both wore black on black on black. I'm still waiting on a name, Jonathan said. There's no need for us to be adversaries. There's no need for us to be adversaries, the leader repeated in a pretty spot-on impersonation of Jonathan's voice. Shit, man, you're like a robot. So which is it, army or cops? We have no desire to get into your business, so long as you stay out of ours. Georgie said, Far as I'm concerned, you got no business here for us to stay out of. This is our turf, not yours. Jonathan was tiring of the banter. They had work to do, and these guys were a problem. They jeopardized the overall security of the mission, whatever the hell that turned out to be, and they posed an overt threat through their firearms and their attitudes. Under different circumstances, say they were on foreign ground, the smart move would be to eliminate the lot of them, just to keep them from posing a threat to Jonathan's six o'clock once they started moving. But this wasn't foreign ground, and different rules applied. From the kid's point of view, Jonathan was the invader, and they were defending LeBron, the leader said. My name's LeBron. He pointed to the factory beyond the fence. What are those dudes doing in there? Are they like terrorists or something? Jonathan's heart skipped. LeBron knew something, and the something he knew could be of great value. They could be, yes, he said. Don't bullshit with us, another kid in the crowd said. Either they are or they ain't. It's not that simple, Jonathan said. If they're the people we think they are, then yes. I knew it, Georgie said. Raghead douchebags, I told you. 
Not that kind of terrorist, Jonathan said. He looked back to boxers, who just seemed bored, or ready to shoot someone. Sometimes it was hard to tell the difference in the dark. Can you tell us what you know? Jonathan asked. What kind of gad is that? LeBron asked, nodding to the rifle in Boxer's hands. Boxer's raised his rifle a little higher to get it in a better position in case it was needed, yet without pointing it directly at anyone. Jonathan took a half-step to the right to make sure he had a clear firing lane in case LeBron was planning to do something stupid. That's a Heckler and Coke Model 417 assault rifle, he said. Like an M16? LeBron asked. Kind of looks like an M16. Think M16 on steroids, Jonathan said. He didn't bother to clarify the difference in calibers and the dozens of other factors that made the 417 and its little brother, the 416, christened the M27 by the U.S. Marine Corps, head and shoulders better weapons than the old M16. Machine gun? LeBron asked. Fully automatic? It can be, Jonathan said. I got to tell you I'm not comfortable with the direction this chat is taking. I'm just trying to figure out why a non-army, non-cop has fancy guns and a big truck and they're watching a place I've been worried about for a long time. Sounds like we might be on the same side, Jonathan said. If they are who I think they are, we can help you get rid of them. What did they do? Jonathan shook his head. Nope, you first. Tell me what you know. LeBron shifted his posture as he considered his options. Even in the dark, Jonathan could see his eyes sharpen. Everything about the kid's demeanor screamed intelligence. Everything, that is, except the wardrobe. Not out here, LeBron said. I got a crib around the corner. We'll talk there. Just you, though. Gigantor will scare my babies. We're a team, Jonathan said. We stay together. LeBron considered some more. Why don't we just shoot you all down and be done with it? It's what, six against one? Not nearly good enough odds, Boxer said. His words rumbled the sidewalk. His delivery dared someone to question the veracity. Where he goes, I go. More thought. All right, then, LeBron said. Follow me. Just give me an address, Jonathan said. I'll drive to it and meet you there. I'm serious, man. LeBron said. It's just around the corner, not two hundred feet from here. Let's get going, then, Jonathan said. We've spent too much time parked at the curb as it is. Chapter 22 Graham had never been so cold. It was winter cold inside this little room with its metal table and its forest of hooks hanging from the ceiling. He was wearing so little that the cold seemed to wrap around him like some kind of cooling blanket. He couldn't stop trembling, but he suspected that a lot of the trembling was due to fear instead of cold. He'd rather it be from cold. Show no weakness, Deputy Price had said. Jolaine's words resonated even louder. All he needed was time and opportunity. With those things, he stood a chance of getting out of here. With just those things— but he'd need strength, too. And with all the shivering, he could feel energy draining out of him. He couldn't remember the last time he'd eaten, and that thought triggered a rush of hunger that consumed his gut, cramping his stomach and making him feel nauseous. Jolaine! Another wall of emotion broke over him. Jolaine was all that he had left. She was the last one who gave a shit about him at all. Now it was just Graham and these terrible people. 3155AX4755598CVRLLPAHQ449833D0Z. The thought came from nowhere. Still intact, still ready to go, the code that was more important than so many lives. Was that even possible? What could it mean? Well, that was easy, wasn't it? It meant the difference between life and death for Graham, and maybe for Jolaine as well. As long as he kept it to himself, they would have to keep him alive. Another terrifying thought bloomed. Maybe that was the plan. This shit with the freezer and the cold air was a form of torture, right? Sure it was. He'd seen it on TV. It was the kind of thing that happened to the Iraqi prisoners in that prison he'd read about in the history books. The books called it torture. Well, what was the point of torture? In this case, it was to get him to talk. 
They'd made that very clear. They'd make him suffer until he gave them what they wanted. And then what? Well, Jolaine said that if he gave up the information, they'd kill him. So his choice was to suffer or to die. That wasn't a choice at all. That was, the lock on the other side of the door moved. It made a loud sliding sound, followed by a solid thunk when it reached the end of its travel. He waited for what was coming next. Under the table as he was, occupying the same spot for all this time, a spot that had therefore become at least a little warmer, he hoped that he wouldn't be seen. Should he be ready to lunge at whoever opened the door? Was this the opportunity that Jolaine had told him to be ready for? How could he know? The door opened quickly. That was a surprise, because in his mind the opening would have been a long, drawn-out event, complete with creaking noises and a demonic laugh. He couldn't see the door, because it was blocked by the vertical rectangle that served as one of the legs for the stainless steel table, and for long seconds nothing happened. No one entered, as far as he could tell, and he didn't move. "'Come on out, Graham,' said a heavily accented voice. It wasn't Teddy, but it might have been his brother. The same accent, but a lot thicker. "'I know you are here because there is nowhere else for you to be,' Graham didn't move. As if by remaining still, he could become invisible. "'So, you want to play seek and hide?' the man said from the door. "'Sure, fine. We can do that.' The hiding strategy suddenly seemed like a bad idea. What was the sense of pissing them off? It would be different if he'd set a trap, or if he had some kind of ambush plan. As it was, all hiding could do was make all of this more difficult, more uncomfortable for him. "'I'm here,' Graham said. It came out a little too loud, but that probably didn't matter. He scooched his butt along the floor to the point where he was clear of the table, and then he stood." He didn't realize he'd raised his hands until he saw that he'd done it, and the realization embarrassed him. When he was standing at his full height, he lowered his hands to his sides. The man had only advanced a few feet into the doorway, but he stood funny, as if one side of his body were heavier than the other. "'What's wrong?' Graham asked, reading the expression on the man's face as one of anger. "'I'm right here.' "'I knew where you were,' the man said." He showed an odd smile, an unnerving smile. Then he shifted his weight to point something at Graham. At first, it registered to Graham as a gun. He started to dive for cover, but before he could hit the floor, a spray of high-pressure water was on the way. The sheer volume of the flow told Graham that it was from a fire hose. When the solid pillar of water hit him in his chest, it threw him backward and down onto the floor. The stream pummeled him with bruising force, knocking the air from his lungs. When the man redirected the stream to his face, Graham brought his hands up to protect his eyes. Even with his face covered, the water got into his nose and mouth and choked him. The act of coughing brought in more water, and he thought he was drowning. The pillar of water shifted in an instant, and then it started tearing up his belly and his legs. Again he tried to cover up, but then the stream returned to his face. As soon as he covered it, the stream went back to his balls. This asshole in the doorway was having a great time. Graham rolled on the floor to turn his back to his attacker. The force of the stream pushed him across the floor until he was pressed up against the far wall. Still the hydraulic beating continued, raking the length of his body from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. This went on for at least two minutes— There'd be brief respites of five, ten, maybe fifteen seconds when the water wasn't being driven directly into his body, but the flow continued. And then it stopped. A smash cut from full on to full off. The attacker didn't say a word before he left. Graham heard the door close and the lock slide back into place. Then all he heard were the sounds of water dripping and draining and puddling. It was a sound that was worse than silence. When he was sure he was alone again, he rolled away from the wall and onto his back, and from there to a sitting position. Water ran from everywhere. Where it wasn't running off a surface, it dripped in a rapid, staccato rhythm that might as well have been a stream. He sat in a puddle that was at least an inch deep, maybe deeper. He could not have been more soaked, not if he had jumped into the deep end of a swimming pool. Every surface of the room was soaked, in fact— 
not a dry, square inch to be found anywhere. As he rose to his feet, he noted that the water was deep enough to cover his toes. When he walked, his feet created tiny bow waves that rippled across the width of the room. When the coolers kicked on again, he understood what they were doing. They were going to freeze him to death. Anton Datsik sat at his desk in the study of his modest home in Arlington, Virginia, playing solitaire on his computer as he waited for the phone call that had to come soon if it were to be of any use. When it arrived, he answered on the first ring. "'Tell me you have news I want to hear,' he said. "'I do,' the woman said. "'We know where the boy is. He's in the custody of the Chechens as we speak. There's an old meat-packing plant in Detroit.' She gave him the address. "'How do you know this?' Dutzig asked. I just know, she said. Who else knows? I can't answer that. Does your boss know? Absolutely not, she said. Or if she does, I don't know how. My sources and hers are entirely different, and mine are much more reliable. Dutzig typed the address into his computer to check out the location. It was both urban and accessible. He checked the clock. How long has he been there? I don't know. Maybe one hour. Not much more, I don't believe. Are you there on the scene? I am not. They cannot be allowed to leave, Dutzik said. I believe that is what the agency hired you for. There was defiance in her voice this time that hadn't been there before. He didn't like it. I have done my part, she said. I have delivered him to you. Now be sure to tell... Dutzik clicked off. He knew what she was going to ask and didn't need for that to be out in space for the NSA to listen to. Besides, he had more pressing matters to attend to. Using a different phone, an encrypted satellite phone that was dedicated to a single purpose, he dialed a number and waited. Philip Baxter answered on the second ring. Yes, he said. The clock is ticking, Datsik said. I need a plane, eight parachutes, and a pilot who has no memory. Baxter paused. In the background, Datsik could hear the sound of a television. It sounded like a romance. Do you know what time it is? How am I? I can end this tonight, Datsik said, but I have to work quickly. Telling you the truth, it might already be too late. In two or three more hours, this will either be over, or the world will have nuclear-capable terrorists. All of that, my friend, is on your shoulders. He deliberately used the most provocative words he could conjure. Your team is ready? It is. Another pause. I'll get back to you in ten minutes, Baxter said. LeBron hadn't exaggerated. His crib was indeed just a few hundred feet away, the first house on the corner. It took LeBron and his crew less time to walk the distance than it took boxers to drive. Big Guy parked the expedition in the alley behind the house and locked the doors. Somebody steals this car, they're going to get quite a stash, boxers said. It was a hell of a point, but they didn't have a lot of choice. Jonathan was betting on the fact that within the neighborhood, stealing from LeBron was understood to be a bad decision. Maybe I should stay out here and guard it, Boxers offered. I'd rather you be inside, Jonathan said. It's only the two of us this time around, and we're on a really tight clock. I want your opinions. Boxers laughed. Are you really going to plan an 0300 op off the word of a bunch of gangbangers? Jonathan scowled. It's local intel. We do it all the time. These guys know more about their neighborhood than we do. We don't even know if the guys they don't like inside that factory are the same guys we don't like. That's what we're here to find out. This wasn't like Big Guy. Why is there a bug up your ass on this? Boxer started to speak, then changed his mind. Talk to me, Box. You know we're going to get screwed in this thing, right? Boxer said. We've got government agencies fighting each other for a piece of this pie, and we're the ones in the middle who don't officially give a shit about the outcome so long as we extract the PC from the bad guys. Jonathan shrugged. That's what we do, he said. We're mission-oriented, not politically oriented. Big words, Boxer said. Where are you going to be when we're in the middle of a crossfire between FBI and CIA? Jonathan recognized that his answer would seem obtuse, but he didn't mean it that way. We're going to save the PC, he said. Really, it was the most obvious thing in the world. The alternative is to let the PC die. That won't happen. Not on my watch. And what do we do about the bodies that bear government credentials? We say that they shouldn't have tried to kill a child. 
even in the most cynical corners of the most corrupt governments on the planet, of which, unfortunately, the United States was numbered, thanks to the Darmond administration. It was understood that children were not to be harmed in political operations. Boxers held Jonathan's gaze, then defaulted to his dismissive chuckle. Yeah, okay, fine. I say we wear body armor. Now there was a point where Jonathan could not argue. Before moving ahead, each of them donned their ballistic vests, which were preloaded with 300 rounds of ammunition for their preferred long guns, the M27 for Jonathan and the HK-417 for boxers. As long as we've got the ammo, Boxer said. Yeah, we'll take the weapons, too. Jonathan didn't believe in his heart that they were walking into an ambush at LeBron's house, but there was no way to know for sure. Bottom line, no one in the history of mankind had ever offered up a curse to all things holy for being too well armed or having too much ammunition. Let's get up all the way, Jonathan said. A full-on, high-end show of firepower couldn't possibly work against them. Plus, the more they carried on their persons, the less they risked losing in the event that the expedition was stolen. When they were done, Jonathan's M27 dangled like an exclamation point down the center of his body. His left thigh bore a 4.6 millimeter HK MP7, and the ubiquitous 45 Colt 1911 rode on his right thigh. He saw that Boxers was similarly outfitted, but with a 417 where Jonathan's M27 hung, and a Beretta M9 instead of his Colt. What the hell, Jonathan said. Let's take the rucks, too. With the rucksacks on their backs, Jonathan's weighed in at around 70 pounds, boxers at just north of 100. They had nearly everything they needed to invade any place that needed invading. Certainly, they had LeBron's living room covered. That covers the theft issue, boxers said with a smile. Sure am glad I brought it up. With his tiny wireless transceiver inserted in his right ear, Jonathan connected his portable radio to the transmit button in the center of his chest, and he pressed it. Mother Hen, Scorpion. Loud and clear, Veniche's voice responded. I have a research project for you, Jonathan said. He read off the address of the factory. I need you to find out everything you can about the inside of that building. Anything and everything. Okay, she said. For reasons known only to her... Veniche avoided military speak such as Roger for OK, or even the civilian version, 10-4. How long do I have? An hour ago, Jonathan said. Are you preparing to go hot? Sooner than later, Jonathan said. We're still determining if that's the right place. But we think it is. If so, we go hot right after. Okie doke, Veniche said. I'll let you know when I have something worth sharing. Jonathan looked to boxers, who'd been listening to the same radio traffic. Anything else to add, big guy? I'm just anxious to get moving. As Jonathan led the way toward the door, it opened to reveal LeBron standing expectantly in the opening. Jesus, LeBron said, eyeing the weaponry. You know they're not here, right? Jonathan waited till he had climbed the steps to say, If the gear is with me, I know it won't be anywhere else. LeBron recoiled from the words. What? You think my boys are going to steal from you? A couple of minutes ago, your boys were going to shoot me, Boxer said. Where I come from, stealing isn't as bad as shooting. Well, you're in Detroit now, LeBron said. Stealing and shooting are different things, but one almost always leads to the other. Your shit would have been safe back there. We mean no offense, Jonathan said. May we come in? LeBron stepped aside. Just don't make a lot of noise. The babies are asleep. One day, Jonathan was going to learn to tame his prejudices and preconceptions about people. This neighborhood was a shithole, and he'd expected the same of LeBron's house. In fact, the place was spotless. The furnishings weren't much. He imagined that many of them came from charity thrift stores, but everything was thoroughly dusted and neatly arranged. They entered through the kitchen, which had all of the necessary comforts, though twenty years out of date. The Formica countertops matched the Formica of the metal-legged table. The appliances were old-school almond, and the floors were flowered linoleum. But overall, the place had a well-loved look. The house exuded pride. LeBron led the way through a doorway that was slightly smaller than boxers into the living room, where a sofa and three chairs were all arranged for easy viewing of a 90s vintage 26-inch television set that was turned off. Dozens of books if not hundreds of them, 
lined the short wall from floor to ceiling on the far end. LeBron's posse had dwindled to one, Georgie, whom he introduced as his little brother. This is my wife, Dawn, LeBron said, nodding to an attractive woman dressed in sweats. She smiled back at Jonathan, though her eyes showed confusion. She looked as though she might have been sleeping. Good evening, Jonathan said. I'm sorry to intrude. What is this about, Lebby? Dawn asked. She kept her tone light, but Jonathan was sure he heard an undertone of anger. This is Scorpion, LeBron said, and his friend, big guy, there. Why are all those guns in my house? Don said. Jonathan moved to explain. Ma'am, I promise you that we're not here to do any harm. And they're not police either, LeBron added. They hear about the men across the street in the Excalibur Foods plant. Those men are trouble, Don said. I don't want to know nothing more about them. Where's the rest of your team? Jonathan asked. There was no issue more critical than the location of unaccounted for firepower. I sent them on their way, LeBron said. Don doesn't like guns. Including yours, Don said. I apologize, Jonathan said. But as LeBron told you, those guys in the factory are big trouble. What did they do? Don asked. They kidnapped a young boy, Jonathan said. Off to his side, he more sensed than saw boxers stiffening. Big Guy hated it when Jonathan shared anything with anyone. Oh, my God, Dawn said, bringing her hand to her mouth. Why would they do such a thing? Jonathan eyed the chairs that were as yet unoccupied. May we sit down? Dawn seemed hesitant. We'll take these off, Jonathan said, shrugging out of his ruck and laying it on the floor. Boxers followed suit, but both kept their body armor on, and their weapons either holstered or slung. When he sat, Jonathan took care not to snag the fabric with any of the festooned weapons. When boxers sat, he looked like an adult sitting at a little girl's tea set, only slightly less comfortable. Excuse the gear, Jonathan said. We're sort of obsessive about being prepared. So who are you really? LeBron asked. You never gave me a straight answer. I'm in the business of not giving straight answers, Jonathan said. He tried to sell it with a smile. I'm sorry, but that's just the case. So you're with the government, Georgie said. A lie would have been so easy here. Given that his client was the FBI, it wouldn't be that big a stretch just to say yes. But he sensed that that would not necessarily be the right answer in this crowd. How about I tell you this, he said, hoping to find a compromise. We used to work for the government. In fact, we worked for him for a long time. Are you assassins? Don asked. Jonathan was tempted to ask her if that would be a problem. No, ma'am. Well, I can't tell you exactly who or what we are. I can tell you with absolute certainty that we're the good guys. We're on the side of the angels. Then how come you don't have cops with you? Georgie asked. Boxers took that one. Because they're not always on the same side as us. The conversation was meandering, and Jonathan wanted to bring it back on track. Tell me about your concerns with the Excalibur plant across the street. LeBron and Don exchanged glances, and Don nodded. That plant's been empty for almost three years, LeBron said. Tore this place up when they left. Took two hundred jobs away because the politicians were too busy putting money in their own damn pockets to pay any attention to the little guy. I used to work there. So did Don. Terrible, terrible thing when it closed. Jonathan heard boxers stir and prayed that he would keep his mouth shut. So far, nothing LeBron had said was relevant to anything they wanted to know, but it was a mistake to push people who had just started talking. So it just sat there, you know what I'm saying? Just sat there like it was mocking us. They put up that big fence with the warning signs, and then it just sat there. Until about two months ago, Don said, we started to see all kinds of traffic coming in and out, but none of it looked official. Bunch of damn Arabs, I think, Georgie said. Lots of Muslim hats and shit. We called the anonymous FBI hotline, but they didn't do nothing, LeBron said. Asshole on the phone tried to make me the crazy one, even call me paranoid. What do you think they're doing in there? Jonathan asked. I don't have any idea, but I know it ain't right. I never thought about kidnapping, but why not? They could be making crystal meth for all I know. And that would be a problem? Boxer said, 
with too much of a smile in his voice. Yeah, Hagrid, that would be a problem, LeBron said. Boxers swelled in his seat. He did not like being teased about his size. LeBron wasn't done. Just because I'm black and just because I live in a damn slum don't mean that I'm stoned out on drugs. I grew up here, asshole. This is my home. You think I want some outsider coming in here and stealing the mines out of all the neighborhood babies? Look, Jonathan said. I'm sure big guy didn't. You shut up, LeBron snapped. Don't make excuses for him. You want to make excuses? Let him make his own damn excuses. I'm sorry, Boxer said. Jonathan almost fell to the floor. He wasn't sure he'd ever heard Big Guy say those words before. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. LeBron seemed surprised, too, sort of deflated. Boxers pointed a forefinger at Jonathan. And like he said, you shut up. So the bottom line, Jonathan said, is that those folks have been squatting where they don't belong. Tell him about the guns, Georgie said. Jonathan arched his eyebrows. Guns were always a relevant topic. Those guys don't bother nobody, LeBron said. I got to be honest with you about that. I mean, they don't get in my grill, and I leave them alone, too. Jonathan waited for the rest. But I watched them, LeBron went on. I mean, there's a lot of bad shit going down in this neighborhood, so I watch a lot. Like you were watching us, Jonathan said. Right, exactly that. Except you use binoculars for them, Don prompted. LeBron seemed embarrassed. Well, yeah, except I use binoculars to watch them. And you've seen guns, Jonathan asked. Lots of guns, rifles, missile launchers, all kinds of crap like that. Boxers leaned forward in his seat. What did the FBI say when you told them about those? To hell with the FBI. They don't want to talk with me. They don't want to talk with me. I ain't calling back to beg. Jonathan understood the feeling, and at one level, he admired it. It never ceased to amaze him how shocked bureaucrats became when the public at large spontaneously developed ways to work around their bullshit. What do they do with the guns? Boxers asked. LeBron looked to Georgie and got a shrug. Nothing, really. I mean, they don't come to the road or anything, but when they're down there at their space, they've always got guns. You said they had missile launchers, Jonathan said. What makes you think they're missile launchers? Because I watched the military channel, LeBron said. He seemed insulted at such an elementary question. Jonathan looked to boxers. What do you think? Big guy shrugged. He watches the military channel. Not a lot else looks like a missile launcher. Jonathan didn't bother to ask for a hypothesis of why they would want that kind of weapon. While not all portable weapon systems were created equal, they all shared the common purpose of blowing shit up. They were equally useful as offensive or defensive weapons, provided the operators had adequate training. And what else did they have to do while sitting around an abandoned meatpacking plant but train? This was all bad news, though none of it particularly surprising. In a perfect world, O-300 missions were executed against sleeping, unarmed hostage-takers— Alas, it so rarely turned out that way. How many of them do you think there are? Jonathan asked. What do you think, Georgie? Fifteen? Twenty? I'd say at least twenty, Georgie said. It's hard to tell because they come and go all the time. Sometimes new faces, sometimes old ones. Always dudes, by the way. I haven't seen a single woman go in there. But the ragheads are like that, right? LeBron asked. They don't let women do nothing. Jonathan determined in two seconds that nothing could come from a discussion launched by that statement. He figured it was the way of the world, that everybody needed to call names at someone else. So let's call it twenty-five people, Jonathan said. We faced worse odds, Boxer said. His face showed not the slightest trace of concern. Only with better intel, Jonathan said. I think we should launch the Raven. At the mention of the word, Boxer's eyes darted to the others in the room, he hated sharing operational details. It's declassified now, I promise, Jonathan said. It's public domain. Big Guy hesitated just long enough to demonstrate his displeasure. Then he stood and walked back out to the expedition. As boxers exited, Jonathan addressed the others in the room. I'd like to ask you a favor, he said. I'd like to use your lovely home as a kind of command post, just for a little while. I promise we'll be careful with your stuff. No, 
Don said. The babies are upstairs. I swear to you that we will not draw fire to this location. We just need a spot. We'll not draw fire? Don said. Who talks like that? I think they're like the army, LeBron said. You should have seen the shit they got in their truck, Georgie said. It's like a fort or... Don turned on LeBron next. Is that why you're doing this? Is this about your dream to be a soldier? Excuse me, Jonathan said, to diffuse what sounded like it could devolve into a long-standing, oft-repeated argument. Remember what's at stake here tonight. We believe that the men you described have kidnapped a young boy after murdering his parents. There's a young lady involved, too. We don't know if she is dead or alive. Dawn looked horrified. Who would do that? she asked. How do I know that you're telling the truth? You do know that I'm telling the truth, Jonathan said. I can see it in your eyes, and I can't get into details. So you are the government, LeBron said. Jonathan surrendered. Yes, he said. Well, not exactly, but essentially, yes. It's complicated, but I can tell you this. If we don't help that boy, the consequences will be awful, not just for him, but for thousands of people. He paused as the words sank in. That's a really shitty deal, I know, Jonathan continued. Then to Dawn, forgive my language. Some words are hardwired, but I promise I'll try. To the group, I know I'm asking you to take a leap of faith, but I'm telling you exactly the way it is. Sensing a crack in Don's barriers, Jonathan rose, pivoted, and walked three steps to his ruck and pulled out the money satchel. I have something for you here, he said. With his back turned to the others, he counted off two banded stacks of hundred-dollar bills. He turned back to the room. Here's two thousand dollars for your troubles, he said. Again, you have my word that no harm will come to your house or your children. Consider this payment for your inconvenience. Jonathan walked past LeBron and headed for Dawn. Here you go, ma'am, he said. Thank you for your assistance in advance. Dawn's eyes shifted from the money to Jonathan's eyes and back again. Who are you really? she asked. Honestly, Jonathan said. If I could tell you, I would. For now, I'll just have to be Scorpion. He'd been told by countless others that when he smiled, his eyes flashed in heart-melting ways. He wasn't sure what that meant, but he'd learned to use the expression to get his way. Dawn reached out for the cash. I'm trusting you, she said, and I don't trust nobody. Her eyes turned steely. Don't you dare let me down. Jonathan crossed his heart. Thank you, he said. A loud noise drew their attention to the back door in unison. Holy shit, LeBron said. He was the only one in position to see what was going on. Chapter 23 Graham thought he remembered hearing in health class that once hypothermia sets in, the last thing that preceded death was that you stopped shivering. If that was true, then he had a lot of life left in him. He was beyond shivering. The trembling was near convulsive. He lay on his left side on the floor, back under his table, and curled into a fetal ball, his knees drawn up and clutched against his chest. But for his constant spastic movements, his shirt and his pants would have become part of the ice slick that was the floor. He couldn't begin to imagine what the temperature was inside the locker, but he figured it had to be below zero. The cold had turned his skin cherry red. His fingers and toes burned. The nail beds on both looked pure white. I'm sorry, he said softly. I'm so, so sorry. Though he had no idea what he was sorry for. Maybe for living. Maybe for dying. If he could just die, it would all end. The pain would go away. The fear would go away. He could be back together with... The locker door opened with a whoosh that created a warm breeze. Graham was dimly aware that he hadn't heard the lock slide open this time. Did that mean that he'd fallen asleep? Maybe he had, in fact, died. No, he prayed silently. Don't let me be dead. If he was dead, then this was definitely hell. He heard words, but he couldn't comprehend them. He was aware that the words were in a language he couldn't understand, but that didn't fully explain his lack of comprehension. There were no consonants and vowels, 
He perceived no real words at all, not even foreign ones. The voices existed as part of a fog, like sounds heard from underwater. Someone placed hands on him, but he didn't know who. He thought he might have seen a face, but, like the noise, the faces appeared through some kind of mental gauze. He was floating now, and the cold was falling away. Time passed, minutes perhaps, but certainly seconds, maybe hours. He was flying, and he was getting warmer, and he didn't care. Warm became warmer. Warmth rushed up and surrounded him like a hot bath. The same hot bath he'd prayed to God to feel again when he was in the throes of his frigid muscle spasms. Did an answered prayer mean that he was dead after all? It was all so confusing. He heard water. More specifically, he heard splashing. But he heard it in the same way he'd heard the voices, all mushy and far away. There. He heard it again. Definitely water. Definitely warm water. Definitely a bath. But was it his... Graham, wake up. That time, the voice was clear. Couldn't have been clearer, in fact. Wake up now, son. Dad? Was that his father's voice? Was that possible? He might have recognized the voice, but his head was so full of stuff. Snot? Cotton? Concrete? That he couldn't be sure. No, that wasn't possible, because his dad was... Graham! The voice was loud this time, angry, frightening. A hand landed on his shoulder. It squeezed him and shook him. Hard. What? That time Graham recognized the voice as his own, and his tone was even louder than that of the man who'd shouted at him. As his eyes opened and consciousness returned, he saw that his fantasy was true. He sat fully clothed in a tub of hot water. It came up nearly to his chin. When he moved, a wave broke over his lower lip. Welcome back. And he was back. Back in the awful place with the awful people. Graham recognized the voice before he recognized the face it belonged to. Life is such a capricious thing, is it not? Teddy said. This is among my favorite words, capricious. We have no equivalent in my language. Capricious. One moment we suffer terrible agony, the next we are bathed in comfort and warmth. It all came back to Graham in a rush. The cold, the pain, the pleasure Teddy took from inflicting it. With the memories came the fear. Please don't hurt me any more, Graham said. Teddy smiled. There we go, he said with a big smile. His teeth were yellow. Finally. The boy comes to his senses. Graham's tub was not a bathtub, not really. It was a stainless steel container that was three times the size of an average bathtub. He didn't want to know what its real use was. Five people stared down at him, all of them armed with rifles, and all of them looking very pissed. Why are you doing this? Graham asked. Please do not waste our time by asking questions to which you already know the answers, Teddy said. That makes everything so much more difficult. More difficult for me and much, much more difficult for you. Graham started to speak, but then stopped himself. He'd already told them lies, right? At least, he thought he had. Before he said anything more, he needed to remember what the previous lies were. He needed to be consistent. He tried to stall. I told you, I don't remember anything, he said. Graham hadn't realized that Teddy was squatting to be face to face until the man stood up. Teddy folded his arms across his abundant chest, creating a set of man boobs. This is why I love my favorite words so much, he said. We make choices. We live with the results. Panic started to bloom. But I... Teddy held up a hand to command silence. You need to choose your words carefully now, Graham. I don't want to hurt you more than I have to. Graham's mind screamed. No more pain. Please, please, no more pain. Can I ask you a question? He said. Teddy smiled. A question? He looked to the other men who stood nearby. Certainly. Ask your question. Graham took a deep, settling breath. 
If you were right, you're not. But if you were, and I really did remember the code thing that you think I know, why wouldn't you kill me after I gave it to you? The question seemed to intrigue Teddy, maybe even entertain him. Ah, he said, the hypothetical question. If A is so, what must be the result of B? He laughed. All right, I will play your game in kind. Let us say that I believe that you are lying about not remembering the code. Let us say that I would do everything and anything to get that information from you. Are you with me so far? Graham nodded as his stomach churned more. Very well, Teddy said, because that is indeed the case. Rather than asking you if I would want to kill you after you gave me what I seek, you should ask yourself, what would be your desire to live in terrible pain? Graham's heart hammered. Teddy continued, So far, you have merely been uncomfortable. You have been cold, but your fingers and toes have not yet been broken. Your knees have not yet been shattered, and your testicles have not yet been crushed. Hot wires have not yet been inserted into your eyes. I have done all those things to others, and there is no reason why I would not do the same to you. If you give me what I want, and if I kill you after, I give you my word that it will be quick. He looked at his gang, and they all laughed. Graham stared. Whatever they saw in his face made them laugh harder. <laughs> you are frightened. Teddy said. It's good for you to be frightened. I will make a deal with you. Stay here for a while in the warm tub. You think about what I say, and about what you want. We will walk away for a little while. Not long, but for a while. We give you time to decide which you like more, comfort or pain. It's fair, no? Graham nodded, because it was the only thing he could think to do. Good, Teddy said and he clapped Graham on the shoulder. You give me your answer when I come back then. Then life becomes capricious again. Jonathan walked to the kitchen archway to see if boxers needed help with Security Solutions' latest toy. The long gray box that looked like it might contain a set of golf clubs in fact contained an RQ-11 Raven UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, a drone, the man-portable aircraft, when assembled, had a 55-inch wingspan and weighed a little over four pounds. Propelled by an electric motor, Raven could stay airborne for over an hour at a cruising altitude of 500 feet at a distance from the controller of six miles and change. It was the most expensive model airplane that Jonathan had ever bought. The container in Boxer's hand was a bit smaller, but much heavier. It contained the electronics and antennas, and the various support equipment that were necessary to control the aircraft. Once it was over the target, Raven would transmit high-definition images back to the command post from its tiny but amazing camera. You okay out there, big guy? Jonathan asked. I'm fine, he said. I've got it. What is all that crap you're bringing into my house? Dawn asked. While the money had opened her home, her heart apparently remained disengaged. Some very cool technology. Jonathan said. His earbud popped as it broke squelch. Scorpion, mother hen? Jonathan pressed the transmit button on his vest. Go ahead. Who were you talking to? Dawn demanded. LeBron reached out and touched his wife's arm. Dawn, he said. Jonathan ignored her and focused on the voice in his ear. I've been able to pull up some details on the building in question. Are you in a positive to receive? Not yet, he said. Give me five minutes. Who are you talking to? Don demanded again. And what happens in five minutes? I'm talking to the folks back at home. Jonathan moved to his ruck as he responded and ripped open the Velcro on the main pouch. He lifted out his heavy-duty laptop computer and a collapsed satellite antenna. And where is home? You have no need to know, Jonathan said. He had neither the time nor the desire to engage in small talk. His hands working from muscle memory, Jonathan unfolded the tiny antenna and placed it on top of the television set, pointed out the front window. "'What's that for?' Georgie asked. "'A signal for my computer,' Jonathan replied. 
He hooked up the cable and began the boot-up process. We have wireless internet, Georgie said. Jonathan shook his head and smiled. Not for this, you don't. He wasn't going to attempt to explain complex encryptions or other tech-speak because, quite frankly, he didn't understand it very well himself. When he was booted up and ready to go, he pressed his transmit button. Okay, Mother Hen, we're set. LeBron laughed. <laughs> Mother Hen? Really? She doesn't like it much either, Jonathan said. The screen on Jonathan's laptop flickered once, and then it was filled with a daytime image of a rectangular industrial building and its immediate surroundings. This comes from a commercial mapping company, Veniche said in his ear. Commercial mapping company translated to illegal tap into our friends at Fort Meade. Before we go any farther, is this the facility you're talking about? Hey, look, Georgie said, pointing to the screen. That's our house. Jonathan pressed transmit. Affirmative, that's the location. Is that Google Maps? LeBron asked. Like that, Jonathan said off the air. Look, I'm going to need a little space, okay? If you want to watch, watch, but try to keep the talking down. He didn't bother to look back at boxers. If it were left to big guy, the family would be gagged and locked in the closet where they couldn't see anything. Jonathan understood his point. The only way to maintain operational security is to reveal the least amount of information to the fewest people. But sometimes the nature of the operation required including others. Jonathan was confident that their lack of official identity would provide them with adequate backstop against any details of this evening that LeBron and his family might leak to their friends. Jonathan's screen changed to reveal a highly detailed street view of the same property, which now clearly was a factory. The sign over the door read, Excalibur Meatpacking Enterprises, Inc. That's amazing, LeBron said. You can count the bricks in the wall. How can you get that kind of detail? Was try to keep the talking down really that complicated an instruction? Boxers asked. Don't you get bossy in my house, Don snapped. Boxers said, yes, ma'am. Jonathan smiled at the exchange. Deep down inside, boxers had always been moderately terrified of women. It wasn't something they talked about, but Jonathan had long suspected that boxers had grown through an odd childhood. Using a tiny button of a joystick, Jonathan was able to manipulate the image for a 360-degree walk-around tour of the entire plant. Come take a look, big guy, he said. Two seconds later, a shadow loomed behind him. Over the course of the next five minutes, they noted the main routes of ingress and egress, the location of the loading dock, and other details that might be important, such as the height of windows and the nature and locations of structures on the roof. Jonathan pressed the transmit button. Okay, we got it. The computer display shifted to a blue background with white lines and words, clearly a digital rendering of an old-style blueprint. I got this from the Department of Public Works, Maniche explained. The graphics aren't optimal, but it's the best I could do in the limited time window. What's the date on this document? Jonathan asked. The labels appeared to be handwritten, which he hadn't seen since the advent of computer-aided design rendered traditional draftsmen irrelevant in the late 1980s. 1932, Veniche said. Boxers gave a low whistle. What do you bet they moved a few walls since then? He can hear, too, Georgie said. That's not fair. Why can't we hear? Shut up, Georgie, LeBron said. Be nice to your brother, Don said. Venice explained, The basic bones of the place should be the same. I did a quick but thorough search of building permits in the last twenty years, and nothing showed up. Jonathan transmitted, Of course, that assumes that they would necessarily file for permits, instead of just building stuff out themselves. I think that's a good assumption, Venice said. Hoping to find a trail to something more recent, I also scoured the fire inspection records and saw no mention of structural changes. Jonathan looked to boxers, who shook his head. I don't know how the hell she thinks of this shit, Big Guy said. Then he shot a glance at Dawn. Pardon my language. Page four gives you the best overview of the floor plan, Finice said. Jonathan clicked his way to page four, which revealed a plan view for a manufacturing facility that looked like every other manufacturing facility. The offices lined the front part, while the much larger processing area featured labels that included an awful room, a bleeding pit, and a head-washing station. These in addition to storage rooms, a pre-cooler, a cooler, and a freezer. 
That's disgusting, Boxer said. Almost makes you want to be a vegetarian. For Big Guy, almost was the key word there. The amount of red meat he could consume at one sitting made him legend among his fellow unit operators back in the day. I just hope they cleaned it up before they abandoned it, Jonathan said. After a few years in a freezer without electricity, I bet that can get pretty ripe. They have electricity, LeBron said. Jonathan and Boxer's heads turned in unison. Excuse me? They said. The unison chorus made LeBron laugh. Yeah, they've had it for a while. Jonathan keyed his mic and passed that detail onto the Nietzsche. That doesn't sound right, she said. Stand by one. Jonathan turned to LeBron. How long have they had electricity back? The kid turned to his wife and brother. What, three months? About that, Georgie said. Less, Don said. About ten weeks. Ten weeks it was. It didn't matter all that much, and Jonathan was not going to challenge Don. Truth be told, he was a little afraid of some women, too. Scorpion, Mother Hen, Vinice's voice said. I'm sorry. I checked the electric bill by the company name, not by the address. They're right. The electricity is on at the facility. It has been on for about the last ten weeks. Jonathan smiled and winked at Dawn. She had no idea what it was for, but it made her smile anyway. Jonathan checked his watch. It was time to shift from general plans to specific plans. Mother Hen, I have a mission for you. Please find the locations of the external electrical shutoffs and download them to my GPS. I'll also need you to monitor local police and fire frequencies and keep us from getting in deeper than we can handle. I've already sent the electrical shutoffs, Finice said. I'm also downloading the locations of the nearest public trauma center and the nearest clandestine facility. Just so you know, if it comes to that, I'd shoot for the clandestine shop. Their record is better, and they're only three miles farther away. Jonathan didn't acknowledge that transmission because it was inappropriate traffic to begin with, and he didn't want the surrounding civilians to know that there'd been more conversation. He looked up at Boxers. Do you have anything more for Mother Hen? Big Guy shook his head. Not for now, he said. Jonathan keyed the mic. You're off the hook for a while, Mother Hen. We'll let you know when we're ready to go hot. Jonathan closed the laptop and stood. Okay, big guy, he said. Time to play with our new toy. Chapter 24 As the water cooled, Graham stood in the tub and climbed out. Teddy and his posse had been gone for a while. Until a few minutes ago, Graham had been in a blind panic. They were going to kill him, one way or another. That's what Teddy had said. Not in so many words, but that was what the words he did say actually meant. The question he had to deal with was a Faustian deal of the highest order. Yes, he'd read Faust. He could declare defeat and give them what they wanted, and the reward would be to die immediately or he could hold out longer and preserve his life. That wasn't really a choice at all, now that his heart had calmed a little and he could think clearly. More time on the planet was better than less time. Plus, deep in his heart, he didn't believe the part about breaking bones and crushing his balls. If it came to that, then he would fight until he had nothing left to fight with. When it was all done, if he'd lost the fight and the breaking and the crushing got to be too much— he could always break then. Graham was shocked that his panic had subsided. He was still frightened and sad, but he felt as if those emotions had somehow made him stronger, not physically, but mentally. Thirty-six hours ago, more or less, his life had been normal, pretending to study for a math test he could have done with his eyes closed, hoping against hope that Avery Hessington and the rest of the high school royalty would let him walk the halls unmolested. Thirty-six hours ago, it mattered what names people called him. Freak, geek, gay, pussy, queer. He'd lived with all of them for as long as he could remember. It mattered who would dare to sit with him in the cafeteria. And it mattered that he lived in fear of being called on because he always knew the right answer. That all seemed so distant now, so irrelevant. Though as the memories rejuvenated in his head, they triggered vivid resentment. Who the hell was Avery Hessington to put him through that kind of hell? And how could Graham have taken it so seriously? If he ever got out of this, he was going to tell Avery what an asshole he was. The first step was to climb out of the tub. 
He stepped over the lip and onto the concrete floor. Graham's fingers and toes had turned pruny and white from the water. As he explored this massive room, the water draining from his matted clothes left a slick on the floor. He walked to the far wall, where windows lined its entire length. Through the thick layer of grime, he could see the wire reinforcement in the glass. He felt a flutter of hope in his belly. Could escape really be so easy? As he approached, he had to climb over all kinds of abandoned stuff. Much of it was shiny, and while much of it was heavy, nothing he saw was either pointy or sharp. Nothing that would make a good weapon. But maybe something would make a good glass breaker. He lifted a heavy T-shaped object, maybe ten inches long, that looked like it might have been a mallet in a parallel universe. He tested the weight of it in his hand, and then looked up at the window, tall and narrow, the windows opened by rocking in, like the windows in his old school. But the lock and the handle were eight or nine feet off the ground, way too high for him to reach. The bottom sill of the window started at chest level and rose from there nearly all the way to the ceiling. He needed to work quickly. Teddy said he'd be back soon. Graham lifted the hammer to crash it through the glass, but he paused, remembering that nothing had gone his way since this ordeal had started. He decided to check first to see what was on the other side. He squeezed his soaked T-shirt to his wet hand and then used the hand to swirl a viewport through the filthy window pane. He saw nothing, literally nothing, just his own reflection staring back at him. Screw it. I'm out of here. He took a step back, closed his eyes, and delivered a full overhead blow to the side of the pane. When he looked to check the damage... He saw that he'd left a wide, circular spiderweb fracture in the glass. It wasn't a hole yet, but it was an indentation. And Jesus, was it loud. But at this point, loud didn't matter. Getting caught didn't matter. All that mattered was getting out of this hell house. He swung the hammer again, aiming for the same spot, and again and again. Each hammer blow to the glass reverberated through his arms and his shoulders. Bam! 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 Liquid spattered the glass in the concrete walls, whether from his soaked clothes or from his own sweat he didn't know, and he didn't care. Finally, the head of his makeshift hammer broke all the way through. He had a hole. It wasn't yet big enough to climb through, but it was a goddamn hole. He picked a new spot on the window adjacent to the first, and he started pounding there. After God only knew how many strokes, there was another hole, and by pounding the spot, the two holes joined into one big hole, but they were only twelve or thirteen inches in diameter. Pausing to throw a glance over his shoulder to see if they were coming for him yet, he turned and hammered some more. His arms were growing heavier with each additional blow, but what difference did that make? He had to keep going. He had to. To stop now was to guarantee his death. Teddy was not going to be happy when he found out that Graham had beaten up his torture chamber. The word torture brought back a stab of the panic as it passed through his head. It meant everything that was awful, everything that hurt. It meant the end of hope. Now that he could see the faint outlines of hope on the horizon, he realized that that was all he had left. He'd get out on his own, or he would die at the hands of others. If he could just make the hole big enough... A third hole appeared, and with a final blow, that one joined the other two to form a kind of three-circle Venn diagram where the intersection of the subsets formed a hole. One more, and he should be free to go. For this one, he swung lower than the others so that it would be easier for him to access the opening when he was done. How stupid would he be, how worthy of the Darwin Award, if he made his escape hatch too high off the ground to reach? Graham had no idea how many times he smashed away at the glass. Fifty? A hundred? I won't stop. Not until I'm outside and free. The fourth collection of spider webs became a fourth hole, and with five more swings, the heaviest thing he'd ever wielded as his shoulder and his neck screamed for relief, the connecting web broke through, and the resulting hole was worth trying. It reached nearly down to the sill. He finished it off by pounding out the space at the very bottom where he'd be dragging his body as he made his way outside. Graham didn't know he was bleeding until he placed his hammer on the floor. He'd already placed it gently on the concrete, his effort not to make noise, when he realized how ridiculous a notion that was. 
He just wasn't thinking right. And while he wasn't bleeding badly, he was bleeding from about a million places on his hands and arms, no doubt from the shattered glass that he'd never felt cutting his flesh. While that, too, didn't matter, the cuts reminded him that he was surrounded by shards of glass and bits of wire, and that he was barefoot, and that his clothes were so wet that everything would stick to them. Picking up his hammer again, he used it as a broom to sweep off the sill to remove the big pieces. After two passes, he decided that he spent enough time being neat and careful, and now it was time to climb. Using his forearms as leverage against the sill, he hoisted himself up until he was high enough to support his weight with his knee. Head first or feet first? It was only because of the height that he decided to back out of the space feet first. There were lots of things that could go wrong with that plan, not the least of which involved dropping onto a lot of broken glass. But all of the scenarios he could think of were better applied to his feet than his head. He didn't have time to second guess. He took care when maneuvering on the narrow ledge not to overbalance and fall back into the room he was trying to leave. The angles here were tough. He maneuvered himself to a position where he was squatting in front of and with his back turned to his exit portal. His weight was evenly distributed between his fingertips and the balls of his feet, which were all aligned in the same plane. Balance was key. Keeping his back straight and as erect as possible, he shifted his weight to his palms as he moved first one foot and then the other through the vertical hole. When his legs were through up to his thighs and dangling on the other side, he rocked forward and let his lower body slide through the hole up to his waist. The last eight or nine inches were the worst as his doodads passed over the ledge. He rocked his hips to the side to protect them as best he could, but the wire stab in his ass cheek kept him from rocking over too far. Then his lower body was through. He pressed his belly flat against the sill and eased himself out. He took one final look at the door through which Teddy had exited, and no doubt the one through which he would re-enter, praying that this would not be the moment of the torturer's return. At this juncture, the only way to stop Graham from all the way across the room would be to shoot him in the face. He didn't want to be shot in the face. So he needed to keep going, inching backward along his belly. He reached the tipping point where the weight of his dangling legs overcame his ability to hang on, and he allowed himself to drop. The point of his chin clipped the far side of the sill as he tumbled a few feet to the floor. He landed hard on his heels. He felt the piece of glass that punctured his left foot in the middle of the arch, and his momentum carried him all the way over onto his back. When he came to rest, his feet were up in the air, and the back of his head was on concrete. Graham rolled to his side, cleared the shard of glass from his foot with a swipe of his hand, and stood. Something was wrong here. It didn't feel like outside air. The floor was concrete. It took him two seconds to process the obvious. He wasn't outside after all. He'd wasted all that time and all that effort crashing through an interior window. Who the hell builds a window to the inside? He whispered to no one. Shit. It didn't matter. There had to be an outside somewhere. He just needed to find it. Beyond the wash of light through the windows from the room he'd just exited, the rest of the building was dark, as in cave dark, the absence of light. Graham was sure that sooner or later his eyes would adjust, but in an instant the darkness transformed to daylight, a blinding glare that dug at his eyes and made him feel unbalanced. By reflex, he covered his eyes with his bloody palms. He heard a noise that sounded like people clapping as he dropped to a crouch, making himself as small as possible. That took you long enough, Teddy's voice said from somewhere beyond Graham's covered eyes. Graham peeled his hands away, and as his eyes adjusted, he saw the torturer approaching him. His head told him to run, but his instincts told him to wait. I wanted you to feel that adrenaline rush, Teddy went on, because for every rush, there is a crash. I think the most important thing that someone in your position must remember is that Hope is imaginary. By breaking through that window and coming out into this space, you did exactly what I expected you to do. That's why we've been waiting. Though I must tell you that we've been waiting for much longer than I thought we would. Sooner or later, you will give me what I want. Graham could see people gathered behind Teddy, many of the same faces he'd seen in the room with the tub, but they seemed to be hanging back. 
Graham stood and took a couple of steps back, maintaining his distance from Teddy. I gave you an assignment last time we spoke, Teddy said. Have you had a chance to think about the options I gave you? Graham knew that if he tried to bolt, they would hurt him, so he stayed put, unmoving. I expect an answer, Graham, Teddy said. This was the big moment. He could declare himself to be sniveling, or he could show some pride. Graham stood to his full five-foot-nine-inch height and faced Teddy head-on. Yeah, I've thought about it, he said. I've decided you need to believe the truth. I don't know anything you want to hear. Teddy planted his hands on his hips, the posture of a man who was sorely disappointed. That's very sad, he said. It's a decision that makes your life many times more difficult. In my opinion, too many people value bravery and defiance over common sense. We will do it the more difficult way, then. His heart screaming for relief, Graham tensed and waited for the attack. He had no experience fighting, but he had plenty of experience running away from fights, and in this place there was plenty of room to duck and dodge. That couldn't go on forever, certainly not against people with guns. But every delay brought him a new opportunity for a miracle. Only they didn't rush him. Instead, they sneaked up on him from behind. He sensed them before he saw them, and before he could react, a noose dropped over his head and pulled tight around his neck. He brought his hands to his throat to protect his windpipe, and when he did, the noose pulled tighter, lifted higher. He had to stand on tiptoes to keep his head from being pulled off. Hands to your side, Graham, Teddy said. His voice kept a relaxed monotone that sounded so easygoing and businesslike. Relax, then. We are not trying to kill you. We are trying to control you. Graham did as he was told. He lowered his hands, and the man who controlled the noose loosened it. Good men, Teddy said, and a good lesson in cause and effect. Now cross your wrists behind your back. Graham hesitated. They were going to tie his hands, and once that was done, he'd be finished. His chance for survival, over. The hesitation caused him to be lifted off his heels again and onto his toes. The rope, he couldn't see it, but he was certain that it was a rope, chafed the flesh of his neck. He battled every instinct to claw at the noose, and instead did what he was told and crossed his wrists behind his back. The pressure eased. He stood still and tried not to give in to the tears that pressed behind his eyes as someone slipped a loop over his hands and pulled it tight. The plastic ratchet sound told him that they'd used the zip ties he'd seen on cop shows. Your future is in your own hands now, young man, Teddy said. Failure to comply means pain. Doing the reasonable thing means less pain. It's that simple. Teddy started walking away, and Graham's minder followed, lifting slightly on the noose to encourage his captive to follow. There was no doubt in Graham's mind as he danced through the broken glass on the floor to the amusement of his handler that they'd deliberately chosen the most painful path. To stumble at this point would be to hang himself. When they were through the glass, Graham swiped the sole of each foot against the opposite calf to rub away any straggling shards, and then allowed himself to be led wherever they were taking him. He knew he was in trouble the instant he saw the big freezer door. This was probably the very route they'd carried him into the building. But of course, he hadn't been able to see anything then. As soon as Teddy pulled on the door latch, his suspicions were confirmed. The first thing he saw was the hooks hanging from the ceiling, and then he took in the table that he'd tried to turn into his shelter. The room looked smaller from this angle, and somehow even more frightening. The meat hooks dangled from overhead like so many gleaming, blood-ravenous bats. The table mocked him as the slab on which to perform his autopsy. The floor still glistened with ice. Graham felt sick but he was determined not to give his captors the satisfaction of seeing him puke. Remember, Teddy said, this is all your choosing. The goon on the other end of the rope led slash dragged Graham to the center of the room and positioned him in a precise spot. Graham didn't know what the spot meant, but apparently it was important to whatever lay ahead. 
Only a few feet in, the frigid air enveloped him like a blanket of razor blades. Equipment of some sort moved behind him, but his efforts to turn and see earned him a slap in the gut, so he resigned himself to being surprised. Time and opportunity. Graham felt a slight tug on his neck, nothing like the first ones, and then people moved away from him. When he looked up, he saw that the far end of his noose had been tied around the J of a meat hook. Be careful, Teddy said as Graham's minder pulled away. That noose is a one-way knot. Once it tightens, you need hands to loosen it. And, well, you don't have functioning hands anymore. Remember what happened last time you grew so cold? The asshole actually waited for an answer. Graham refused to give him one. Do you want me to pre-tighten the knot? Teddy asked. When I'm in control, questions get answered. Now again, do you want me to pre-tighten the knot? Graham shook his head. Motion is not an answer, Teddy said. His voice was getting reedy. Graham didn't know what that meant for him, but he knew that it couldn't be good. No, Graham said. I don't want you to tighten the knot. Very well, then. The question I asked you is, do you remember what happened the last time you got very cold? Graham scowled. The god's honest, truthful answer was no. He didn't remember. He remembered being cold and frightened, and then he remembered being in the warm bath. Everything else was either non-existent or a blur in his memory, but he sensed that Teddy wouldn't want to hear that. You're confused, Teddy said. That's because you fell unconscious, and that, my friend, is the point. If you fall unconscious now, I will not rescue you. What you know is important, but not so important that we cannot live without it. What is it? Graham asked. He stood taller than was necessary, keenly aware of the non-loosening knot and the lack of slack in the rope. What do the numbers mean? Teddy smiled. So... You do remember, he said. I remember that there were numbers and letters, Graham said, but I don't remember what they were. Teddy made a clicking sound with his tongue and shook his head. <sighs> Such a shameful way for a good-looking young man to perish. I'm told that at first you feel the great pressure in your head and your face as the blood gets trapped above the level of the rope. As your windpipe crashes, it obviously gets harder to breathe, and as the pressure builds more, your gag reflex is triggered. If you have enough strength, enough wind, to vomit, then you make a mess down the front of yourself. If you do not, then the vomit will drown you. Either way, when people discover your body, your face will be bloated to two or three times its normal size, as will your legs and your scrotum. You will be a deep purple in color. More times than not, hanging victims who have been unattended for too long have their tongues sticking out of their bloated faces. It was a horrifying image, and Graham knew that it was 100% true. He knew because he'd seen movies where that was nearly the exact image portrayed. The tongue was the most disgusting part, and the scrotum. Jesus, the thought of a swollen purple ball sack was enough to ruin anyone's stomach. Terror welled from his gut. Was that whole vomiting thing about to happen now? I'll leave you to your shivering, Teddy said. But first, I have a surprise for you. On cue, the freezer door opened again, and Graham heard movement behind him. You may pivot, Teddy said. Just be careful not to trip and break your neck. I don't want you to miss your surprise. Graham quick-stepped a tight circle to his left, toward the sound he'd heard. When he saw his surprise, there was no way to contain his horror. Chapter 25 Jonathan launched the raven with more or less the same motion he would have launched a Hail Mary pass within a football game. A wide overhead pitch counterbalanced by an extended left arm. The electric motor was already up to speed, so once free of his hand it was airborne and in controlled flight. LeBron and Georgie stood so close to him that it was difficult not to hit them in the head with his follow-through. So what's that going to do? LeBron asked. It's going to send us some awesome pictures, Jonathan said. 
He led the tiny parade back into the house where Boxers was engrossed in the business of piloting the aircraft via a mini control panel and a computer screen, to which Dawn seemed 100% glued. Nice launch, boss, Boxers said. You didn't do that girly throw-into-the-ground move. That would have been embarrassing for all of us. As he spoke, his eyes never left the screen, which showed very little of interest. If you used your imagination, you could see the ground passing underneath the drone's camera, but it required a suspension of disbelief. Boxers was the pilot of the team, but Jonathan understood most of the rudimentary elements of navigation and aerodynamics, so he knew that Big Guy was guiding the Raven by instruments, coordinating the non-visual elements of compass direction, altitude, airspeed, and even wind speed to bring the UAV on target. The camera was working, thus the near images of the ground, but there was no definitive image to observe. Twenty or thirty seconds later, the screen filled with an overhead view of the buildings they'd seen as a blueprint. Next to Boxer's navigation screen, Jonathan pulled up the plan view that Venice had uploaded for him. He also re-upped the blueprint package, just in case they needed it. That's amazing, LeBron said. You can see everything. It was a true statement, emphasis on everything. The days of grainy black and white or silver and white IR technology as the only way to see in the dark were gone. If you had the bucks to spend and the access to the developers of top-secret technology, modern optics had the power to transform night into day. Boxer's eyes narrowed as his concentration increased. As the pilot, his eyes stayed on the computer images of a control panel, and he could afford only brief glances at the images that were beamed back. Jonathan recorded the images for later examination. Because everything was digital, they would be able to freeze any frame they wanted and zoom in on it as if it were a high-definition still photograph. Very cool technology. Boxers flew the aircraft first in a wide circle around the building, and then in a zigzag pattern over the top. Even before careful analysis, Jonathan took in the obvious. People stood at each of the doorways. The prudent assumption would be that they were armed guards. Each was positioned in such a way that they would be difficult to see from the street. What's your altitude? Jonathan asked. About 400 feet. Even if they looked straight up, they wouldn't be able to see or hear a thing. After five, maybe seven minutes of cruising over the building, Boxer said, I've seen everything I need. Ready to call it a night for the Raven. Affirm, before we get hooked. Even in a tense situation, cool technology could become mesmerizing in itself. The coolness factor converting the equipment into a toy and the recon mission into playtime. This is like Jack Bauer shit, Georgie said. Big guy could kick Jack Bauer's ass. Jonathan said through a grin. And not even break a sweat, Boxer said. His eyes never left his controls. Can anybody buy one of these? LeBron asked. If you've got enough money and you know the right people, I suppose you could buy anything, Jonathan said. He didn't add that he'd built an entire career around doing just that. But you won't find it in Radio Shack. Who are you people, really? Don asked. It was the question that she couldn't get past. All these guns and electronics, throwing cash around like it's water. Who are you? Jonathan turned away from the screen and addressed her. She stood behind her husband and his brother, hugging herself, tears balanced on her eyelids. She was scared. Jonathan stood from his chair and gently nudged the young men to step out of the way. Don't touch anything, he said. He approached Dawn slowly and easily. He set his face on what he hoped was a look of compassion. As he closed the distance, Dawn took a step back, and he stopped. He didn't want to invade her space. Dawn, all I can tell you is that we're the good guys. I have no way to prove that to you, and I understand what a leap of faith it must be for you to believe that. But I swear to God it's the truth. We're here to help a young man and a young woman live to see tomorrow. Really, that's all we're about. Don looked at him, assessing him for a long time, maybe thirty seconds. This young man and young woman, how old are they? Fourteen and twenty-seven. As the words passed his lips, he heard boxers growl, more of the sharing that he detested. Which is which? Don asked. The male is the younger. 
So he's a baby. Hey, Georgie said. I'm 15. I'm no baby. Dawn smirked, and Jonathan got it. What did they do? They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They have some very dangerous information. Yo, boss, Boxer said. How about a little discretion here? We're in their home, big guy. It's only right that we share as much as we can. To Dawn, he said, Don't ask what that information is. That would be a step too far. Dawn stewed a little longer. So if I called Detroit PD right now... She let the sentence hang in the air. I would prefer you didn't do that, Jonathan said. But if I did, we'd be lucky if they got here in an hour, LeBron said. Jonathan smiled, but otherwise ignored him. I think you're asking me if the police would know if we were here, he said. The answer to that would be no. And if you called the FBI, that answer would be no as well. You may take from that whatever you wish. What are the chances that LeBron or Georgie or me will get in trouble with the law for any of this? Jonathan was impressed with the way this young woman thought. She was a wife, a mother, and a caring sister-in-law. Her first priority was to make sure that no harm would come to the people she loved. Jonathan had nothing but admiration for people who put family first. Let me put it to you this way, Jonathan said. If you don't call them, the Detroit police and the FBI and the CIA and every other three-letter agency you can think of, we'll never know that we set foot in your lovely home. The only way that word could possibly leak out is if you or LeBron or Georgie leak it. So it's your plan to rescue the boy and the girl? Don asked. It is. Jonathan said. Oh, come on, Scorpion, Boxers complained. Just a little secret keeping, you know, for old time's sake. Boxers had always been the OPSEC purist, but Jonathan sensed that he was laying it on extra thick tonight to enhance Jonathan's aura as a good cop in his negotiation with Dawn. Jonathan looked at her and shrugged. There's no way I can make you comfortable with all that is happening, but I hope this convinces you that you and yours getting hurt is nowhere in the plan. He waited till he had eye contact. In fact, I promise that I will kill and I will die to protect you. He knew that Boxers was going to bust his balls later for the melodrama. He saw a big guy swivel his head to make eye contact, but he ignored him. This encounter was about selling Dawn on the mission. So what are we supposed to do tomorrow? she asked. Jonathan cocked his head. Just looking at all the equipment you brought, I'm guessing that tomorrow morning the factory across the road is going to look a lot different, she said. It's going to have holes in it, and it's going to have dead bodies in it, am I right? Jonathan sensed all the heads turning to await his answer, so he turned to stone. There was simply nothing for him to say in response. Dawn seemed to get that. Okay, she pressed. Let's just say I'm right. For all I know, you might be one of the bodies in there. But whatever happens, people are going to find out. People are going to start asking questions. What do I tell them? Whatever you think is appropriate, Jonathan said. You can repeat every word of this conversation, if that's what you think is necessary. But by way of full disclosure, I have to warn you that that particular route will prove very frustrating for all concerned. He wiggled his gloved fingers as if to wave to a child. We've left no fingerprints, and even if we did, they would be untraceable. You know us as Scorpion and Big Guy, and you know we communicate with someone named Mother Hen. Pretend you're a cop and run that story through your head. How do you think that will go? Dawn looked at the floor. She got it. Everyone always got it. The money he threw around didn't hurt, but that wasn't the deciding factor 99% of the time. Jonathan believed, and boxers would fight him on this one, that people were inherently good. Many were assholes, and all of them lived every day primarily to advance their own agenda. But when the chips were down, the vast majority would endure significant risk for the benefit of a stranger. And if the stranger were a baby, as Dawn referred to Graham, the willingness to take risks spiked dramatically. Hey, boss, Boxer said, we need to do some planning. Jonathan kept his gaze on Don. You know you're the linchpin in all this, right? He said. I don't mean to presume, but I sense that I've got LeBron and Georgie 100% with me. 
I've got you pegged as about 35%. In relatively few minutes, Big Guy and I are going to step into the furnace. Can I count on you to not start another battle to our rear? Don started to answer, then stopped. I'm not sure I know what that means, start another battle. Boxers snapped. It means he doesn't want you ratting us out to the cops who are run so ragged in this town that they'd shoot their Aunt Millie if she scratched her armpit, thinking she was going to draw down on them from a shoulder rig. LeBron laughed. <laughs> we actually have an Aunt Millie, and if she reaches for her armpit, the smart move would be to shoot her. The two brothers laughed together. Dawn remained unamused. Here's what I promise you, she said. I pray that you save those people. And I don't care what you have to do to make that happen. Jonathan smiled. Don't be happy yet, she said. If anything happens to my family, if there's so much as a scratch on my house, I will do everything I can to hunt you down and make you pay. Jonathan looked to LeBron. He'd married himself one hell of a woman. Jonathan admired the passion. It's a deal, he said. They shook on it, but he never took off his glove. He had no idea if that made the deal less binding. Jolaine looked terrible. They arranged her so that she was straddling a tall sawhorse, still fully clothed. Her hands were tightly bound, and the goons strung them to one of the meat hooks overhead. She'd clearly been beaten. Blood glistened from her nose to her chin, and her face was bruised purple. Her left eye was swollen shut. Graham didn't know what to say. He wasn't even sure that she was conscious, or, if she was, that she knew that he was present. How could anyone do such a thing to her? A gorge of anger blossomed in his gut. Who the hell did these people think? I believe you two know each other, Teddy said. At the sound of the voice, Jolaine's head rocked up. At first, she looked confused, but then she saw Graham and she smiled. One of her front teeth had been knocked out. I'm sorry, Graham, she said. With her mouth trauma, sorry sounded like thari. Graham's vision blurred. Nothing was worth this level of suffering. Look at me, Graham, Jolaine said. They made eye contact. Give up nothing, she said. One of the silent goons lifted her T-shirt to reveal bare flesh and touched it with a stick that made a snapping sound. Jolaine's back arched and she screamed as she became rigid. That's an electrical torture stick, Teddy explained in his ear. Some people call it a cattle prod in your country. It is certainly an attention getter. Allow me to demonstrate. Teddy lifted the front of Graham's T-shirt and tucked the tail behind his head, effectively blinding him while exposing his entire torso. He felt contact high on his belly, just below his breastbone, and the world went purple. A jolt of hot agony erupted from his core and shot from his teeth to his toes. The electric jolt seemed to pass through every cell in his body. He smelled blood in his sinuses, and as his knees sagged, a strong pair of arms grabbed him from behind and propped him up, but not before the noose tightened. He could still breathe, but he could feel pressure building in his head from the blood backing up. Impressive, don't you think? Teddy said. He pulled Graham's T-shirt back down so that he could see. When he saw Graham's face, he smiled. Ah, so you learned the two lessons, he said, not least of which was the wonder of the self-tightening knot. He displayed the cattle prod so that Graham could see it better. But that was one brief contact to a relatively insensitive part of your body. Imagine that against a very sensitive part of your body. Is this really the life you want to live? Do you really want to inflict this kind of pain against someone who is close to you? Teddy nodded to the voiceless henchman, who smiled and nodded back. He touched the stick to a place on Jolaine's back. Graham couldn't see the exact point of contact, but the resulting scream was horrifying. It reverberated off the concrete walls and metal surfaces. When it was over... Jolaine sagged even deeper. When she rolled her glazed eyes up to look at him, she no longer looked human. It was as if that part of her, her soul, maybe, had been driven out. Equal parts humiliation and pain, her expression told him that she was done. Her spirit had fled her body.
Pain is a terrible thing, Teddy said. Look at what it does. Look at what your decision does to others. Perhaps we could touch the prod to her eye. I'm not sure what, Graham blurted. 3155AX47559A CVRLLPBHQ446833D0Z. Teddy looked stunned. Excuse me? Graham, no, Jolaine rasped. Graham repeated the code. That's what you're looking for, right? The code? Graham, please, don't. Teddy's eyes narrowed to slits. Say it two more times, he said. Graham glared through Teddy's skull. He sensed that he'd created an opportunity for himself. He wasn't sure what it was, exactly, but he sensed that the stakes had changed, and for at least a little while, Graham now had a hand to play that might buy additional time. Get this thing off my neck, Graham said. I've given it to you twice. For a third time, you get rid of the noose. Or how about I just tighten it more, Teddy countered. Tighter and tighter, until you give me what I want. Graham's heart could not race any faster without shredding itself. He was playing a dangerous game of who blinks first, and he was already in too deep to stop. Brain cells, Graham said. They're very sensitive to oxygen. Teddy turned to the goon who stood next to Jolaine. No, Graham shouted before Teddy could give the order. No one moved, awaiting Graham's next step. No more prodding, he said. Let her arms down and get her off that whatever the hell she's sitting on. That's sick. That frightening look of amusement returned to Teddy's eyes. So now you're telling me that I am sick. You're a friggin' torturer, dude. Of course you're sick. Jesus. Teddy leaned in closer till his features blurred and their noses nearly touched. You think you have control, he whispered. His breath stank of cigarettes. You are wrong. I have the code, Graham said. I have everything you want. Please step away from my face. In his own time, Teddy moved back. Thank you. Graham cleared his throat again. Whatever this code is, whatever it does, I figure it's got to be important. There's no pattern to it. It's a random cipher. So that means it's not the Kremlin garage code or something stupid like that. And given everybody's focus on me and my family, I figure that somehow we're the only ones who know it. The change in Teddy's eyes told him that he was close to the mark. So here's where I think I have a little control. It's a long code with a lot of characters. If you shock Jolaine again, or if you don't do what I ask, I'll just change some of the elements. You'll never know. Oh, we will know, Teddy said. We will test the code, and we will know. This was going exactly as Graham had hoped it would. These assholes had inadvertently taught him how to extract information through a diversionary conversation. He'd just learned that they had a way to verify what he told them. Then what? he pressed. He was so excited, so terrified that his voice trembled. You'd test it and find out it didn't work. Then all you'd know is that I gave you the wrong sequence. You'd never know how it's wrong. That would be a very big mistake, young man. You do that, you'll see how sick I can be. So let's make a deal, Graham said. Take this noose off of me. Get Jolaine a chair, and I'll tell you what you want to know. If I've lied, then we'll still be here. You can torture us until you've had your fill. Teddy regarded him clearly looking for the angle that could hurt him or his cause. You are playing a very dangerous game, my young friend. If you toy with me, I will hurt you very, very badly. I'm not your friend, Graham said. This defiance game was not for the weak of heart, but once in, he had to go all the way. Okay, Teddy said. Okay, we do things your way, but God help you. As he loosened the slipknot from around Graham's neck, he called over his shoulder and said something that caused the goons to loosen the ropes on Jolaine's arms. A folding chair arrived from somewhere. They lifted her off the horrible sawhorse contraption, and they put her on the chair. Her wrists remained tied, 
but they rested on her lap. Graham ducked a little as the noose was lifted away. When he was free, he said, And now my hands. Not part of the deal, Teddy said. You should understand that now my patience is gone. I had to try, Graham said. It is time to give me what I bargained for. Graham nodded. You're going to want to write this down, he said. From a few feet away, Jolaine tried one more time. Graham, they're terrorists. You're giving them something terrible. I can only imagine what it is, but please don't. Look at me, Teddy said. Not at her. You and I have deal. He snapped his fingers and spoke again to his buddies, one of whom produced a pen and a tablet of paper. Say it slowly. Graham enunciated every character. Teddy wrote as he spoke. After he documented the cipher string, he said, Now we'll see if you told truth. Say it again. Graham didn't hesitate. This time he raced through the cipher, nailing every character. Would you like me to do it backwards? He barely saw the man deliver the punch to his gut. The blow pushed the air from Graham's lungs and collapsed his knees. Spots exploded behind his eyes, and for the longest time he could neither see nor breathe as his insides convulsed. He wondered for a while if he might suffocate. Finally, breath came but his insides felt like they might have been run through a blender. Unable to access his hands for support, and Lord knows unable to do anything that might resemble a sit-up, he rolled from his side onto his stomach, and from there inchwormed to his knees, then found his feet and stood. He didn't know why, but it felt important to stand. By the time he was up, the goons were all gone. The cold was beginning to work its way into him again. You shouldn't have done that, Jolaine said. That code is for some kind of weapon. And for them to go to these extremes, it must be a weapon of enormous value. She spat a wad of blood onto the floor. I bought us time, he said. At a huge price. I just couldn't watch them do that to you, he said. That wasn't right. I couldn't watch it. Jolaine shook her head. I can take care of myself, she said. A laugh burst out of Graham before he could stop it. As she heard her own words, Jolaine chuckled too. <laughs> Evidence to the contrary notwithstanding, <clears throat> she added. Graham looked around the room for some way out. This place had the same wire windows as the room he'd broken out of. He could see the heads of two guards who were now stationed just on the other side. Movement through the window on the door told him that at least one guard was out there, too. This is our time and opportunity, he said. What are we going to do? Right now, it seems that dying is at the top of the list, Jolaine said. Not yet, Graham said. The bruises on her face seemed to be worsening as he watched. What? You think they're going to let us live now that they've got what they want? I've been telling you from the beginning... I lied, he whispered, a beat. Excuse me? The code, he said. It's not the right one. I transposed some of the characters and made up others. Jolaine looked confused. But how? He made you repeat them. So? No matter how many times people talked about his memory, they always had a hard time grasping the reality. Could you have actually recited it backward? He smiled. No, that was a bluff. The smile went away, however, as he thought about the misery that lay ahead when the assholes found out what he'd done. Well, shit, Jolaine said. We need a plan. Chapter 26 The raven crashed on impact and broke apart, just as it was designed to do. A soldier-proof system... It was built to be frangible on impact so that the wings and the horizontal stabilizers in the rear would separate easily from the fuselage. That eliminated the need for smooth surfaces to allow for long rollout landings. Georgie found the crash to be particularly entertaining, laughing far too loudly for the otherwise quiet night. A little stealth would be good right now, Jonathan said to him as he collected the pieces and laid them across the bed of the expedition. 
He locked the door when he was done and went back inside, where boxers had queued up the recorded images. I've been looking at these, boss, Big Guy said as soon as Jonathan entered the room. Good news, this is definitely the target. Jonathan smiled. Confidence level? Ninety-nine and change. Look here. Jonathan kneeled next to the chair boxers had commandeered. Big Guy rolled the wheel on the mouse and zoomed in on a sedan that was parked in the rear of the plant. Look at that license plate. That's our guy, he said. The plate matched the one that transported Joe Lane from the jail. He clapped boxers on the back. Since this adventure began, they'd been chasing assumptions. Before any shooting started, it was good to know that they were really in the right place. What tactical info do you have? I know we've got at least six bad guys, but it's probably safe to assume twelve to fifteen. He pointed to the screen with a capped pen as he spoke. We've got two on each of the three main entrances, the white, black, and green sides. The red side is a loading dock where the blueprints show an overhang. The IR doesn't show anyone there, but no guarantees that's not guarded, too. Boxers clicked the mouse, and the screen changed to the infrared view. The imagery transformed to black and silver, and the details got fuzzy, nearly to the point of being a blur. Here, we're limited by technology, Boxers said. You can see on this section here, he pointed to a spot against the black back wall that was twenty feet from the green left wall, that it's much colder than anywhere else in the building. I think that means they've turned the freezer on. Which means they had a reason for doing it, Jonathan said, closing the loop. Assuming they're not just cooling beers, the freezer holds something we want to see. That's where I was going, Boxer said. So if we assume eight people on the doors, nobody's going to want to work alone inside, so that's at least ten. No way we can have a hard count. The kid says twenty to twenty-five. Before raiding a place, it helped to know precisely how many bad guys there were. It mattered less when the opposing force was massed together, say, in barracks, where mass casualty tactics could do a lot of harm with relatively little effort or danger. But when the enemy was spread around like this... The team was looking at a lot of individual gunfights, and there was no way to know when the last bad guy had been dropped. Enter the concept of the force multiplier. Through advanced fighting techniques, Jonathan and boxers could tilt the odds away from the strengths of the enemy, cover and knowledge of the surroundings, toward their own strengths. Chief among those strengths were the ability to maneuver and shoot effectively in darkness. Superimpose the electrical feeds Mother Hen sent us, Jonathan said. I guess we've got to assume that they haven't jury-rigged something on their own, Big Guy said. If that's the case, there appear to be two of them. The main box is here on the red side, on the loading dock. Then there's another one, a big one, on the black side, on the outer wall of the freezer. Jonathan squinted, staring at the screen. It was so much easier to blow one source of power and move in. Now they would have to sequence two blasts. That wasn't a big deal, necessarily, but it meant more time on target, and time meant additional exposure. That's not the shit I worry about, Boxers said. Well, of course not, Jonathan said. Boxers was most self-actualized when he was playing with explosives. I worry about how we're going to get close enough to do what we need to do without being seen. He raised a good point. Breaching a fence was barely a challenge, but then what? Getting in was only half the mission. Getting out quickly with precious cargo intact was the greater challenge. With the entire perimeter fenced in, and with guards stationed outside, they couldn't just crash the front gate and race up the driveway, because it would take too much time and make too much noise. The key to an O-300 operation was to get the precious cargo out alive. With that kind of advance warning, the bad guys might panic and create a barricade situation that rarely ended well for anyone. Is there a back gate in the fence? Jonathan asked. Boxer shook his head. We don't have plans for the fence, and it doesn't show in the imagery. Sort of, LeBron said. Jonathan and Boxers turned in unison to face him. In his peripheral vision, Jonathan noted that Don's face wore a similarly intrigued expression. LeBron grew uncomfortable with the attention. There was stuff back there he said. Lots of scrap metal that nobody wanted, so maybe someone cut a hole in the fence. Don was aghast. You stole? How could you do that? You have a family to support now. The judge told you that one more I didn't steal, LeBron said. It was just there. It's junk. Nobody wants it. 
Why steal it then? For money. I sold it for scrap. How did you get it to the scrapyard? In Doobie's truck, LeBron said. Jonathan raised a hand to interrupt the conversation. Excuse me, he said. My clock is ticking here. LeBron, how big was the hole you cut? Big enough for the truck. No way that's still there, Boxer said. These guys would have patched it up. But they didn't, LeBron said. We kind of patched it back up ourselves because we didn't want to put up with a lot of shit from the cops if they found it, like they'd have a drive back there. We put the section we took down back up with a little wire to hold it in place. I was back there a few days ago and nobody had changed nothing. Why did you go back there? Don pressed. Because we got to eat, and I got no job, LeBron said. You never know when you might have missed something. He paused, and Jonathan could see the wheels turning in his head. Did he want to say more or not? Okay, and there's one more thing. I don't like these people. I've never trusted them from the minute I saw them. They got no business being here. I wanted to see what I could see. LeBron looked into Jonathan's eyes. And Scorpion? Yes. There are guards at the loading dock. There are always guards at the loading dock. That's another reason I don't like them being in my hood. Jonathan smiled broadly. Well, God bless Neighborhood Watch, he said. How did you get a truck around there? The map shows trees. LeBron moved to the computer screen. Zoom out some, he said. Get to where we can see the whole thing. Boxers pulled away about to the 200-foot mark. There, LeBron pointed to the woods line on the black side of the building. There's like a clearing right in here. He squinted and leaned closer. I don't see it here. Can you bring back that daylight picture? Boxers clicked and the satellite image reappeared. You can almost see it here, LeBron said, pointing. And there's a road that runs just behind the fence. Doobie's truck is smaller than yours, though, and it barely fit through. That's okay, Jonathan said. It's a way in. It's a way out, too, Boxer said. I'm not thrilled with the open field run, but it's doable if we stage the expedition. I'll come with you if you like, LeBron said. I can show you the opening in the fence. No, Don snapped. You'll do no such thing. Sometimes there was only one right answer to a controversial question, and in this case, it was obvious. I'm with Don on this one, Jonathan said as he closed his laptop and slipped it back into his ruck. I made a promise that you would not be placed in jeopardy. I'm sticking by that. You've already helped us more than you know. Now it's time for us to go. Boxers had already begun to pack up the Raven's electronics. There has to be a way we can help. We're in it this deep. It's like it's too late to quit. Boxers shot Jonathan a death glare. In the past, Jonathan had included people he probably shouldn't have in the execution of O-300 missions, and almost always with massive complications. Big Guy and I have done this gig too many times as a duet to expand now. He extended his hand. Really, though, I appreciate the offer. He shrugged into his ruck. Suppose we see something that shouldn't be, Don asked. The source of the question startled Jonathan. Clearly, that showed in his face. Watching is different than getting shot, she explained. And a boy's been kidnapped. I can't stand by and just let that happen. Do you have a cell phone number or something? Boxer's glare screamed, I'll kill you if you do. Cell numbers were traceable and therefore sensitive. But the offer was one that intrigued Jonathan. They were working blind tonight. An extra set of eyes on the outside was a damned good idea. Tell you what I'll do, he said. Scorpion! Only boxers could put so much menace in a single word. Relax, big guy. Jonathan worked his way back out of his ruck and dug into its main pocket, from which he produced two standard, commercially available cheap walkie-talkies, the kind anyone could pick up in the mall. A well-learned lesson over the years preached that sometimes, as the shit hit the fan, the simplest technology worked best. He turned them both on and keyed the mic for one of them. The feedback squeal told him that they were functioning. He handed one of the radios to Don. Just push that button to talk, he said. But please don't do it unless it's really, really important. I don't want to be sneaking up on somebody only to have your voice blast through the night telling me that the stars have come out. Follow me? Don turned the radio over in her hands, examining it. I understand. Be sure you do, Boxers growled. Seeing their fearful reaction, he added, I'm nowhere near as nice as my little friend.
He shouldered his ruck as if it weighed nothing, and with the suitcase of Raven controls in one hand and the empty aircraft sack in the other, he left. He means no harm, Jonathan said to the family, but please do us all a favor and don't piss him off. So what happened? Graham asked. He examined Jolene's wounds as best he could without the use of his hands. She wasn't particularly cut up, but man, was she bruised. Her left eye had swollen shut, and her jaw was swollen. Who did this to you? Who do you think? She spoke through nearly clenched teeth. I mean, which one of them? Does it matter? He took a few seconds to answer. Yes, it does. Let's just say... They took turns. Why? he asked. You don't know anything. Jolaine closed her eyes against an obvious spasm of pain. I kept telling them that, she said. It wasn't what they wanted to hear. How did they get you? They were transferring me to a foster home, Graham said. They killed everybody but me. Until he'd said the words, he'd blocked the images of those nice people's murders from his mind. He couldn't even remember their names. I'm sorry, Jolene said. That's not right. That's why I had to tell those assholes something, Graham said. This thing has killed too many people. It's hurt too many people. It has to stop. Jolene gave a wry chuckle. <laughs> I don't know what their verification procedure is, but once they find out, my money says the end will be nearer than we want. You're giving up, Graham said. You can't do that. She rolled her eyes. Come on, Graham. Sometimes reality has to trump hope. It's freezing in here. Give it time, Graham said. This is nothing. He walked around to stare into Jolaine's face. You can't go pessimist on me, Jolaine. Not now. We've got time. To do what? I don't know. God damn it, I don't freaking know, all right? Something. Our only other option is nothing, and that one sucks. Jolaine fought another spasm. I'm sorry I got you into this, Graham said. And I'm sorry I didn't protect you better. Graham kept walking to keep his feet from going numb. Why did Mom set me up? he asked. He spoke the words without emotion. Now who's being pessimistic? I'm serious, Jolaine. She gave me that code knowing that people would come to get me. Do you think she knew it would come to this? Jolaine inhaled, hocked once, and spat a wad of blood. I think she was scared, she said. I think she'd been shot, and she was just trying to do something. But you said that the code was for some kind of bomb. Actually, I said I thought that's what it might be. Do you still? Another spasm, and she didn't even try to speak. She just nodded. Graham stopped pacing and turned as it dawned on him. And these guys are terrorists, he said. Mom wanted them to have the code. That makes my parents terrorists. Jolaine scowled as well as her battered features would allow as she considered what he'd just said. Oh, my God. Linus, the librarian in Graham's head, was moving like crazy to arrange all the logic cards so he could read them. She didn't set me up for torture, Graham said. She set me up to help terrorists. How was that for a shit sickle? How could she do that? How could they do that? Dad had to be in on it too, right? Well, maybe not the part that directly involved Graham. Dad had already been killed by then. But the rest of it... The terrorism stuff. He paced again. He was thinking about his parents. The people who had brought him into the world, wiped his butt, and preached right and wrong. He knew he should be sad for their injuries. But all he could feel was anger. Holy shit, Jolaine. How could they? I'm really sorry. Wait, Graham said. No, 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 that doesn't make sense either. Why would the terrorists attack and kill them if they were all on the same side? Maybe Uncle Sam found out, Jolaine offered, but her tone sounded more like thinking out loud than forwarding an actual theory. No, 
Graham snapped. It was a stupid theory. You heard them yelling to each other. That wasn't English. No one yelled, freeze, FBI, or whatever they say in real life. He stopped pacing again. Gregory, he said. What? Gregory. That was the name of the man in the front door. Gregory. He kept saying it. I'm sorry they know. I'm sorry they know, remember? Jolaine seemed to search her memory. Okay. The people we ran away from were the people who knew. Knew what? Jolaine asked. She looked like she was having difficulty keeping up. I don't know. Jesus, how could I know? Graham, I'm not even sure I know what you're talking about anymore. He wasn't either. He was trying to think his way through a problem. Finally, Linus dealt his last, most important card. Oh, shit, Graham said. There's another set of people trying to kill us. Who? I don't know who, but I know why. Jolaine saw it, too. To keep these guys from getting the codes. Exactly, Graham said. His sense of triumph over solving a problem was quashed two seconds later by the obvious rejoinder. He shot a panicked look to Jolaine. They won't bother to torture, she said, connecting the dots for herself. They just want to kill you. In a rush, he realized the truth of Jolaine's earlier words. Sometimes... Reality really did trump hope. Tears pressed his eyes as he faced Jolaine. We really are going to die tonight, aren't we? The door to the freezer slammed open. Teddy stood there with three of his friends. His right hand held a sledgehammer by its neck. His eyes showed murder. Chapter 27 Jonathan almost regretted his decision not to let LeBron show him the clearing in the woods. Driving with the lights off and NVGs in place, it took two passes to find the spot. There it is, Jonathan said, finally. It wasn't the clearing he'd seen so much as the tire indentations that led to it. Once spotted, it was obvious. Either they're not the only ones, or they come here a lot, he said. You ask me, every inch of this godforsaken town is worn thin. Boxer said. He threw the transmission into park. You're sure you want to go with full rucks? He said. Jonathan shrugged. It's the neighborhood. If gangbangers decide to break in, I don't care if they take possession of the Raven. But I wouldn't sleep well if we gave them explosives and detonators. Call it urban renewal, big guy said, and he opened his door. Full soldier, Jonathan said. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into. That was his term for full body armor, complete with chest plate and Kevlar helmet. It was unwieldy and heavy as hell. Boxers pointed to any opportunity he could find not to wear it, but the lack of pushback this time told Jonathan that he saw the risks, too. When they were fully kitted up, they each carried their preferred rifles, Jonathan a suppressed M27, and Boxers a suppressed HK417, and a suppressed 4.6mm HKMP7, holstered on their left thighs. Boxers also dangled a Mossberg 12-gauge with a breaching barrel under his arm. No suppressor there, just a big bang. With their four-tube night vision, the night had become day. Jonathan tied his gear in tight to limit any rattle, and then he was ready to go. You all set? Born ready, Boxers said. Jonathan turned the knob on his radio and said, Mother Hen, Scorpion, we're going hot and we're on Vox. A copy, she said. Do a good job. Jonathan smiled at that. He'd scolded her once for wishing them good luck when they were stepping out on an op because, as he said, luck was a thing to be managed, not victimized by. Since then, she'd been struggling to find the right phrase. For Jonathan, do a good job was just fine. When they arrived at the fence, Jonathan understood why he had missed the presence of the hole. It had been wired up that well. Think there's a little OCD in young LeBron? Boxers whispered. It took less than two minutes to undo the patch and lift the section away. Jonathan assessed the size of the opening. You'd better be careful, big guy. Turns out you're bigger than their truck. He pulled an infrared chem light from a side pouch on his ruck, snapped it, shook it to bring it to life, and then dropped it on the ground to mark the makeshift gate. Chances were good that there'd be a lot more activity swirling around them on the way out, than there was on the way in. He didn't want to be feeling their way along the fence in the dark, looking for the back door. 
They approached the black side of the building as a single shadow gliding through the dark, moving slowly and deliberately so as not to make unnecessary noise. Jonathan scanned continuously left to right, walking forward, while boxers moved in the same direction, walking backward, scanning their six o'clock for bad guys. Contact at twelve o'clock, Jonathan whispered. The two guards stood at their stations, flanking the back door. The embers of their cigarettes flared in his NVGs. MP7, he said. The 4.6-millimeter round of the MP7 was a devastating bullet when shot well. Barely wider than a BB, it left the muzzle at over 2,400 feet per second, but because it was so small, it made far less noise than the larger, faster 5.56-millimeter round from his M27. With the suppressor in place, there was no discernible muzzle flash, and the noise was less than that of a ladyfinger firecracker. Jonathan didn't know how Heckler and Coke continued to get it so right every time in the manufacture of weapons. All of the team's long guns and MP7s were fitted with infrared laser sights that cast a beam through the dark that only they could see thanks to their NVGs. In Jonathan's world, fair fights were for losers. I'm right, you're left, he said. Roger. On zero, Jonathan said as he settled his laser on his target's forehead. Three... Two, one. He didn't bother to say the word, because it was the cadence that counted. Their weapons fired in unison, and their targets dropped in unison. Their bodies unplugged from their brains. Two for sleeping, Jonathan said for Venice's benefit. They resumed their fore-and-aft advancing configuration as they closed the distance to the rear wall. Jonathan didn't bother to check the guards for pulses. The spatter told him everything he needed to know. Okay, big guy, you're up. Jonathan pivoted to cover the rear, their only exposed side, now that they were up against the building. While boxers wrapped a loop of detonating cord around the electrical box serving the freezer unit inside. Detonating cord was every operator's best friend. Essentially a tube of PETN, an explosive with a detonation velocity that exceeded 20,000 feet per second. A coil or two could drop a hundred-year-old oak. Just an inch or two would make ridiculously quick work of an electrical cable. While Big Guy did his thing, Jonathan holstered the MP7 and brought his M27 to his shoulder and continually scanned left to right and back again, 180 to 180. Thirty seconds later, he heard Big Guy's voice in his ear. Done. Redundant electronic fuse set on zero, then a hundred milliseconds. When the stakes were high, redundancy reigned as king. In this case... Boxer's first detonator would blow the instant he pushed the button on his controller. If it malfunctioned, then the backup would initiate one-tenth of a second later. Ready to advance? Jonathan asked. He fought the urge to look at Boxer's because Big Guy posed no threat. At this stage, all he cared about were threats. Ready to advance. Advancing to red. In recent years, the special operations community had moved away from the color-coded sides but it was in Jonathan's DNA. White was front, black was back, and red was right. Compass points were far more precise, but who had a compass on them all the time? They reassumed the same back-to-back -back posture as they approached the rear side, Jonathan leading and boxers following. As they approached the end of the back wall, Jonathan said, Corner. That expanded boxers' area of responsibility to a 270-degree radius, as Jonathan concentrated on the threat that lay directly around the turn. Advancing right, Jonathan said, and he turned the corner. His senses told him that there had to be guards here. It didn't make sense otherwise. Why put sentries on some doors, yet not on others? Since the loading dock was elevated and the doors inset, it was difficult to get a line of sight. Advancing blind now, he moved much slower than before. He heard voices from up on the deck. He didn't understand the language, but they seemed to be chatting, unaware of danger. Jonathan eased away from the wall for a better look. He whispered, I've got two more targets. They were standing next to each other, which, to Jonathan's perspective, put them in the same plane. I've got a bad angle, Jonathan said. Swing out and tell me what you see. He felt boxers pivot, swinging his rifle in a horizontal arc over his head. I've got a left target if you want me to take it, he said. That would be the farthest from you. On zero, then, Jonathan said. He counted the cadence again, with the same result. 
except this time, because of the oblique angle and the backlight, he saw the aura of simultaneous brain sprays. Both targets were neutralized. Jonathan had lost count over the years of the number of lives he'd taken, but it never got easier. To point a gun at Jonathan was a capital offense that earned the perpetrator a guilt-free execution. But to die a standing sentry, the most basic of soldierly duties, bore no honor or fanfare. In dispatching those, he always felt a burden of sadness. Nothing he couldn't handle, but a sadness nonetheless. With the lifeless bodies collapsed on the deck, Jonathan and Boxers moved together up the steps to the loading dock, where Boxers affixed the second charge of debt cord to the electrical service. While he did that, Jonathan moved to the personnel door next to the roll-up overhead to see if it was unlocked. It was not. I'm going to set a breaching charge, he said. That meant pressing a GPC, a general-purpose charge, which consisted of a wad of C4 high explosive triggered by a tail of debt cord, into a three-inch trail where the door lock met the jam. Typically, Jonathan preferred old-fashioned fuse, OFF, for the GPC. But to stay in concert with the charges boxers had already set, he inserted dual electronic initiators into the detonating cord. Jonathan asked, Are you... An agonized scream ruined the night. Teddy might have been on rails. He glided so quickly across the room. The short sledgehammer raised. His eyes were focused and hot. He seemed unaware of anything or anyone but Graham, who remained frozen in place. Teddy was still moving when he swung the sledgehammer like a baseball bat. Graham closed his eyes as the head of the hammer shattered his left elbow. The jolt of agony somehow unplugged his nervous system, and he collapsed in a heap onto the icy tile. Remember, Teddy said, this is your deal. This is what you ask for. With that, he launched a kick to Graham's belly. As he doubled up on his side, another kick nailed him in the kidney. Someone was screaming. He'd just realized that the screams were his own when the building shook with an explosion and blackness fell. The splintered jam was still burning when Jonathan and Boxer squirted through the door. As was their tradition, Jonathan went in first and swept low and right, while Boxers swept high and left. Their IR laser sights drew crisscrossing lines through the lingering smoke of the explosions. The smoke confused the NVGs, potentially obscuring targets behind a veil of heated gases. Jonathan and Boxers moved as one, in a crouch, their weapons at the ready and pressed against their shoulders. As their ears recovered from the concussion of the blasts, hearing protection could protect only so much, they heard the sounds of confused bedlam. Shouting voices combined with more howls of agony. Most of the shouting was in the same dialect that he'd heard from the guards. The noise is coming from two o'clock, Boxers said. I agree. They pivoted together a couple of points to the right, and continued to advance. Jonathan saw movement in the smoke, but before he could react, Boxer's rifle barked twice, and the silhouette dropped. Big Guy had switched to his cannon, the 7.62 mm HK-417. Whatever his bullets touched instantly joined a parallel universe. Even with a suppressor attached, the gunshot rocked the building. With stealth no longer relevant, Jonathan holstered his MP-7 and lifted his M-27 from its sling. Similar in construction and weight to the venerable M4, but vastly superior in its performance, particularly in adverse circumstances. It wasn't the perfect weapon for close-quarters battle, but it felt like an old friend. Because it was chambered in 5.56 millimeter, the people Jonathan killed wouldn't be quite as dead as the people boxers killed, but it would be close. With their presence known, they stepped up the pace. The noise and the darkness had no doubt rattled the enemy— but the effects could only last so long. Close-in rifle fire had the tendency to focus the attention of the shot at, and in a few seconds, if these guys had any clue what they were doing, they were going to mount some kind of defense. Threat left, Boxer said. Jonathan pivoted in time to see one of three approaching men drop when Boxer shot him. Jonathan took out a second, but the third disappeared behind the wall of an inner room that Jonathan recognized from the drawings as the meat freezer. Shit, Jonathan spat. He was about to pursue the attacker when another scream echoed through the factory. That's coming from inside the freezer, he said. The door's on the other side, Boxer said. Another scream. Leave him alone, a female voice yelled. 
in English. We'll use the back door, Jonathan said. Graham thought he'd been knocked unconscious. The darkness came so suddenly and was so absolute, he couldn't imagine another scenario. But the pain kept coming, lightning bolts of agony that seemed to have no focus. Everything hurt, and he couldn't breathe. Another explosion. Gunshot? It sounded for all the world like the rifles that had become so much a part of his life these past days. The assholes all started shouting in Chechen. He couldn't understand the words, but they were the sounds of panic, and they were accompanied by quick, heavy movement that likewise seemed to have no focus. Someone either kicked him or fell on him, and that really lit up his injuries. His scream hurt his throat. Two more sharp explosions, maybe three. Definitely guns. More shouting, and someone grabbed him by his shoulder and lifted. Jesus, God! Leave him alone! Jolaine yelled. In darkness, he couldn't be sure, but the heavy thud and the grunt that followed, he was pretty sure they'd hit her. Amid a lot of discussion he couldn't understand, Graham was passed among several people. In the movies, people in excruciating pain passed out and got relief. He was ready to live in a movie. The freezer was a room within a cavern, roughly twelve feet square, and it had both a front door and a back door, presumably to allow the free flow of cow carcasses in and out without creating a traffic jam. Jonathan remembered the detail from the plans Venice had sent them. He sent up a prayer that the drawing be correct. Through the NVGs, Jonathan saw the hinges before he saw the latch, and then he saw the massive padlock that had been placed over the latch assembly. Shit, he said. Out of my way, boss, Boxer said. He had a GPC in his fist with a detonator already dangling from the deck cord fuse. Five second delay, he said, so we'll be inside in ten. Jonathan pivoted to make room for Big Guy, and he scanned the inside of the factory for more targets. He saw movement in the shadows to his right, and he fired a long burst, got a yelp of pain in return. Fire in the hole, Boxer said. Jonathan turned away from the door and stooped to become a human soccer ball. The blast made the building bounce and turned the heavy freezer door into a rectangular hole. All right, let's... Automatic weapons opened up from behind them. From the direction of the loading dock through which they'd entered. Boxers coughed and fell. Oh, shit! God damn it! Jonathan felt a stab of panic. Are you hit? Damn straight I'm hit. God damn it! Boxers opened up with his 417, raking the area where the shots had come from. Go, he said. Get the freaking PC. I'll kill these assholes myself. God damn it! Jonathan's mind raced to push the panic away. Mission first, he told himself. He had to tend to the PCs. I'll be back for you, big guy, he said. And then he slipped in through the newly opened door. The opening was blocked with rolling racks and assorted shit, and the floor was covered with ice. Through his green artificial light, Jonathan saw a scrum of activity ahead as beefy men tried to find their way to meaningful activity in the dark. Everyone he saw carried a long gun of some sort, and at least one had a sidearm. Through the tangle of dangling meat hooks, he had difficulty separating the PCs from the bad guys until he heard yet another howl of pain, and he focused in on the kid who was being manhandled by one of the thugs. PC-1 is in the grasp, he said over the air. Protocol mattered, even when your best friend had been shot. He let the M-27 fall back against its sling and drew his MP-7 again. Switching to hollow point on the MP-7. He released the nearly full mag of ball ammo and switched it out with a thirty-round mag of hollow points that he pulled from a pouch on his vest. The advantage of hollow point ammo lay in the fact that the mushrooming effect of the hollow point expended much of the round's energy on impact, thus making it less likely to overpenetrate and hit a good guy who might be standing behind the bad guy target. He could tell that they were getting organized up there, and they had come to grips with the fact that their space had been breached. Two of the men had opened fire in Jonathan's general direction, but in their darkness they didn't have the visual frame of reference to even come close. He needed to disorient them even more. Jonathan opened a Velcro fastener on his ballistic vest and removed a cylindrical stun grenade. Filled with magnesium and ammonium perchlorate stuffed into a cardboard tube, the grenade was designed to temporarily blind and deafen anyone within a few yard radius, buying a few precious seconds for rescuers to work their magic. Squeezing the safety spoon, Jonathan pulled the pin, then lobbed the grenade in the general vicinity of the bad guys. Flashbang away, he said. 
He turned away, closed his eyes, and pressed his hands against his ears. Two seconds later, the building shook again. Even with his eyes closed and his head turned, Jonathan could see the blood vessels in his eyelids from the flash. One second after the blast, while the disorientation was still pure, Jonathan moved on the bad guys. Behind him, fully automatic fire continued to rip the silence from outside the freezer. Engaging multiple targets, Boxer said, before an extended burst of gunfire. Hearing Big Guy's voice calmed Jonathan, reminded him that he had a half dozen targets of his own to engage. Hostages, get down! Hostages, get down! Jonathan yelled. Get the hell down! Predictably, two of the thugs swung their weapon at the sound of Jonathan's voice and opened fire. Jonathan dropped to a knee and smoked the one on the left with three rounds to his chest. The one on the right dove for cover and saved his own life. God damn it! Jonathan scooted to the left because some brainiac had done a study a while back that demonstrated that, absent evidence to the contrary, people assumed movement to their own left, Jonathan's right, and he wanted to be unpredictable. Outside, Boxer's gun battle raged on. As he moved, Jonathan's laser beam stabbed a shooter in the ear. Jonathan judged the distance at fifteen feet, ten feet short of the distance the sight was zeroed to, so he lowered the beam to the top of the guy's shoulder and pressed the trigger. The head exploded. Two down. Boxer's gunfight raged beyond the freezer door. From the sound of it, he'd employed his 417, and he was not being shy in his application of firepower. I will shoot the boy! A man yelled from nearby. Put down your gun or I will shoot the boy! Had the bad guy not shouted out like that, Jonathan would likely not have seen him. As it was, the target was maybe ten feet away and facing in the wrong direction, presenting his back as he looked toward a direction where Jonathan had never been. The target held PC-1 in front of him as cover, his elbow cinched under the boy's chin, the boy's arm flopped oddly, clearly broken. Seconds ticked. At this range, hollow point notwithstanding, a head shot or a center of mass shot would probably overpenetrate and wound the PC. That was not acceptable. Moving quickly, yet silently, Jonathan slipped the MP7 into its holster and drew his K-bar knife from its scabbard on his left shoulder. Uncle Sam had tried a lot of different fighting blades since the K-bar was first introduced in 1941, but as far as Jonathan was concerned, none had even approached the elegance and raw lethality of the wooden-handled Marine Corps favorite. Jonathan held the knife as an extension of his fist, blade facing forward, hilt against his thumb, and he closed the distance in just a few strides. The fact that the bad guy had a full head of hair made it so much easier. Jonathan grabbed a fistful of hair at the crown and pulled back just as he thrust the razor-sharp steel blade into the base of his skull at a thirty-degree angle, effectively separating the man's brain from the rest of his body. If he didn't die instantly, he'd be dead soon. Either way, score another for the good guys. As the man collapsed, Jonathan caught Graham at his middle and lowered him to the floor. Graham felt unhinged, completely disoriented. So much sound and light, so much pain. Violence swirled from everywhere and without meaning. I will kill the boy, Teddy yelled in his ear. And then a few seconds later, Teddy made a horrible sound and collapsed, bringing Graham with him. And then Graham felt someone lower him gently to the floor. I'm here to take you home, the stranger said. Lie on the floor and try to be invisible. Graham was not prepared for the kind tone, and he certainly was not prepared for the kind words. While the manhandling was gentler, it was no less painful. Ten thousand questions formed in his head. Before he could form one well enough to ask, he'd been placed on the floor, and the stranger let go of him. Lying on his stomach, he imagined himself dissolving into the concrete floor, becoming so small as to be an oil slick, not a target at all. Then a bullet whipped past his ear and slammed into the floor behind him. Chapter 28 Big guy, I need a status report, Jonathan said. As he spoke, he toured the bodies on the floor. All six were dead, or close enough to not be a threat. I'm engaged with three op four, Boxer's voice said in his ear. Two gunshots fired in quick succession out beyond the freezer. Make it two. The remainders are better at hiding than shooting. Graham and Joe Lane, stay down, Jonathan commanded. He couldn't see them, couldn't verify that they were even alive still. But with their threats neutralized, 
They could fend for themselves for a few minutes. Jonathan headed back for the door they'd created, back to join in Boxer's War. He'd nearly made it to the opening when it filled with Big Guy's massive silhouette. Four more baddies are sound asleep, Big Guy said. He listed to the side, but Jonathan couldn't see any blood. Jesus, are you okay? He said. No, I'm not okay, Boxer said. Bastards freaking shot me. Where? Where are you hit? Boxers pointed to a spot in the center of his chest. Right here, he said, where I'm supposed to have a heart. He grinned. My vest stopped it. Jonathan's shoulders sagged as the tension drained. They had MP5s, Big Guy said. Thank God for little nine mic mics. He looked past Jonathan to survey the carnage inside the freezer. Whoa, you've been busy too. Jonathan's head filled with a thousand things he wanted to say, a hundred prayers he wanted to offer up to thank God for Boxer's survival. After dropping only a beat, he said, Those vests aren't cheap, you know, and now I have to replace that one. Cry me a river, billionaire boy. Where do we stand? Jonathan switched out his partially empty mag for a full one and reholstered the MP7. You take PC-1, Jonathan said. Be careful. I think that arm's pretty badly broken. Everyone who served in the unit had decent combat medic skills. Jonathan was no exception. But Boxers was particularly gifted. Where injuries were obvious, Big Guy was always the best choice. Jonathan turned back toward the room. Graham, he called. Speak up. For five or six seconds, he heard only silence, and his heart sank. Here, the kid said. Jolaine Cage. Right here, she said. She lay on the floor on her side, her hands tied in front of her. Her voice sounded weak. Jonathan walked over to her. He had to pull a corpse out of the way by its shirt to stoop far enough to speak softly. Hi, Jolaine. We're here to take you home. The H word, home, was one of the most powerful words in the universe. He never tired of watching the realization dawn on the victims he rescued. That was the money shot, the few seconds that made all the rest of it worthwhile. Popping chem lights, Boxer said as he cracked a luminescent stick and shook it. When the stick shone green, he rolled it across the floor to Jonathan. Now the hostages were no longer blind, but seeing didn't necessarily put their minds at ease. Jonathan and Boxers both wore black hoods that revealed only their eyes, and with the NVGs in place, even those did not show. My name is Scorpion, Jonathan said. My friend is named Big Guy. Who, who are you? Jolaine stammered. He caught the slurred speech. Just friends, Jonathan said. He examined her arms and the ropes that bound them. The loops were sadistically tight. You're going to see a big sharp knife, he said. I'm going to cut you loose, so don't panic or start jerking around. I literally could shave with the edge of this thing, and I don't need either of us getting cut. As he put the K-bar into use, he hoped that she couldn't see the blood that remained on the blade. Whoever tied her up was an expert. Rather than wrapping her limbs in one continuous loop as amateurs typically did, her torturer used six knots, which ensured that they wouldn't loosen until they were supposed to. How did you know? Jolaine asked. From behind, he heard Graham's yelps of pain, along with Boxer's soothing tone. I work in a weird business, Jonathan said. So Scorpion is a code name. Or my parents were really twisted. I won't tell you which. With her hands free, Jolaine tried to sit up, but Jonathan put a hand on her shoulder to keep her down. How hurt are you? I think they broke my jaw, she said, and I know they broke a tooth. I don't think I'm bleeding out anywhere. The cogence of her response led Jonathan to believe her. Can you feel your hands? They'd been tied so tightly that there might have been nerve damage. Jolaine wiggled her fingers. They're tingly, but they work. Jonathan cupped his hand under her biceps and lifted. Let's see if we can get you on your feet. How's Graham? Big guy, how's PC-1? I'm splitting him up. He'll live, but his arm needs surgery. Jolaine moved carefully as she rose to her feet. She wobbled a little, reminding Jonathan of a newborn colt, but then she seemed to find her balance. I'm okay, she said. You called him PC-1. Are you so calm? Jonathan recognized the acronym for Special Operations Command, but he opted to ignore the question. 
Test out those legs, he said. They're about to get some serious use. He turned his attention to boxers and Graham. Is he about packaged? PC-1's arm had been stabilized with a ladder splint, a length of bendable wire that consisted of two long edges connected by cross pieces that together resembled a long ladder and about a half mile of cling wrap. Boxers was in the process of putting on the finishing touches to the immobilization by binding the splinted arm to the boy's chest with another long length of cling. One more minute. From behind, Jonathan heard the clattering sound of a gun's bolt being charged. He snatched his M27 to his shoulder and spun 180 degrees as he dropped to a knee. No, Jolene said. Don't. It's me. She held out an MP5 as if it were a peace offering. God damn it, Jonathan snapped. What the hell? I want a weapon, Jolaine said. You might be John Wayne and the cavalry, but I still want a means to protect myself. She's really good with it, Graham said. It was the first time Jonathan had heard him speak. Generally, it was a mistake to let PCs arm themselves, but Jonathan weighed this time as an exception. Given her past experience, an extra trigger might not be a bad idea. Don't confuse the good guys and the bad guys, he said. I'm set, Boxers announced. Can you walk, kid, or do I need to carry you? I'm okay, Graham said. His right arm cradled his shattered left as if it were a baby. We just need to go slow. Yeah, right, Jonathan didn't say. Here's how it's going to work, he said. We're going to become a human snake. I'm the head, big guy is the tail, and you two are the belly in the middle. Follow in lockstep. Do everything I tell you to do the instant I tell you to do it, and we'll get you safely out of here. Do you know anything about my parents? Graham asked. Are they both dead? Jonathan hesitated and let him have it. Yes, I'm sorry. It would have been wrong to lie. Now let's make sure you don't join them. Let's move. Jonathan led the tiny parade to the freezer door. We raised a hand to stop them while he peeked out and swept the space with his muzzle. Clear, he said. From behind, he heard boxers say, Put your safety on, young lady and keep the muzzle pointed at the floor. I'll tell you if and when we need your help. Jonathan hadn't realized the extent of Boxer's firefight out there. The walls and floor had been chewed to hell. One of the attackers had gotten disturbingly close. He turned a hard right and started back toward the loading dock. They were in the middle of the open space when the throwaway radio broke squelch. Um, Scorpion? LeBron's voice said. Were you expecting people by parachute? Anton Datsik continued to be impressed by the resources that the American government could make available when they were motivated. He'd requested parachutes for his team, an airplane, and a pilot who knew not to speak. All things were available to him within two hours. Dangling from his harness, watching through night vision as the ground approached beneath his feet, his only worry was whether he was too late. With about 300 feet to go before impact, he checked to his right and to his left, to make sure his team was still together. They were, of course. They were six in total, plenty enough to confront a bunch of Chechen amateurs. Dotsik was gratified to see the cars still parked behind the factory, interpreting it as a sign that the interlopers had not yet accomplished their mission. Once the code was revealed, there would be no need for the enemy to stick around. At slightly under one hundred feet, he saw two dead bodies sprawled aside the entry door on the loading dock. Startled and distracted, he nearly missed nailing his stand-up landing. On the ground, with the chute under control, he said to his team on the radio, Gather on me. It is a complication. Jonathan watched from a window at the rear of the building, the closest exit to the expedition that would get them out of here. At first, Jonathan saw only two invaders land from the sky. Their technique was perfect, and even from this distance, he could see their night vision and their weaponry. This was trouble. I've got two, he said over the radio. I've got four, Boxer said. He was watching through the loading dock windows. Jonathan's two dumped their parachutes and scurried to the right. Mine are coming your way, big guy. I see them. Let me know what you want to do. It took all of two seconds for Jonathan to decide their next move. Disengage, he said. We're going out the rear. It made no sense to start a firefight especially when the enemy seemed competent. Truth be told, those parachutes unnerved him a little. For all he knew, they could be a souped-up team of feds coming in to lend them a hand. He doubted that, but you never knew. 
Opening fire on the unknown without provocation was always a bad idea. He knew that boxers would disagree, but Big Guy was first and foremost a soldier, and he knew when an order was an order. When they were all gathered by the back door, Jonathan delivered his instructions. I don't know who these guys are, and they clearly haven't seen us yet. We're going to head out this door and move carefully to a car we have stashed about a hundred yards from here. There are a couple of dead guys on the other side of the door. Don't freak out. Graham, I know you hurt, and this is going to be tough, but I need you to keep your good hand on my rucksack. Do not let go. As long as I can feel the tug, I know you're still with me. If they're shooting, do exactly what I tell you. If I tell you to drop to the ground, you become one with the dirt. Do you understand? The kid's eyes grew huge, and he nodded. I need a verbal response. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, Jolaine. She looked up. Do not engage with your firearm unless we are engaged first. If it comes to that, remember, the only ammo you have is what's left in your one mag. I'd make them count if I were you, and watch your background. Every miss goes somewhere, and I don't want to be responsible for any collateral damage. I understand, she said. Done, Jonathan said. Mother Hen, we're moving. A copy, Venice. Hand on my ruck, Graham. He felt the tug. Big guy, IR lasers off. They've got night vision, too. Here we go. Jonathan pushed the door open and led the short parade out into the open and into the night. He pivoted to face right as he confronted the threat at their three o'clock, using his body as a shield for PC-1, and walking sideways in a kind of bastardized grapevine step. He glanced left periodically to stay in line with the IR glow stick he dropped at the hole in the fence. All it would take at this point would be for one of the bad guys to glance their way, and they'd be made. All advantage of operating in the dark lost. His one advantage over the Op-4 was their use of the outdated two-tube NVGs, the tunnel vision they created all but eliminated detection of the periphery. To capitalize on that, Jonathan led the way at a painfully slow pace. Particularly in reduced light conditions, the human eye was much more likely to capture motion than it was to capture a single image. Throw in the fact that both his PCs were essentially blind, and one of them was crippled, it was a bad idea to run. And then... Running became a very good idea. People have already been here, Tatsik said to his assembled team in Russian. See the bodies at the door? What does that mean? a team member asked. His name was Leonid, and while always aggressive, he never seemed very bright to Datsik. I do not know, Datsik replied, but this looks like professional work. The fact that we do not hear continuing gunfire means that we are either just on time or perhaps too late. The enemy of our enemy is our friend, is he not? Leonid asked. Datsik had learned years ago that all surprises were inherently bad. If the U.S. was sending a team here for action, Philip Baxter should have told him. And if the shooters were not Americans, then who else would want to kill the Chechens? We need to enter carefully, he said. We don't know. Look, Leonid said, to the right. Snatching his Kalashnikov to his shoulder... Dotsik turned and saw what appeared to be two American Special Forces operators, one huge and one of average height and girth, moving slowly away from the factory, with two other people, a lady and a boy. Beyond them, Dotsik saw the glow of an infrared marker on the ground near the woods line. His team assumed shooting positions and prepared to engage. Chapter 29 to run would mean turning their backs on their enemy. Jonathan had no choice but to engage. We're made, Jonathan said. Graham and Jolaine, on the ground, now! Graham yelled as Jonathan pushed him to the deck, face first, but Jonathan didn't care. He didn't have time to. Jolaine likewise dropped to the ground, but she assumed a prone shooter's position. Jonathan and boxers both dropped to a knee, weapons up and ready. Everybody, hold your fire! Jonathan snapped. Are you friggin' kidding me? Boxers said. Hold your fire, Jonathan said again. They were out in the open, with zero cover, and they were outnumbered by professional shooters. We don't know who they are. I know they're pointing a goddamn gun at me. As we are them, but you'll notice they haven't fired either. For all we know, they're good guys. That would explain the pigs I saw flying over frozen hell this morning, Boxers said. A voice called from the other side. 
Put your weapons down or we will open fire. The thick Russian accent did nothing to soothe Jonathan's doubts. Who are you? Jonathan shouted. Does not matter, the Russian said. You are outgunned. Oh, for Christ's sake, boss, boxers growled. It's Ivan. Are we really doing this? Ivan was their generic term for any Russian, any Eastern European, for that matter. Full auto, Jonathan said, softly enough to be heard only through his microphone. If it comes to it, I'll rake him left to right, you rake him right to left. If this went hot, the best they could hope for was to be hit in their body armor. Drop your weapons, the Russians shouted again. One of the operators on the Russians' right started to pull away from their skirmish line to move on Jonathan's left flank. Don't move! Jonathan yelled. Get down now, or I will open fire. The commander on the other side barked something in Russian, and the flanker pulled back in. This is some weird shit, Boxer said. Who are these guys? We're not putting our weapons down, Jonathan said to the other commander. For the same reason that you are not. If you shoot, we'll shoot. If you don't, we won't. You can trust us, the Russian said. Easy words for a Russian who just parachuted into the middle of my operation, Jonathan said. Would you like me to make some friggin' tea? Boxers said. In the distance, Jonathan could hear the first tone of approaching sirens. Leash is getting short, boss. Tell you what, Jonathan called to the other side. If you're here for what I think you are, everything's fine. Your enemies are dead, and your codes were not revealed. You can go home and sleep well. Meanwhile, my friends and I are going to walk away from you. Under his breath, he said to his team, Nobody move till I tell you. Do you have the boy? The Russian yelled. Twenty bucks says this does not end well, Boxers mumbled. Jonathan ran the options through his head. The approach of sirens made quick action essential, and he couldn't very well lie about something Ivan was about to see with his own eyes. I do, he said. The Russian paused. Okay, he said. You leave, but go slowly. Give me no reason to shoot you. He wants the kid, Jonathan whispered. Graham groaned. Please, no, he begged. I want this to stop. Wanting's not the same thing as getting, Jonathan said. Boxer said, they're waiting till we stand up, and then they're going to take their shot. I think we should go first. Not yet, Jonathan said. The two forces were separated by maybe seventy-five yards of open field. Napoleonic face-to-face -face battlefield tactics had faded away a long, long time ago. Jonathan saw movement in the night beyond the Russians. Seconds later, the motion revealed itself to be a dark panel truck, and it was moving way too fast. It skidded a turn into the long driveway, blasted through the chain-link gate, and raced toward them. Two of the op four turned to face the new threat, while the others kept their weapons trained on Jonathan and his team. Odds will never be better, boss. Not yet. Shit. The truck skidded to a halt a good sixty to seventy feet before hitting the assembled Russians, therefore no doubt preventing the driver from getting seriously ventilated. The driver's door flew open, and a female voice yelled, Don't shoot! Nobody shoot! As the driver emerged... Jonathan recognized her right away as Marianne Rose. Oh, man, Boxer said with a laugh. Ain't this some shit? Oh, my God, Jolaine said. That's Agent Rhodes. Marianne approached the Russians at a run, her arms extended from her sides and her hands exposed. Nobody shoot, she called. This is over. This is over. No one needs to shoot anyone. Jonathan could vaguely hear the Russian commander speaking to his troops, presumably translating her words. Marianne passed through the Russian skirmish line to take a position between both parties. She extended her hands like a traffic cop stopping traffic in both directions. Please, she said, put your weapons down. The police are coming, and we need to be out of here. Jonathan broke his aim, but kept his M-27 at low ready as he stood. The Russian commander said something to his troops— and they likewise lowered their muzzles. So, this is what brinkmanship feels like, Jonathan muttered. He moved casually to his left so that he could see the entire enemy line, without Marianne being in the way. Don't trust them, Boxers warned. He, too, had broken his aim, but he maintained a stable shooting platform. Up on one knee, his hand still wrapped around the grip of his 417. What's going on, Marianne? Jonathan asked. Why are you here? 
to interrupt the bloodshed, she said, to make sure that Graham is safe. And why are they here? To stop the Chechens, she said. I already did that, Jonathan said. You already gave me that job. Can we talk about this later? Marianne pressed. The police are on the way. Hey, Ivan, Jonathan yelled. What are your plans now? One of them stepped forward. If we are done, then we are done, he said. We will leave. Good, Jonathan said. Then we're done, too. Jolaine? Right here. Help Graham to his feet, will you? The Russian said something to his troops. Remember the plan, big guy, Jonathan said. Uh-huh. Jonathan listened to the boy's moans as Jolaine got him to his feet, but he never took his eyes off the bad guys, just as they never took their eyes off him. He slipped his fingers into the trigger guard. I'm ready, Graham said. His voice was weak with pain, and he was posed in the open for a clear shot. Good, Jonathan said. I'll be right. The Russian leader jerked his rifle up, but before he could bring it to his shoulder, Jonathan fired a five-round burst into his neck and his ear. At the same instant, boxers opened up on the skirmish line. Jonathan raked the line from left to right. In less than two seconds, the Russians were all dead. Marianne had dropped to the ground, her arms covering her head. Jonathan walked over to her and patted the top of her head with a gloved hand. Are you okay? he asked. When she looked up, she was confused at first, and then she went right to anger. What the hell did you just do? Can we talk about this later? Jonathan said. He keyed the mic on the Radio Shack radio and said, Thanks, guys, for the heads up on the parachutes. The expedition is yours if you want it. The toy airplane, too, but I'd be careful not to show that off too much. Not wanting to engage in a conversation with LeBron and Don, he switched the handset off before they had a chance to answer. Jonathan looked to Mary Ann. The police are on the way, and I could use a ride. As she rose to her feet, Mary Ann surveyed the carnage. Oh, my God, she said. You have no idea what you've done. Probably not, Jonathan said. Now about that ride. Boxers drove the panel truck over Mary Ann's objections, but he let her ride shotgun. There was a row of seats behind, and Jonathan sat there. Graham tried his best to find comfort on the floor, and Jolaine tried her best to help him. So, Jonathan said, how big an international incident did we cause back there? You'll never know, she said. I just don't believe it went down that way. How was it supposed to go down? Jonathan asked. Never mind, she said. Jonathan read discomfort in her body language. Yeah, okay. A beat. You know what I don't get is why you were there in the first place. She shifted in her seat. There are some things you just don't have a right to know, she said. Jonathan smiled. Hey, big guy, do me a favor, will you? And pull over. Boxers had hit the turn signal even before the question was out. Mary Ann shot Jonathan a panicked look. What are you doing? As the vehicle slowed, gravel crunched under the tires. When they were stopped, Jonathan said, Get out. Mary Ann looked appalled. What? Why? Because I can't stand the sight of anyone who betrayed me. What are you talking about? I just saved you. I confess there are holes in what I've figured out. But the one thing I know for certain is that you were there to exfil the Russian team, and that the Russian team was there to kill my PC, the very PC that you hired me to protect. I don't understand why, and frankly, I don't much care. You're wrong, she said. It's not like that. Jonathan shrugged. I've been wrong before, he said. Get out. But we're in the middle of nowhere. All the better, Jonathan said. Please don't make me ask again. Boxers drew his pistol and rested it against her head. Think of it as a safety thing, he said. The longer you're here, the stronger my desire to use this. Tears came to her eyes. I, I didn't know, she said. I mean, I tried to. I deeply don't care, Jonathan said. Out. Boxers pulled the hammer back on his Beretta. It now had a two-pound trigger pull. In trigger terms, that's a tickle. Finally, she got it. The door handle clicked, and she shouldered it open.
It was still open, in fact, when Boxer stepped on the gas the instant her ass was clear of the seat. Jonathan climbed over the engine cowling that separated the two seats and settled into shotgun, reaching out to pull the door shut. Boxers rumbled out a laugh. Mother Hannah's going to love this part of the story, he said. Chapter 30 Jonathan pulled another beer out of the fridge for Father Dom and poured himself another two fingers of Lagavulin. June had arrived, and the Washington Nationals were about to mix it up with the Baltimore Orioles. Neither team sucked yet, though there was plenty of time left in the season for that, so Jonathan's team loyalty was still up for grabs. The Orioles had been the de facto Washington home team for so many years that he couldn't turn his back on them quite yet. The Nats could make it a lot easier, though, if they could figure out a way to stitch a whole season together. May they not humiliate themselves, he said as he delivered the drink. To coping with reduced expectations, Dom toasted. I can't help but notice that you haven't yet turned on the television. That usually means you've got something on your mind. Jonathan sipped the liquid smoke that was Lagavulin scotch. A couple of things, actually. First, how is Graham Mitchell adjusting? You mean Vincent Malone? Jonathan made a face. Under the circumstances, the new name was a lifesaver. Literally. Yes, he said. How's Vincent Malone? Physically or mentally? Yes. Dom scowled as he considered his answer. Physically, I think he's fine. He's out of the cast, and the restrictions have been lifted from his physical activities. He's cleared to perform to the limits of his capabilities. He did finger quotes with his free hand. Why the emphasis? That's the segue to his psychology, Dom said. He's by no means stretching his capabilities. He's been through a lot, and as much as I and Mama Alexander and the rest of the staff try to be supportive, we'll never get his parents back for him. Every time he looks at that scar on his elbow, he's going to be reminded of some pretty awful stuff. Think about it. He doesn't even live under the same name anymore. Jonathan inhaled deeply to prepare for his next question. Every kid in Resurrection House is damaged goods. How is Vincent on that scale? Dom's scowl deepened. Well... I'm not sure how much I like the characterization of the kids in Rez House being damaged. You know what I mean. But I know what you mean. And I don't know how to answer you. There's no paradigmatic Rez House resident. Do they all come with baggage? Hell yes, their parents are criminals. Are some more damaged than others? Of course. But I have no way of comparing Vincent's damage against that of another student. Do I think that Vincent will come out of this experience as a functional adult? Yes, I do, but some damage will be permanent. Jonathan took his time considering the answer. He supposed that would be okay. Jonathan felt a personal responsibility for Graham that he didn't feel for many others in Rez House. You said there were a couple of things bothering you, Dom said. Once he fell into psychologist mode, he could be tenacious, especially so when Jonathan was his patient. Yeah, Jonathan said, and they're related. How much do you know about this Marianne Rhodes chick? The FBI agent? Right. The one you threw out of her own truck? Jonathan smiled. That's the one. I had a chat with Wolverine today. It was about Marianne. In fact, it was about that entire mess that landed Graham here in the first place. What did she say? After a lot of ducking and dodging and denials... Marianne confessed that she, Marianne, was the information vector for the Russians. She was the one directing the Russians on how to kill him. Dom recoiled as he test drove the thought. Why would she do that? Apparently she had a gambling problem, Jonathan said. And a big one at that. To the tune of something like eighty grand, and she was upside down with the Russian mob. Yikes! Exactly. I don't know all the ins and outs, but the bottom line was, if she could deliver the codes and the code keepers to the mob, they'd let her off the hook. Dom shook his head. Good Lord. So she sold out a kid. No, not initially, Jonathan said. At first, the targets were his parents, via their rebel friends. 
Somehow she talked herself into believing that it would be bad guy versus bad guy. No harm, no foul. But when things went wrong and Graham's mom passed along the code to him, he became the target. You mean Vincent's mom? God damn it. Yes, right, Vincent's mom. I mean, think about that. She knows he's got this photographic memory, and she gives him his death sentence on purpose. While his dad was working with the FBI, his mom never had any intention of doing so. So, either way, he was doomed. Right. So Marianne hired Security Solutions because she genuinely felt for the kid. She launched a foot race between the Russians and me to see who would get there first. That's a lot of gaming with people's lives. Dom took another pull of beer and leaned in closer. I'm sensing something out of you that I don't often see, he said. You've seen the world as a dark place for a long time, yet this incident seems to have surprised you. Jonathan waved that off. No, he said. Not surprised. Disgusted. So why share this with me? You're a priest and a shrink, which I've been for a long time, and we don't often have conversations like this. Jonathan sipped the Lagavulin. I thought you should know, he said. You make the call whether or not to share the details with Gri Vincent. I thought you should know. Dom nodded. Okay. Jonathan checked the clock and thumbed the remote. As the picture arrived from the ether, Dom said, Is it true what I hear about boxers? He's got a girlfriend now? Jonathan smirked and made a rocking motion with his hand. I'm not sure the G word is appropriate, but Jolaine certainly has the hots for him. This has been an Audible Studios production of Endgame. Written by John Gilstrap. Narrated by Basil Sands. Producer, Mike Charsik. Copyright 2013 by John Gilstrap Incorporated. Production copyright 2014 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.